and I want to welcome each and every one of you to the 2020 virtual ITA Coaches Convention by UTR. We've got three exciting days planned, wonderful topics and wonderful speakers. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsors and certainly give a great shout out to the staff of the ITA as well as our board and a special thank you and welcome to the chairman of the board of the ITA, John Vigozin. John, thanks for all you do. Take it away. On behalf of the ITA board of directors, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first virtual ITA convention. We are delighted to be able to offer you a free convention this year, and we have some exciting programming planned for you. Of course, we do look forward to resuming in-person meetings. Despite these extraordinarily challenging times, our dedicated board has stepped up. All board members are financially supporting the ITA and fully engaged in our board discussions about how to weather the pandemic. Our very capable staff continues to work hard on your behalf, perhaps more industriously and innovatively than ever. Just one of the many examples is the creation of the fall circuit. With the cancellation and disruption of fall sports this year, the ITA has been able to offer a new initiative to provide responsible local and regional match play opportunities to junior, collegiate, and professional players. I especially want to thank ITA CEO Tim Russell for his tireless and talented leadership. Thank you to the many coaches who have hung in there and who are doing everything they can to keep their programs relevant to their college campuses and the surrounding communities. Yes, we have unfortunately lost some programs this year. But that just means we have to be all the more resourceful and resilient. We are also most appreciative of the support and leadership of our officials. Great thanks to our loyal sponsors who have continued to support the ITA, notwithstanding the coronavirus and its distressing impact on the economy. Fortunately, tennis is an inherently socially distant sport that can allow players to remain active and our sponsors recognize that. While we cannot be together in person this year, I do hope that you will find the ITA virtual convention valuable. In the meantime, the ITA board and I wish each of you good health, safety, and happy holidays. Welcome once again to the ITA's first ever virtual coaches convention. We're delighted that you're uh, with us here today. Let me say that throughout the ITA's history, the association has demonstrated leadership on many fronts. That has been especially true during the pandemic. I'm really grateful to our ITA staff and board and sponsors, including our longstanding sponsor, Wilson Sporting Goods, who is our day one convention sponsor. This year, our usual convention activities have been spread over two weeks. Last Monday was my virtual CEO town hall, followed by our round tables for the coaches. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday were conducted we conducted our five divisional operating committee meetings. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, our ITA board of directors met. 15 years ago, ITA coaches had the foresight to envision a tennis ecosystem, which would include a universal tennis rating, which has now become a regular part of the work of the coaches, as well as an aspirational goal for junior players in America and around the world. In recent years, our partnership with UTR has grown 
including promoting our highly successful summer circuit and the recent addition of the ITA tour, the fall and winter circuits by UTR. UTR has graciously been involved with our coaches convention the past number of years and is again once again this year uh, as our convention title sponsor. So many thanks to UTR's CEO, Mark Leshley and his talented team. I wanna congratulate Mark and UTR on yesterday's big announcement of the UTR Pro Series. And I wanna welcome and thank Mark today. So Mark Leshley, take it away. Well, thank you, Tim, and, and thank you so much to you and to John and to the board. Um, I think your continued leadership, particularly in trying and difficult times like this, is, is wonderful. A true test of leadership is when times are hard. Um, like yourselves, we've been battling through the pandemic. Um, this has been a, a challenging year for us as well. Um, that being said, I think we've found a way to innovate and frankly, our business now is stronger than it's ever been, which is I think exciting because ultimately one of our core missions is to help collegiates, players and coaches and institutions. So it's an exciting time. Um, I thank you for allowing us to be part of this. Um, you know, we have built a lot of things now that we're excited to talk to coaches about. Many of you already know many of the things we do from community building to revenue generation to helping and recruiting and now with new player opportunities. It was really exciting to launch the initiatives this summer and this fall and into the winter with the ITA. And of course our pro series, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. Uh, we have a virtual group that opened today with our team from two to four and tomorrow I'm presenting with Matt Andre who heads our college initiative at 9 a.m. And at two o'clock, there'll be more details around the statistics and the analytics. So thank you for letting us be part of this. and. Uh, Look forward to many, many, many more interactions. Thank you, Tim. We're a tennis association, so I think it's only appropriate that we start this virtual convention with a great tennis session. I'm a uh, tennis junkie, as you know, and we all are involved in the world of tennis, and it's only fitting that we start with one of the world's leaders in teaching and analyzing tennis strategy. Craig O'Shaughnessy is joined with another great tennis leader and a great friend of the ITA, Warren Pretorius from Tennis Analytics. Both of these gents really specialize in an area of our sport that has brought great insights to all of you and to all of us. And it's a great, great joy uh, to welcome them here. They've been great uh, friends of the ITA and certainly uh, presenters that all of you have come to uh, not only look forward to, but to demand. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to Craig and Warren with great, great gratitude uh, for all you do. Thanks, Tim. Uh, this is Warren with, with Tennis Analytics. Um, thanks to the ITA for all the hard work in setting up this virtual conference. And hopefully next year we can all get back to normal. Um, at the moment, I'm actually at the Orange Bowl, which is going on. And usually I'd see a lot of you out here. Um, this year obviously is a lot, a lot different. Um, but if any of you are interested, you know, we, we are doing some virtual recruiting. So just give me a call. We, we have uh, cameras on all of the courts and um, collecting a lot of new data. Um, for the last six years, we've been collecting college data. Actually, a little bit longer than that. But in the, in the current tagging panel, we've, it's been six years now. Um, at the start of this year, we were working with over 45 top collegiate teams. Um, Craig and I have talked a while about using all of this data to do a form of a research type of project. Um, and so today we actually have launched a new course. It's called A Million Points of College Tennis. Um, this comprises about 34 different metrics, which we'll keep adding, uh, adding to and updating. So essentially what it is, it's a blueprint of college tennis. And today we'll be giving you a snapshot of this data. Um, some of this you've seen before, but a lot is brand new. 
Um, and the study obviously is relevant to college coaches, but it's also relative to any junior in the player development pathway. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to presenter extraordinaire and my good friend, Craig Oshanzi. Craig. Unmute yourself, Craig. I'm unmuted. Um, Warren, thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying the Orange Bowl. Uh, I do assure you, Warren, I do have ears. It's, it's kind of a little difficult with my bald head to see it uh, <laughs> with this virtual background, but thank you to Wilson for, uh, for sponsoring here day one. Um, Warren and I are very good friends. We go way back and, uh, you know, quite often in, in the evenings we chat about the analytics and, and all the work that, that Warren's doing in, in the collegiate world. And it just made sense to bring something to college tennis that is a study just of college tennis. As you know, I've done a lot of work uh, on the Pro Tour and, and getting a lot of the metrics from there. Warren's getting junior data as we speak uh, from the Orange Bowl. So this kind of sits right in the middle and it's, a, it's, it's all about college tennis. So it's something that's new, something that's unique. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you and um, get started here. So the, the course that we're launching today, actually, uh, it's on my website, braingametennis.com. It's called A Million Points of College Tennis. Uh, Warren's tagging goes through from 2015 through 2020, uh, a deep dive into what matters most to winning college matches. So yes, there's some metrics in there that you'll be familiar with. And there's some in there that that are kind of newer metrics that Warren and I are uh, bringing to the table. Um, this is a collaboration between the two of us. So we've been working very hard, uh, especially in the last month to get all this together and to get it to you and to, to present it for the very first time here uh, at your convention. Um, this is just, a, again, Warren said we'll be adding to it, but this is a snapshot of what we're looking at to start with. A lot of these will be cut up into a new area where we tabulate all the match winner data versus the match loser data. So not only do we see the averages of all the players in these areas, but we have um, very specific data and how well did you do if you won? How well did you do if you lost? So that's just kind of an overview. Uh, if you have the course or once you have the course, um, there'll be new data, there'll be new years, there'll be new metrics that'll be added to that. Um, it's a million points of college tennis to be specific for the men, we're at 555,000. For the ladies, 554,000. And when you look at it, it's like, okay, that's, that's, you know, that's substantial, I like it. Um, we wanna kind of tag it or, or use a benchmark as the 2019 US Open. So where applicable, we're gonna say, okay, here's your college data, but I wonder how that stacks up against the pro data. So where applicable, we're gonna add that to it. Um, we will continue to update this course as the years go on. Just to give you an understanding how many points are involved here, the 2019 US Open, the one Grand Slam event, had 29,570 points for the men. So your men's data here is the equivalent of 19 US Opens. On the women's side, they don't play five set matches. It's not quite as much. So we've got 17,800 uh, points at the 2019 US Open. So Warren's data set, the work, you know, we all think he's in Park City uh, skiing down the mountain or snowboarding down the mountain, but evidently he's been a busy boy. So we've got 31 Grand Slams or the equivalent of. So this data set is about as big as it gets. Combined with men and women, we've got about 50 Grand Slams worth of data through those years. And, um, you know, it's just really happy to, to get collegiate tennis up on the board with these metrics. Today, I'm going to look at a couple of different uh, metrics. We're going to start with serve plus one. We're also going to look at net points. Um, but serve plus one is something that it, it's, a, it's a term that I coined, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago um, from studying Rafael Nadal. There was a period in my coaching life where yes I was on court feeding a lot of balls and running junior academies but there was a period of two or three years 
where I earned the majority of my income studying matches on my computer. And the players that I was studying, you know, around 2010 to 2013 or 14, one of the guys was Nadal. And um, he was the king. And I just keep seeing him serve and hit a forehand, serve and hit a forehand. And, you know, he's doing it all over the court. And um, I'm like, you know, this may be something I want to track to see what the win percentage is. Why does he do it? I clearly remember John McEnroe commentating at Wimbledon going, I don't understand why Rafael Nadal was running around this backhand to hit a forehand. He's like, Nadal's backhand is just fine. It makes no sense for Nadal to run around because he's leaving the other side of the court open. So I'm like, okay, you know, maybe John has a point. Maybe Ralph has got a point. So there's only one thing to do is to investigate it. So this is a, um, a table, as we see on the bottom here on the, on the far left, 2010 through 2014. Then the next column is your tournaments. Then the round, a lot of these are finals, who the opponent was, wins or losses, the score. And then we have, was it a serve plus one forehand? And what was the winning percentage? So I've just put a couple in red here. We'll just go from the top 2013 Montreal final. Nadal, when he hits a serve and the ball comes back and he has to hit a ground stroke, he had 20 of 22, which is 91% as a forehand. Go down to Madrid against Warinka. He's at 26 of 29, hitting a forehand. Uh, Indian Wells final against Del Potro, 85% forehands. Wimbledon final, uh, he's at he's at 89% forehands. I mean, this is a real strategy. And it was something that slipped under the radar for a long time, but I, I kept looking at it. I'm like, there's something to this. And um, can we teach it to kids? Can we teach it to juniors? Can we teach it to the collegiate level? And the answer is absolutely yes. So Nadal kind of put me on down this pathway of looking at serve plus one. I then started writing about it a lot uh, on the ATP website, the stories, the brain game analysis stories started to have the term serve plus one. And now um, it's become kind of a mainstream stat. We're even seeing it up on TV. So this is kind of the evolution and how it came along. We see Nadal and he's the best. I mean, Roger's good. The work that I did with Novak Djokovic, you know, I essentially copied this strategy from Rafa and delivered it and taught it and mentored Novak uh, to do it as well. I mean, and it just comes down to the percentages. You know, Novak has the world's best backhand, but from all the data points that I looked at, he is definitely better starting with a serve plus one forehand. So I'm like, Novak, we're going to copy Rafa in this area and, and Roger's better than you in this area. And so, you know, the, the, the tactics and the strategy of the big three are all very much interwoven. So Nadal is hitting a serve plus one forehand. Again, this is the top of the tree, 78% of the time. And a lot of times players are trying as much as they possibly can to find his serve plus one backhand. It's almost impossible. His win percentage is 64%. So it, that does include if he hits a serve plus one winner. That does include if he hits a serve plus one approach. And it does include if he hits serve plus one ground strokes. Just as... Um, you know, as, as looking at baseline points here, this is 2012 at the US Open. We see only seven men, this is just baseline points, only seven men had a winning percentage. So for Rafa to be at 64%, Nishikori topped out um, only in the third round there at 57%. So 64%, if it was just stacked against uh, baseline points, it, 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 you just can't even get there. You know, Novak made the final, he was at 54%, Andy Murray won it. We see there he's at 50%. So. It's really a big deal. Let's get to college men. A lot of the analytics in a million points of college tennis end up in three buckets. They end up in, I do all the data, I get Warren's data, I do it all, I'm like, wow, this is really good. Then there's another bucket I look at, it's like, we are not doing well in this area. This needs addressing and discussing and this needs to be a priority in the practice court. And there's a third bucket you look at, it's like, ah, it doesn't really matter to winning or losing. It's kind of a vanilla area. Well, these numbers are very much in the good area. And I think, you know, a lot of the coaches have, have, have been listening and researching and looking at um, all the work that we've been putting out there about serve plus one. But college men, 2015 through 2020, and the number you're looking at is the average at the bottom, 68%. So we're almost at 70% of hitting a serve plus one forehand. So... Congrats to the coaches out there. Congrats to the players out there. This is a real prominent strategy on the pro tour from the best players in the world. 
and you are doing a good job of it. Could it be more? It could always be more, um, but I'm pretty happy seeing this number. Next slide. This only deals with the third shot of the rally. So the serve went in, the return came back in and the server hit, the server made contact and hit it and hit it for a winner. And as we see here, if that third shot was a winner, 83% of the time it was a forehand, 17% of the time it was a backhand. So, you know, there's players that I've worked with over my career that when I started working with them, they're like, coach, I love my backhand. I don't really want to be running around. Kevin Anderson was one of those players. Jesse Levine was one of those players. Um, there's a couple of collegiate tennis players right there. You know, you just need to bring this data. You need to show them that, you know, when you serve and a ball comes down the middle of the court, you know, maybe slightly in the ag court, position C, which I'm going to show you here shortly, that needs to be a forehand. If you can run around it and hit a better forehand, then you can hit a better backhand. You want to be doing that because you want to tap in to this uh, strategy right here. We see how dominant a serve plus one forehand is. Now, if it's an error, serve went in, return went in, ball comes back, I make an error. Yes, two out of three are going to be a forehand. And that's just volume. And, you know, it's, it, that still is a good number for the forehand. And I want to kind of go to the other side of the court. I'm going to show you some video here in a second where we look at this from a returner's standpoint. So there's a lot of match strategy. I would say eight or nine times out of 10 when I'm working with a pro player, male or female, and I'm doing the strategy against the next round, against the next opponent, I say, I want you to return deep middle to their forehand. So you want to stay away from four, a serve plus one forehand if the player can get on offense, if they can run around it. But it's a fabulous place to return if you can apply pressure through depth, apply pressure through time, and certainly by going deep down the middle of the forehand. What you're doing there essentially is attacking the backswing. You know, the size of the backswing on a forehand is much different and takes more time than the size of the backswing on the backhand. So not only are we seeing that serve plus one forehands are a good thing to do from a serving standpoint, if you've got control of the point, if you're the returner, you want to target that deep middle ball to the forehand to force that serve plus one forehand error. You are going to force more forehand errors than you are off backhand errors. Um, this is a little video here of Karen Kachinov. He's 20 in the world at the moment. This is just some patterns of play so you can see what I'm talking about live. Uh, a, B, C, D is the back of the court. I think most of you are familiar with this. Position A is out wide in the juice court. Position B down the middle of the juice court and C and D are over in the ad court. Uh, C plus is that area that's a little bit to the right side. So we see in all these areas, A minus, B minus, C minus, D minus. It's on the left side as we look down the court. C plus gets the most traffic on a court. So we'll pull that one up there. So let's also look at, at the bottom. I've got the return to B and A. So this is a game plan that I put together and a short video I put together on how to play Kachinov or Hachinov. Um, so against a lot of guys like him, and they certainly exist in college tennis where they run around and hit forehands as much as possible in the ad court, you don't want to return to C and D and give them that run around forehand. You actually want to return to A and B. So there's no sound on this, just enables me to chat as we're going along, but we see here, look where Hachinov is. He's just getting pushed back and pushed back. Attacking A is everything. So we've got um, Kasper Rude down the other side of the court. We see a lot of forehand errors from the middle of the court. You want to return to B, you want to return to A if you can apply pressure. That's a great return because Hachinov's always looking to run around and go to his left. That serve is the normal place. And we see there he's off the screen. A lot of times when these guys are defending, they move back at an angle. There's the run around forehand, which, we, which he likes a lot. He wants to add court. So you attack to A. There's a good ball to B. The natural angle has come back, comes back to B and then you go to A. So it's gonna be exactly the same in collegiate tennis. A lot of the backhands are strong so it's tough to break down. It's tough to keep hitting there. You go to the ad court to then find the running forehand in A. So that's a good place to rally. 
B's just fine. This is what Hachinov wants. He wants that A court rally. So you switch him out of there and you attack A. In three years of working with Novak, I would say 80% of all the game plans that I delivered had some element of you are going to attack A and break down A and extract the most errors out of A to do that. So, you know, you want to have the serve plus one forehand against Hachinov. You want to go to B and you want to go to A. Now we're going to look at it from the other side of the, of the court. So this is best patterns when Hachinov is returning. So we're looking at the serve plus one strategy of Kaspar Ruud. So Hachinov's like a lot of guys, they're going to try and establish and get the point set up through the ad court. You don't want to let that happen. So Kaspar's down here in front of us. He's in the red shirt. We get the ball out to the backhand side. He runs around and immediately attacks position A. So we want to hit serve plus, there he is in position D out wide. We want to hit serve plus one forehand standing in the ad court, but we want to attack A. Hitting behind is, and we see another ball behind. Hitting behind is an amazing thing to do. I'm always telling players that I'm working with, play behind. And you can see Hatchinov just tracking back. He almost gets out of screen um, on that forehand side. Players, in, and you see there, his natural tendency is to step in to that backhand return. So one of the things that we're seeing here play out again and again, and it's with a serve plus one, and it's with a rally ball, is we want to attack position A. Good serve. We go to B, ball comes middle, go straight to A. The earlier you can attack position A in the point, the better. There's your run around four. You can see there, Hatchinov goes the other way. He, he, he's looking for that backhand. There's another ball immediately to A. Um, and you don't really pick this up unless you watch about 10,000 of them. You're looking at it as like, okay, you know, I, there's, there's a one that attacks A, but there's one that attacks D, and there's a run around forehand, and there's a net point, and there's a drop shot. They're hard to connect all the dots, but when you make these movies and you see the same strategy again and again of attacking A, and Hachinov and, and a lot of these players, they don't, you know, there's playing, he's on defense and he's playing offense. So plus one, four into A. And look at him back off the court. That's what we want to be doing. Um, last video here, just uh, a minute on what does Hachinov really want to do? This is his best patterns. This is his favorite ad court pattern. So he's going to kick it wide. He's going to look for the ad court pattern and then he's going to try and finish to A himself. But he all gets set up out of D. Hatchinov loves to be in position D. He wants D to D, so here's a D to D ball. There's another D to D ball, he loves that. And now he gets the opportunity to finish to A. Tennis is a sport where A is the place where points end. So he goes to D, he's standing in D, and he goes to A. And the way that you counter this, and especially with a surplus one forehand, is you just don't go to A at all, excuse me, you just don't go to D at all. You don't give Hatchinov the D for him. You don't give him the runaround for him. Hatchinov, like a lot of these guys, I'm sure, in collegiate tennis, a lot of the, you know, the Spanish guys, a lot of the South American guys, they're gonna have the exact same game style like this, where they're running around like crazy. You just don't give them that runaround forehand. You stick them in in B, you rally to B and you and you finish to A. Um, and you just don't give them the angle that they really really want. So hopefully that, that video there um, shows you a little bit about the importance of the serve plus one forehand, the importance of running around hitting it, but also the importance of finishing to A. Hawkeye heat maps are when, you know, a lot of this came together for me. So when I first started seeing, you know, these pictures, it's like, wow, what, what does this mean? What is that red dot? So the first thing to understand is that the tracking that has been done here is not a tracking of the ball. It's a tracking of the, of the person, of the body. So we see Novak is mainly in this match, mainly in the ad court. He's behind the baseline. And he, you know, you would say, well, opponents are hitting the ball there because they want him to hit a backhand and they've pushed him back. You know, he's not really on top of the baseline. So this is kind of a home base. And when I saw this, I'm like, well, how do I, describe this home base to the players that I'm working with and, you know, discussions with other coaches and, you know, certainly to have coach education. That's when I put these lines down. I initially just put 
a line down the middle and a line out wide. And then I'm like, well, let me cut the juice cord in half and cut the ad cord in half. And, you know, I already had one through eight in the service boxes. So I'm like, okay, I can't use numbers anymore. So let's just keep it simple and go A, B, C, D. And, you know, I, I see this area, see, see this, that red dot's not dead in the middle of C. C is still a pretty big area. So that's where A, B, that's where um, A plus, B plus and, and the minuses all came from. So we see Novak spending more time in C plus than anywhere else. Analysis of forehand winners of which the serve plus one is certainly a big part of that. 2018 Australian Open, it's only 18 matches. It's not the entire tournament, um, but we've got 293 forehand winners. So this gives us an idea when we look at that serve plus one data, you know, what's actually happening shot to shot. So where are most forehand winners hit from? So this analysis is only of right-handed players playing against right-handed players. So we know right-handers will be hitting four hands in A, obvious, hitting four hands in B, for sure. They've got to do a little work and they've got to want to hit a four hand in C and they've absolutely got to do a lot of work to hit a four hand in D. So what we see here is that position C that has the most traffic, we saw from the red dot, which is in C+, we know C, the C area has the most traffic. We see here that C all also has the most amount of forehand winners where the player is standing. So what does that mean for serve plus ones? A lot of times the, the returner, when you hit the serve, the returner is going to want to find your backhand. So they're going to come to position C and you want to be showing this information to your players and saying, you want to be hitting a forehand out of position C as much as possible. Because if you are just accepting backhands, that C number of 100 there doesn't even exist. You don't have any in there. It's a big fat donut that's in there because you're hitting all backhands. So if you upgrade to a forehand, you now are hitting forehands out of the number one place where forehands are hit. It's interesting to note that almost 60% of forehand winners are struck in the ad court. So a lot of times it's, you know, escaping the mentality of the juice court for a right-handed player. That's where you hit your forehands and the ad court. That's where you hit your backhands. It's simply not true. You look at the, the juice court and you say, well, that's where you hit your forehands. And you look at the ad court and you say, that's especially where you hit your forehands, the most important place to hit your forehands. And, it, you know, when you're out on the practice court and you're trying to describe this to players, you know, you've got to, you see this vision, you've seen this presentation, you've seen Hatchinov, you've seen the numbers, and then you've got to, you know, speak it. And then, then the player, you know, maybe they're from Argentina and English is their second language. They've, they've got to try and take those words and recreate it in the head. Don't do that. Take these pictures, take these analytics, take them to, you know, it, before you step out on the practice court, sit down at a computer and explain and show them, you know, th these are numbers that are real. These are numbers that are from collegiate tennis. And these are also numbers from the pro tour where these players are going to go, oh, you know, Rafa is my idol. You show me anything about Rafa, I'm in. So show these numbers and these analytics about Rafa and show them how, you know, very importantly, they're interwoven and interconnected to collegiate tennis. Where are forehand winners hit two? So we know they're originating mostly out of position C. We know the second highest place they're coming from is position D. So just have a think about it for a second. Whereas we look down the other court, they're probably not going to be going through B and C down the other side of the court. The forehand winner is going to go to A or to D. Well, just think back to the video that we saw. Where were most of the serve plus one forehands directed? Where were most of the, of the forehand winners hit? From the video, we saw most were hit to A, and that's exactly what's happening here. We see hit to A is 60% and hit to D is 40%. So you think about it, it's like, okay, why, you know, we want, we know that we rally more to the backhand side, we rally more to C, but evidently we don't finish more over there, we finish more to A. And the best pattern of all is the two one pattern. So the two one simply means two to one side of the court, which is, the ad court, and then that serves the purpose of pushing back and, and pushing wide and then and then finishing to A. Um, I've probably told this story to you before, but you know, when I first started presenting this information to Novak, I said, Novak, you've got the world's best backhand. I don't care. The numbers say you clearly are more productive. Um, your forehand is a better weapon. So when the ball comes to position C, 
I want you to be hitting forehands. Um, you're gonna hit you're gonna hit more forehand winners. It's a, just a better shot. He goes, Craig, this is exactly what I want for you. You know, forehand or backhand, you're helping me um, make a choice. Is it this or is it that? This data that you bring says it's that. I got it. But then the next question is, Craig, where do I hit it? Do I go inside into A? I'm like, no, it's too early. Generally, it's too early. If you want to build the point, it's the two one pattern. So it's like, that makes perfect sense because a lot of times I run around it and we see Del Potro, 2018 US Open final here, we see him standing in the middle of the court. So if Novak goes down the line to A here, Del Potro is just a couple of steps away from getting that ball. So I said, Novak, the first thing you want to do is push back and use depth so that they can't hurt you. So if that first ball, we see that red arrow leaving Novak's racket and going over to C plus, if this ball goes to C plus and pushes back, you can see on Novak's side of the court, on the court nearest to us in, in, um, in red, I've just kind of erased that, that juice court. So if you hit a good ball to C plus, it's very difficult for Del Potro to actually hit a neutral to defensive shot down the line into that red area. So in a lot of ways, if you hit that good setup ball, or you know, from a basketball term, this is the assist ball, um, you only have to deal with half a court. So Novak doesn't have to recover to the middle of the court. In fact, if Novak hits that really good ball to C plus, he's gonna then move to have one foot in C on his side and one foot in D on his side. <clears throat> if Del Potro does go down the line, that yellow arrow that goes across there, Novak takes a couple of shuffle steps and he's gonna beat Del Potro to A in a hurry. So if he goes down the line from this situation, um, as, as we look at Del, Petro, Del Potro down the other end, we see a one and an S, the S stands for seconds. So if Novak goes down the line, from the time it leaves his racket to that green dot that I've put down there, it's gonna take a second. It, it's gonna take one second for Del Potro to move across to that green dot. So everything's covered. There's, there's no real advantage yet uh, to go straight there. But if Novak goes to C and the ball comes back, then he goes to D and now we stick Del Potro as the green guy all the way over straddling the uh, singles line in the ad court. It's gonna take 1.5 seconds for Del Potro to run all the way over now into position A to that green dot. It only takes Novak one second for it to get there. So that's a winner. So this is what you want to educate your players is that, you know, sometimes, yes, there is a moment where you want to go serve and serve plus one forehand and attack immediately to A, especially if players think it's going to D and they're covering there. There's going to be other moments where you just need to do a little work in the ad court to push back and push wide before you go over there. So the serve plus one ball that Novak's hitting there, Sometimes you'll go straight to A, sometimes you'll go to C, sometimes you run a 2-1 pattern, sometimes it'll be 1-1 one, when the ball was really good over there and all of a sudden you're like, I don't need another ball to that side of the court. I can then go and finish to A. Collegiate women. And all you, you saw in the men's tables, they're all blue, the ladies' tables. I tried to make that, I thought that was purple. Warren says it's pink. It may be pink, I may be colorblind. It could be kind of a, a difference, but all, all the uh, tables in the course um, are colored like this. So there's never any confusion between men's data and women's data. So we see for the ladies, they're 60% uh, serve plus one four ends. When I look at that, you know, my gut feeling says, that's okay. It's okay. I'd like to see it higher. You know, we saw the men were at 68%. We see the ladies are at 60%. Um, you know, and, and, and what we see here is, you know, they're still hitting more four ends, but it's probably, we want to see a little bit more. The third shot winner, and this is important for the ladies, if it ends in three shots, 73%, basically three out of four times, that's going to be a serve plus one forehand. So just even more ammunition for you as a coach to say, you know, you're in practice, your player hits a serve, it cut, floats back to position C, the player waits, they've got plenty of time to run around it um, and hit a forehand, they don't, you say free, stay where you are, you pull this up on your phone, you say, 73% forehand winners, that ball there needs to tap into that and add to that column. Third shot errors. Again, the forehand will be more. And if you can hit a quality return, you want to be aiming at B against a right-handed player and rush their serve plus one. So we go to the other side and we say, we want to rush those serve plus one errors. Net points. This is our last few minutes. We're going to finish up at the net. Is the net a viable place to win in college tennis. 
Well, the net, you know, certainly in the last decade has, you know, it's exactly the same as serve and volley. You know, there's, there's three things in the conversations when I, you know, if we were all um, in Naples, Florida right now, and we're having a discussion about the net, you know, the three big things that always come up is like, Craig, you know, it's, it's tough to come to the net these days. It's tough to, to really get in there. So, you know, the three big things are, you know, the racket has more power. You can hit a harder passing shot. I agree with that. The racket does have more power today. You cannot deny that at all. Um, the next part of this is uh, the strings. It's easier to get the ball up and down and make the person coming in have to volley up. I agree with that. You can absolutely put more spin on the ball, um, especially in a little cross court. Well, th that, that is absolutely true. Um, the next one is, the, the, essentially the tennis athlete is a better athlete than they were 10, 20 years ago. When we come in, they can run to that passing shot better. They can stop and start better. I agree with that too. In all of those situations, um, the enhancement of hitting a passing shot, whether it's the racket, the strings, or you know, the, the superior muscle mass on, on the, um, the player hitting the passing shot is better. Even with all that said, that's the same if, you, if we go back 10 years, so let's go back to 2010, we're probably saying that against the era of the players, the 10 years earlier of 2000. If we're having this conversation in 1990, we're probably having the exact same conversation about all the players from 1980, how we've all improved. If we're having it in 1960, we're probably having the same conversation from, from 1950. So, you know, it's it just, it just an ongoing conversation saying today's better and today's different, and it's really not. So let's get to our data points. This is where we tap in to match winners against match losers. So this is something that, that Warren's kind of gone the next step. Yes, we see overall data that's mixed between, um, between everyone that comes in, whether it was the match winner or the match loser. But now we look at it and say, okay, everyone that won their match, let's look at their net points. Everyone that lost their match, let's look at their net points. And this you know, certainly speaks to another conversation that, that coaches will have with me. And they go, yeah, Craig, I get that you like the net. I've seen you talk about it before. Um, people will come up and say, well, I think you're biased about it because you grew up playing on grass courts in Australia. Guilty, guilty. Um, I am biased about it, serve and volley and, and net points. I love to go to the net. I, I think it's a great strategy, but the numbers are certainly driving that. Um, but here, you know, this is analysis of, I just want my players to win more. Um, so should I, should I advise them to go to the net or not? So the conversation goes like this. It's like, yeah, okay. I see your general numbers about going to the net, but the more you go to the net, probably the more the win percentage drops. I hear that a lot. And, you know, the, the players that are winning, they're probably picking off the net player um, that, that's coming in. So let's see. You guys have not seen this data. I haven't seen, well, I, I, I have because I made the course a few in the last few weeks. But before that, I have not seen this data. I simply didn't know the answer to this. So have a think about it for a second. Do match winners, the, all the players that win their matches, do they go to the net more as a group than the match loses. Let's have a think about that for a second before we see it. Are the match winners, are they, are they either staying back more and just picking off passing shots? A match losers desperate and going to the net more? Don't know. Who comes to the net more? The match winner or the match loser? Here's our answer. The match winner comes to the net more, much more than the match loser. So when we add up all of the points, the match winner the, out of the aggregate of the total, the match winner is coming to the net 55% of all the points and the match loser is coming in 45%. So this is, you know, I haven't seen this. I have not done this analytic on the pro tour. I have not presented this. I haven't done it in junior tennis. Warren hasn't done it in junior tennis. This is new. This certainly shows that if you are winning matches, a component, 
A component of being good at matches is going to the net more than the person standing on the other side of the net. So now we get to the next part. It's like, okay, Craig, I get that. I like it. But what is their win percentage? That's the key. Uh, actually, right before we get to that slide. So these are just the totals. So everybody that won their match came to the net 59,673 times. Congratulations. Well done. Absolutely awesome. Uh, match losers. Everybody that lost their match, you still came to the net 48,751. So it's not like match losers aren't coming in. It's not much like match losers are coming in twice as much. There's just a nice healthy gap there for the match loser, that's the, for the, excuse me, for the match winner that says, I'm, I like this strategy. I'm going to jump on the short ball. I'm going to be the aggressor. I'm going to wear the, the pants in this, um, in this match. And as a result of all that, I'm going to be at the, at the net more than you are. Um, women net points, exactly the same, exactly the same. Sometimes in this data, it's, it's, I saw this um, analyzing pro data between men and women. Sometimes it's different and we've seen that today, but a lot of times it ends up exactly the same. So we see for the, for the ladies, all the match winners are coming in 55% of the time. All the match losers are coming in 45% of the time. Let's get to our last slide uh, here. Or the, or the second to last. So we see here the ladies came in 41,000 times for the match winners, the match losers, they're coming in 34,000 times. So exactly the same percentage gap here. Net points one, our last couple of slides. Um, uh, in the bottom right, we see the 62%. So that's all. So, you know, in general on the pro tour, it's between 65 to 70. Uh, is, is, is the norm. So it's a little bit lower, but you know, the way you look at analytics, you say, Craig, you know, give, give me a crash course in, in um, <clears throat> excuse me, in analytics in tennis, you start at 50%. Anything above 50% is good. Anything below 50% is bad. Um, and, and, and when we go from there, so it's 62%, it's fantastic. We're really the very few strategies, very few um, analytical points will be as high as 62%. But now let's go to the, the, the match tally. The match winner not only comes in more, 55% to 45%, the match winner wins more at the net. The match winner is winning 67% of all their net points. The match loser is winning 58% of their, of their net points. When you see about a 10 percentage point gap, 58 to 67, that's nine. So anytime it gets into that 10 percentage point gap, for me, that's that's a siren, that's an alarm that says, let's stop what we, <clears throat> excuse me, let's stop what we're doing and say, this demands attention on our practice court. We wanna tap into this, whether, whether it's a really good metric like we're seeing here, or maybe it's a, it's a bad metric um, that, that that needs attention. So in review, there's three big things here. Match winners definitely go to the net more than match losers. I like that. Match winners win a higher percentage at the net than match losers. I like that. But there's one last one that is kind of, you know, you hardly ever see, ever. Look at the match loser column. The match loser is still winning 58% of points at the net. It's still above 50%. I can't remember anything, nothing, where you look at a, a, a big uh, pool of data points where the match loser is above 50% in anything. So this is just, you know, gold for um, people that, 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 that like the net. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's kryptonite. <laughs> For people that say you can't come to the net, you, you know, it doesn't work in today's game, the, the rackets, the strings, even the match losers are doing a really, really good job there. They're not losing the match because of their times at the net, because they've got a winning record. Um, you know, I, I, I tell the players I'm working with, if you hate the net, if you hate the net, you're still going to be dragged in there whether you like it, probably seven times a set. 
whether it's a drop shot, whether it's a shank, whether you had a good serve and it's a short ball, you know, you're going to be at the net seven times a set, whether you like it or not. Um, so, you know, as you keep track of this, and I like to look at it per, per set, you know, I, I think a good healthy amount is probably around 10, 10 times a set, and, and then you, you start going north from there. So, you know, that's kind of um, the overview of, of what we've looked at with serve plus one. We want to be hitting serve plus one forehands. Um, yes, we can take them initially to A, but if the point needs to be built, we need to go back to C. If the ball is in C on our side, that's a golden opportunity to be hitting a serve plus one forehand. And uh, we just have even more data that says the net is a good place to be. So that, um, and sorry, I've got one last slide here. For the ladies, basically the same. The ladies all are winning 61%, match winners 66, match losers 56. And you were probably already looking as we go through the years and you say, well, there's very little changing in our sport. 2015 looks like 2016, looks like 2017. And, and, and a lot of this course, it's exactly the same. So you can, you know, you can kind of make one assumption as you look back through the last six years, the last six years haven't changed, which strongly suggests the next six years are probably gonna look pretty similar as well. So it's not only we're looking back at the data points, I would say we're also forecasting and looking forward at the data points as well. So that is the end of my presentation today. Um, it's again, as, as Warren mentioned at the start, it's a snapshot of, uh, of, of the new course that's launching today. Uh, there's 20% off until Christmas. So um, uh, for the college coaches, enjoy that brand new information. Enjoy this um, presentation that I've given you right here. And uh, I very much look forward to um, and, and hope that you have a really good uh, conference here in the next few days. Insane, I can't start. I don't know. Uh, I think Corey's coming up next. He's trying to get in. There's Dave. G'day, Dave. Hello, Craig. How are you? Wonderful, mate. Good to see you. It's great to see you. Thank you for yet another wonderful presentation. Uh, we, we have a couple of minutes um, before yeah. Corey comes on. So okay. if you want to take a, a few questions, um, I think Warren's been doing an outstanding job answering them. But uh, here's one from Raleigh. Uh, statistically, if a player gets a short ball to the C zone, would you rather have them move left to hit a baseline forehand or move forward to hit a backhand approach shot? Oh, I like it. Um, the, the, the general rule of thumb is this. You want to upgrade to a forehand if you can hit a better shot than the backhand. So in general, the forehand's about an eight mile an hour difference, you know, eight mile an hour superior. So I could see situations where both could occur. So the situation where I would advocate, I want you to hit a forehand is if the ball is deeper and you may not be following it to the net. So get around and hit a forehand and you're gonna freeze the opponent. You can take it straight to A, you can take it to D. If the ball is short and you say, I am gonna to go to the net and, and I'm gonna hit an approach and you can't get around it, um, then you hit a backhand. But also keep in mind, I did an analysis of Roger Federer um, and it was, I think it was 16 matches of all of his approaching from 16 matches and his win percentage when he approached with a forehand was around 76%. His win percentage when he approached with a backhand anywhere was 52%. So there's a really big difference between coming in behind a backhand and a forehand. So in general, we do everything we can to come in. The number one way to get to the net is a forehand approach to the backhand. Try and do that as your first option. You've got two other options here as a run around forehand and stay back. You've got um, a backhand approach and coming in, which you probably want a backhand to backhand um, would be your number one approach there. But yeah, that, that's, a, that, 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 that's a, not so much a sticky one, but there's certainly layers that we want to see the balance of the player. We want to see how fast the opponent's running. We want to see how far in the court you are. Great, Craig, and you probably need about an hour to answer this question, but you've got uh, 90 seconds. So Good. there's there's questions in there about, you know, how do you get players to buy into hitting forehands? How do you get players to buy into 
uh, getting to the net? Is it is it mental? Is it tactical? Is it physical? Is it you know how you've got you've got your freshmen come in? They don't want they want to hit their backhand. Right. They 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 don't want to come to the net. Right. What, what are you doing with those? I, I'll give you ex the exact example when I started with Kevin Anderson. I mean, he was 150 in the world. Um, you know, he hadn't yet made that transition. Within a year, we had him inside 50. And it was the exact same conversation. I said, Kevin, I want you to run around forehand, surf plus one forehand. And he literally said, no. It's like, he's almost laughed at me and said, why would I do that? I like my back end. So I went and got the data. I went and got the data of the best players of which he's trying to become. And I went and got his data. And you don't start with anything else but the stats. And you show these players the numbers, the numbers from them and the numbers from the best players in the world of which is, exists in, in the courses that I have and exists in all the presentations that I'm doing. And you, you let the numbers sell. Okay, very good. Under 90 seconds, Craig, thank you. Well, Craig, Craig and, and Warren, next time, Warren, we, we wanna hear the South African accent. We're kind of getting tired of Craig's Aussie accent. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a rest for another year or so, but thank you for your continued support of the ITA convention. I know it's always the highlight for, for coaches at our convention. So uh, please keep coming, whether it's virtual or in person. And we look forward to uh, seeing you in 2021. So with that, I'm going to turn everybody over to our director for memberships, partnerships, and alumni, Corey Pegram. Okay, do you see me now? So, so it says recording, um, and now I, okay. The host has asked you to start your video. You want me to click that? All right, thanks so much, Dave, and thanks so much to Craig and Warren for their awesome insights as always. Up next, we have Rich Burkle who is the president of Tennis Tennis Supply. Uh, Tennis Tennis Supply is a generous sponsor of the ITA and they do great work as the official court equipment provider of the ITA. Uh, they actually recently produced the new official net of the ITA, which is now available to all coaches at discount. And so Rich has some updates, updates to share for, for all coaches. And I think he just hopped on. Rich, on to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to just start with a quick video that we did. It tells a little bit about our company, and then I'll hop back on. Let me see if I can do this quickly. Can you hear? What's wrong? Okay. Here, do you want me to go back on and tell them? Hi, gang. Can you hear me? Hi, Corey. Hey, Rich. I think you've we've got you on mute so can you go ahead and try to talk to see if we can hear you sure can you hear me now yep i think we're good awesome sorry about that you're good to go no problem i was trying to share a video where you was were you guys seeing that or do i need to start that over we do not see it on our end there should be a share screen button at the bottom of your screen where you can share that video There you go. Okay, let me um, let me get on that and try to start it from the beginning. Here, I'm just play this real quick. It tells a little bit about our company, and then I'll hop back on. If it's not playing right, just let me know right away.
Hey, hey, Rich, we're having trouble with the sound here. So I think if, if you're able to, it may just be a little better if you just gave a quick overview of what the video said, because from our end, we're not hearing the sound. Okay, sure. Yep, that makes a difference. So maybe I can just share that later on something else. But basically, it just first, I want to say thank you to the IATA. We're, we're really happy with this partnership. Um, we're excited to see what we can do and possibly help coaches and get some of our products out there and any, any new products that you might need or, or think you need. Uh, that's really what we do. Any on, on site court equipment. Uh, we have a warehouse with uh, loads of different products in stock available, ready to ship same day. So we can get things out. We do custom logos with windscreens. And then obviously we're really proud. We were able to go out to the ITA conference last year uh, with samples of different nettings and create an official net of the ITA. We also sent out an email poll with which a lot of the uh, college coaches were able to fill out and send back to us. And we took the best of what everyone preferred as far as the netting and the different types of material and created the official net of the ITA. Uh, we sold a lot so far. And so we're, we're pretty proud of it and so far the response from every coach that's got it has been that they loved it so so we're really excited about that and just the opportunity to work with the ITA I personally played college tennis and love it so and I played for a D2 school it was part of the ITA so we're just excited to be a part of this we want to see how we can do different things to make the coaches lives better uh, and so we're happy to hear from anyone I'm personally if you want to call and talk to me I'm happy to but we have uh, a good sales team here. A lot of them play college tennis and are and are good players and understand kind of what the coaches are going through. So any kind of on court equipment you can think of, that's really what we do. Uh, so I, I can share that video. We have catalogs, uh, website. We're also getting into pickleball. Uh, so if you're starting to do that at some of these facilities, we've actually started a separate company for that as well. So just let us know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rich. And, and sorry to force you to uh, call a little audible there. Um, it was it was a well played audible, though. <laughs> uh, we'll, we can send that video out just so people have it. Um, Great. I think we've got a couple minutes here. So if any coaches do have any questions, feel free to ask away. But otherwise, uh, we will send that out to everyone. And Rich, thanks so much again for everything that y'all are doing for college tennis. We, we really appreciate that. And, and yeah, just get back to me or they can email me if they want any questions you have or anything. I'm, I'm happy to help. And I appreciate the time and you letting us do this. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. All right. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I had a mentor who once said, Perfection has eluded us again. Uh, so thanks for your patience as we work through some of the uh, audio and video issues. Uh, certainly as we move forward, we are a tennis association. 
And yet lots of us have talked about the important role of coaches in ensuring that you are embedded on your campus and in your community. We are really delighted uh, to have our partners from the USTA today, including uh, Tim Cass and, and Scott Tribley. I think everyone knows Tim Cass is not only a former college player, member of the ITA Men's Tennis Hall of Fame, a college coach, uh, an athletic administrator, and now the general manager for both the USTA's national campus, as well as for college tennis. A great friend of uh, college tennis and the ITA. We're just delighted that uh, Tim and Scott are here to share about how your campus can become a community hub. So thanks both Scott and Tim for being here. Thanks for all you do for our sport. Take it away. Tim, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll be as best prepared as we can for audibles. Um, our audible will be, uh, this is go and this is stay. We'll use the poach signals. So if something comes up, uh, just let us know as we, we go through this. Um, but, but a huge congratulations, uh, Tim, to you and your team for really offering this virtual convention. Uh, the, the content, uh, when I looked at the different subject matters, is really just excellent and pertinent to, to, uh, to the times. I hope I have this right, but I heard there was over 750 registrations, uh, which speaks volumes to the coaches. Uh, and I congratulate the coaches for participating in the conference and, and all these great uh, topics. Um, I'm gonna assume everybody can hear me okay. Is that fair to say? Tim, it's Scott and thanks for that intro. If you wanna take a second and uh, open your video um, so that everybody can see you, we, we are on the first slide. There we go. Oh, got it, so nobody could hear me? Uh, no, we could hear you. We couldn't see you. I figured we wanted That's a good to... thing. And we're on our first slide. Turn your collegiate tennis facility into a community hub. Thanks for the open. Great. Um, well, first, uh, good thing that they couldn't see me, Scott, but uh, happy holidays uh, to everybody. And I hope everybody is uh, staying safe and, and healthy. Uh, thanks, Scott, for uh, prompting me on my screen. Um, and, and thanks for your partnership in not only this presentation, but uh, for your passion for college athletics. Uh, a, a special call out to Todd Carlson from our facilities team, who between Todd and Scott are taking the lead in what we're calling the Community Hub Project for the USTA. And then another member of our team, Aaron Sheridan, is helping us today. And I think Brian Ormiston's joining uh, as a participant uh, in the call today. Um, I do know. Uh, and, and certainly doesn't need to be said, but there is so much going on in the world of college athletics. And when I was coaching, uh, I had no idea what D1 ticker was. Um, I'm going to assume that many of you are further along than I was when I was coaching. Um, but this is how I actually start most all of my days is by looking at D1, D2, and D3 tickers. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll look at the NAIA ticker as well. But I wanted to make a special call out to this and, and really, really encourage you all. This is a uh, free uh, subscription um, and it is very, very insightful. I can promise you your sports supervisor and your AD is starting every single day by looking at this. Um, so I wanted to show this slide. You can go whatever division you're in, just go to this and you can sign up for it for free. It's basically a newsletter but it's very, very good information, especially in today's times to allow you to follow what's happening uh, in, in all of college athletics. Um, I also give a, a shout out to the 60 minutes segment that was this past Sunday uh, on Olympic sports. If you did not see that, maybe you, you can Google it. It's, it's certainly worth a uh, watch. Um, and then recently, I think it was uh, Monday, I believe, or Friday, the night, I think it was Friday, the Knight Commission's uh, most recent report and recommendations uh, for college athletics, specifically in the D1 space, is really worth following closely as we go through this period of, of change. 
Yeah, and Tim, I think that, you know, our, our purpose here today is to talk about the business of college tennis and not necessarily, you know, the strategy of doubles or the lineups or what have you. And this ticker is just one thing that, you know, it, it does show you the coming and going of, of what athletic directors, facilities, programs are doing. Um, and, and that moves us into our USTA collegiate priorities, which, as you can see, is pretty robust. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think we wanted to start with this. Um, oftentimes we're asked, what does the USTA do for college tennis? Um, uh, college tennis touches the USTA in, in so many different areas. And wanted to just quickly share with you, uh, you're welcome to take a picture of this. We can share this uh, presentation as well. Um, and I won't go through each of them, but you see down there in advocacy, media and broadcast, uh, one of our priorities is this what we're, we're dubbing you know, utilizing your particular facility as a community tennis hub and the benefits to that is one of our priorities in kind of leading this effort along with the support of the ITA. So thanks, Scott. Yeah, this is a slide we use on an internal deck. I know Tim uh, believes the same, that college tennis is a critical bridge to the ecosystem of tennis. Uh, it's really the only country in the world that has such a robust um, collegiate model. Uh, it starts as the aspirational dream for our youth tennis players uh, who, who dream about playing college tennis. And then typically if they play college tennis, it opens a door and probably many of you fit into this category for a career in tennis and then stay in the sport for a lifetime. And I think simply put that the USTA's mission is to grow the sport of tennis. And so without college tennis, uh, it'd be really difficult uh, for us to have as much uh, impact on the growth of tennis, and it's uh, critical to our infrastructure. So specific to the topic today, and, and I ask you to, to put on a, 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 another hat. Um, all of you are excellent coaches, recruiters, teachers, um, and we, we ask you today to, to put on an entrepreneurial hat um, and to to try to digest this in a frame of mind where what might set you apart within your athletic department? What might set you apart amongst other Olympic sports? And, and we, we believe that uh, turning your facility and utilizing your facility as a community tennis hub uh, can do that. Um, approximately 30% of the universities at the Division One level are currently utilize their facilities as a community hub, which means 70% do not. Um, we were, will be surveying division two and division three uh, facilities to find out those exact numbers. But this is a quick uh, slide that shows you the benefits. We'll go into this much more detail when we get to the playbook. And this is something we sent to all your athletic directors, this one pager um, about four months ago, as we were working on this project uh, to engage them on, on what this uh, or for them to consider this alongside of you as leaders uh, for your facility. This is an internal dashboard. Currently, we're working with 49 different universities, all, all divisions. And this is how we're tracking the progress internally at the USTA. Uh, we, we, we know that we're touching 619 courts. I mentioned to you uh, our simple mission of the USTA is to grow the sport. And so how, how can we grow the sport through college tennis would be partnering with these different universities to activate and program their facilities. So uh, we have 49 um, ADs and coaches and universities we've met with to date, uh, 619 courts, four, or 537 outdoor courts, 82 uh, indoor courts. This is the number of uh, teaching professionals uh, we believe we can, can touch or engage and then serve tennis, you'll hear more about, is a platform to manage your facility. So thought we would start with a video. As I mentioned, there's 30% of the D1 schools and, and uh, don't know the exact number and we will find out the D2 and D3 and any A schools that are using their facility as a community hub. But here are some success stories um, we thought that we would share this before we get into what we're calling a playbook in order to do this. Thanks. It obviously exposes, you know, young people to our university. 
and then it exposes parents and potential business owners to the university to know that we're supporting the city in this way. It brings the community and the college together. Tons of tennis activity and tons of people coming to the campus and then seeing that a lot of those kids that would come would end up attending college. I think athletics really kind of use that as them giving back to the university, but also it helps them because one, we've been able to grow our fan base substantially. The people that come out here are part of the Jayhawk Tennis family. They see the team practicing, they get to interact with the girls, they get to interact with Todd. And so we've been able to, to really grow our fan base. And then from that fan base, we have a, a great opportunity for donor impact for the program and also the athletic department. The other thing is we are a little bit of a blessing because we can actually bring in money to the tennis center. The, the people that we've got to know from that has really helped accelerate our program to the level that it is now and, and what we hope will take it to another level in the future. You know, I think it's really exciting though when those kids who are, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth graders attend your matches and you have a huge crowd. Serving our community by being a lot more aggressive when it comes to utilizing our facilities for the city. We have a coach named Bob Kaywood. He's the coach of the men's and the varsity women's team. And then on top of that, the other half of his job is he's a pro at the club. So this was a great, great synergistic thing. It helps the teams in the long run have success. The third highest revenue generator on the, in the athletic department uh, coming under football and basketball. I know that some of the people that have given money to our big tennis projects are people that play because they liked it there and now they're giving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have a tennis center we own, we're really busy, our tennis programs are good. So I think it helps a coach secure your team Great, thank you, Scott. Uh, it, it's a great way to open up um, what, what we're uh, calling a, a playbook uh, for executing on this concept of turning your facility into a community uh, hub. I also would like to mention, if you have any questions as we go along the way, please just put them in the chat box. We'll do the best we can to kind of recognize those questions uh, as we go through the presentation. If we can't get to them uh, as we're going through it, we'll address them at the end in a Q&A session as well. Um, but as we go through the playbook, uh, this is something that literally has been developed over the last five months. Um, specifically, again, trying to look for ways for the sport of tennis to separate itself uh, within your campus community and also your community at large and, and candidly in the eyes uh, of your athletic director. And, uh, recognize, please, that the audience for this playbook, so when we showed the dashboard that said that we had met with 49 athletic directors and athletic departments, typically alongside of those athletic directors has been a, a facilities person within, within the athletic department, uh, typically a CFO or your business manager within the athletic department as well. And so recognize that, that they probably don't have the understanding of programming tennis uh, like you may. And so much of the information that we have in this playbook, the audience is, yes, it's the coaches, but it's also your athletic director, it's your facilities manager and your business manager as well. And so uh, we're trying to speak to them directly about the benefits. Uh, the slide that we sent four months ago uh, is sort of replayed in a different format here, but there's a revenue benefit that really does get the attention of athletic directors. Uh, the connection to the community where all of a sudden by opening up your facility and you building relationships, your donor base increases, uh, obviously court occupancy, the financial model, the way you can compensate an assistant coach uh, it, it opens up opportunities or can you put, bring in a director of operations that also could be a director of tennis. We'll go through some uh, modeling of how that might look uh, later in the presentation. This is a, a slide that we also sent athletic directors and conference commissioners alongside uh, of the ITA early on, uh, I believe it was in April when COVID hit, just trying to bring attention, positive attention to the sport of college tennis. Um, specific to it, you'll see that, that numbers three, seven, and eight call out how can you 
basically utilize your facility to either connect with faculty, staff, community, make it a revenue stream. And so we believe that three, seven, and eight are critical and really do get the attention of, of athletic directors and again, business operation managers. I mentioned the survey that we did. We first did the survey for division one uh, coaches. I would tell you that within 48 hours, 200 coaches responded. Uh, any of you that are on this call, thank you very much for your quick uh, response. Uh, again, we're happy to share this entire playbook uh, with any and all of you. The, the biggest one that I wanted to call that I've already mentioned was we learned that 70% of Division I schools do not program their facilities year round or what we're calling opening up their facility as a community hub. I'm going to play this video in a second, but Andy Katz, many of you may know uh, from his basketball background, but Andy is a great friend of college tennis. Uh, we've been using Andy as an advocacy uh, avenue or angle as well for many subjects. Uh, he currently works for the NCA and NCA.com. But the key with Andy is he has an incredible following uh, amongst Twitter and a direct connection to the athletic directors and conference commissioners who we need to message to uh, for the sport of college tennis. And so when we do something with Andy, know that again, our audience is trying to get a message to the athletic directors directly, and he has that following. But this was a podcast that we did with Andy, Tim, and I, uh, specific to community hubs. And here's the 60 second clip kind of explaining it. And then, really, this is a shout out to Andy for his advocacy on all things college tennis. So, this is really hitting men's and women's tennis hard. And we want to discuss you know, why that is and how moving forward uh, tennis programs can try to avoid this, stay solvent, survive this period of time and be better off going forward. Before COVID-19, I think college tennis had never been stronger. Great parity uh, throughout all five divisions of college tennis. I think there's, there's financial challenges always happening in collegiate athletics for lots of reasons. You know them very well. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has really raised some of that awareness now with the financial stress. Uh, and tennis is back on the table. But candidly, all Olympic sports are on the table. And, and so I think uh, it, it comes down, in my mind, to one word, and it's relevancy. How do these athletic departments make sure that their tennis facilities become a fabric in the community with junior events, adult clinics, you know, when it's not being used by the college athletes or different parts of the day when they're not practicing to really make it a part of the community. You have to be embedded on your campus and in your community. So when people are building new facilities, you just gave a lot of the things that should be there, junior clinics, junior tournaments, adult tournaments. Before COVID hit, I think a lot of our coaches were just too focused on practice at two and the Saturday match. We believe that college tennis facilities that are in every community across America should be community tennis hubs. They should be a place of wellness, a place to come together, a place to touch and develop memories. How can we help you as a head tennis coach to run your facility as a business? The fan can go to the football stadium, can go to the basketball arena. They really can't be a part of it. They can't step on that field of play, if you will. This is the one sport, you could argue, where you really can. Thanks, Scott. I needed a haircut then, and I need another haircut. I don't think I've had many haircuts in uh, my COVID days here. Um, <laughs> so, it, great. So th these are some of the services that we currently offer. Um, this is an informational slide. Again, we recognize that the Playbooks audience is the athletic director, business manager, there's, there's many things we do to assist in many schools and, and facility, especially in the architectural side of things. Um, what we're talking about today is really developing your facility into a business. And so that's the business development, but know that these are complimentary services. We're not here to charge anybody. Our mission is to grow the game of tennis and be a service uh, to uh, colleges. And Tim, I'll just, you know, there's a question about this. Uh, it says here, as far as USTA assistance, the USTA would provide in facility upgrades. What specifically 
do you need from coaches to get started if we are planning in the new in the planning stages of a new facility? And the answer is, please reach out to us. Uh, my contact information will be in um, in the last slide. Um, you know, we're not here to just tell you to open your facility or to get a new facility. We're here to say that we can help. We understand that your universities have resources. You have architects. You have engineers. We're here to offer the tennis expertise part of it. And yes, this is the business development. And over the years, in terms of facility grants, the USGA has granted college facilities 206 grants. Great. Thanks, Scott. This is a platform that's new to the USTA. Um, and, it, and it's a tool for you to run your facility uh, through a software system. Um, that is obviously mobile friendly, web uh, friendly as well. And basically it does all your online booking, court booking, uh, financial transactions all are online. One thing interesting at the campus, 98% um, of our transactions are done online. Uh, trying to run a hundred court tennis facility. If we did not have a software tool to do it, it'd be impossible. And so. This is just a tool, very affordable, that is a service that we're offering uh, to not just uh, uh, colleges, but, but clubs, parks, et cetera. And so um, more on that, if indeed this is of interest to any of you, but know that this tool exists and it is a way to really take uh, a burden off uh, those in running facilities. Professional tennis management you probably heard the concept, um, but it's basically a way for athletics to connect to the academic side of campus. If indeed you do open your facility into a community hub, we think that engaging the academic side and, and looking at adding professional tennis management as a degree to your university, again, even draws a better connection academically and athletically. Um, so there is a professional tennis management degree uh, that we can help uh, develop at each university. We're also working closely uh, with USPTA and PTR on what would be simply a certification. Wouldn't necessarily be an entire degree, but a certification and something that would be great for your current student athletes, fifth year student athletes, tennis on campus folks. And as your facility uh, does turn into a community hub, they become those that are actually providing uh, front desk support, stringing services, on-court teaching, et cetera. So Tim, yes, I'll, take, I'll turn it over to hear you for these next slides. Sounds good. I'm just going to play another video um, and then we'll go through it. We do not put any, all our eggs in one basket. I think it's really important to diversify because things are forever changing. First and foremost, we're the, the home of our women's tennis team. We run a whole club operation. Uh, right now we have 10 pros on staff. We start with peewees. We have a very robust and big junior program. Uh, we also do adults and um, we have a, a, a very large, uh, actually senior friend. You gotta make tennis affordable. And so all of our clinics are $15 an hour. Our juniors is really kind of from the financial side, that's gonna be your horses that are gonna pull your wagon. So Ace Grace is, is an example of a program that's gonna allow us to do that. Because we're based in the inner city of New Orleans, which is a wonderful opportunity to be engrossed and intertwined in the city. Having a partnership like that only makes sense because we want to give back to underexposed youth who may not uh, traditionally grow up as tennis fans. I really feel like the after school program, it puts, does put money into our assistant uh, coach's pocket, you know, especially like a volunteer coach. But the other thing that it really does is it, we develop relationships in the community and high school plays on the other side of the courts, but then they're also getting the chance to watch our match. Uh, we've also done league play with the USTA, Friday night league play. And our best attendance has actually been on Friday nights because we're also doing some other things in conjunction with that. You've got to mold your, your coaches and you have to mold your membership if you have membership. Our members know that we're going to have matches and they're not going to be able to play in those days. If you teach them that from the scratch, 
they just go with the flow. So that is what they're going to get when they get here. Same thing with the coaches. Coaches, you can practice at a different time than this sometimes. It's okay. We do, we do not put any, all our eggs in one basket. I think it's really important to diversify because we do not put any. So I want to thank, you know, all the universities that have, have given us some great input. You know, when we started this project, we've, we went out and spoke to, to 20 or 25 universities that, that were open, that had their, their uh, doors open and were running a business. And, you know, what, what we're looking at here today are just some of the different components. I mean, we're, we're asking you to think of yourself as an entrepreneur and we're, we're basically, you know, this is, these are some offerings of the USTA, but we're saying sell your byproducts and not all of these will work. You know, not, you don't have to open adult tennis, junior tennis, adaptive all at one time, but these are some things to think about, probably familiar with it, but it does start with the youth space. And, you know, besides camp, a youth program is, is a great opportunity We've seen revenues of $300,000 for certain universities, and we've seen universities with 10 kids. Uh, uh, what we would say is get started, you know, uh, and one of the things to think about as you do get started is to think about when are you going to have your practice time. You saw Mary Jordan at Old Dominion discuss, hey, you know, you can practice at a different time. I, I really ask you to think about that um, because moving your practice time a half an hour could make a big difference. Uh, the youth piece is broken into three parts. We've got programming. This takes us through the, the red ball, the orange ball, youth development, big shots. Um, you have your team challenges. Uh, you know, we talk a lot at the USGA about pathways. You can see level four, level three, level two, level one. And obviously, you know, starting a little bit of a junior program, 13 to 18, these coaches the, these, these students, these 13 to 18, look up to varsity tennis coaches. You, you, you play a big role. And, you know, obviously uh, this is this net generation, but then there's the high school piece. And, you know, getting high schools onto campus uh, is a big deal for them, big deal for you. And you can see the six or eight different options. Tim, you mentioned how Lake Nona High School has partnered with the, the national campus and it's been amazing because the kids now come out to the NCAAs, they participate in the programming at the national campus and it can be the same thing for, for colleges. Um, Scott, yeah, the, if I could, and again, just to remind the audience that the, the audience for the playbook is the athletic director who in large part oftentimes wouldn't have a background like any of you would in the sport of tennis and wouldn't know what net gen is or a junior or an after school program or adult programming or how could we connect to the high schools? And you did mention, so at the campus, we have sort of adopted Lake Nona High School. Uh, they play all their home matches at the campus, uh, but in turn, they're also filling up our, our programming after school. And so it's been a great partnership. It's been a win-win for, for both sides of it and, and good for our community. And, you know, we move into sort of a second component, which is the adult space. and. You know, many of you all know these spaces. Uh, tennis on campus has 40,000 participants. You know, these, are, these could be your umpires. They can be your fans. They can obviously support your program. And they look up to your, to your teams. Faculty and staff has been a very interesting uh, development, something we've learned more about in the sense that you want to try. There's different types of currencies here. I mean, this is a chance to engage with your, the academic side of the university, which is really important. Uh, Scott, I hate to pause there, sorry, but it was probably my number one biggest miss of, of coaching for 18 years, uh, of not connecting and not running a, a clinic or a league or something for faculty, staff. It's, it's in my mind, uh, somewhat low-hanging fruit. I really encourage uh, everyone to consider doing that. The ability for your sport, for our sport, college tennis, to connect to faculty and staff will set you apart within the eyes of your athletic director, when the, in the eyes of your president. So consider something creative, consider an opportunity for your, your team members to be running a clinic or uh, some sort of league in order to engage them in this process. It is a great way to connect uh, to the academic side of your campus. 
No doubt. And then USTA leagues, you can't ignore the numbers here. There's 320,000 league players. I've been to some clubs that have 27 leagues. So there's all kinds of different levels. These become potential fans or potential donors. Uh, I would guess that most of you have run tournaments, but this is obviously another great offering when we discuss uh, adult tennis. Um, ad adaptive and wheelchair, um, you know, adaptive. Basically, we're saying here that tennis is for everybody. Uh, there, are, there are grants available with adaptive tennis. In fact, our first deadline in 2021 is, is February 12th. So please, when you get this playbook, click for learn more and see all the great opportunities that, that you have with adaptive. Uh, wheelchair, I've always had so much fun watching wheelchair tennis at the US Open and they draw really great crowds. There's an opportunity to have varsity wheelchair, club wheelchair, obviously want it to be on your campus, on your courts that we're discussing, but we've also seen varsity programs partner with a club. Uh, in, engagement with our community, this is the name of the game. We, we really want to work with the communities. You know, some clubs would see opening up as, a, as competition. I, I think as long as there's transparency that you, you can really live and work together we would believe that a country club or a club that the price point could be a little bit different at a, at a college or university. Uh, we can't ignore that college campus varsity complexes are the nicest facilities in the country and, and they need to be utilized. Working with park and rec with a big tournament potentially, uh, local clubs, USTA section definitely available to help would, would be best to come through us first. Uh, NJTL, the USTA Foundation is very committed to college tennis. They would like to, in 2021, open 10 NJTLs throughout the country. So the company across the board is very engaged in this project and in college tennis. And again, if I could just mention to the coaches, there are so few sports within an athletic department that could do this and that can connect to the community. And uh, I think that's one of the real benefits of the sport of tennis. Uh, likely golf has some of the, some of those same assets, but but tennis literally even more so, uh, and and utilizing these tools to connect to your community is what will set you apart. Again, within the eyes of the president, uh, the board of regents, uh, the athletic directors, and and decision makers within the conference office. And you know, here we're getting into some of the business part of this, some of the the details. We reached out to. Um, a, a couple different compliance departments and came up with, you know, seven or eight bylaws to pay attention to, came up with three different options. We suggest that you engage your compliance department. Everybody sort of looks at this a different way, but it is happening throughout the country and, and just know that it can be done. Reach out to us. To, 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 we can offer you some examples of some other facilities and, and how they're doing it. PL, Tim, as you know, we've, we've had 49 of these presentations in one way or another. And when we meet with CFOs and ADs, I would say that our PL sheet is what they look at first and foremost. So it, this may, these may be the two most important pages in the playbook. And these are, these are true numbers based on market. It is based on working aggressively. Um, and we have PE in the indoor piece, but these are, these are some numbers that would show you the revenue and expense. This is an indoor and, and this is an outdoor. Numbers are obviously a little bit different. Cost would be a little lower with the outdoor piece, but definitely can, can, can develop. You know, depreciation is a true cost and you build these facilities. They're on some of your nicest real estate. Um, they, they do start to cost money and it is important to have the answers for that if you can. Yeah, and I think on these two slides, Scott, why the ADE's interest, there's, there's just simply not um, many sports in their uh, inventory that can ge generate $200,000 or $100,000 uh, profit. And I think uh, you should look at some of this profit certainly can get reinvested back into your program. Some of it is uh, uh, helping financially to support coaching staff along the way, but there still is profit. And you know, being able to give back to your athletic department uh, from, from a running a business with your facility will really, really make an impact again on decision makers uh, now and in the future. 
Yeah, I mean, we've identified that everybody has a handful of lessons, but to turn those lessons into a little bit more of a business and to have some return to the athletic department to show that you're really trying to show relevancy. Safe play. Um, you know, this is a program for, for, for pros and for clients to, to, to make sure that it's a safe environment. As, as a teaching pro, you, you would go through a background check and you would take a test and it would just really help enforce sort of misconduct pr prevention and strategies. Um, so there's a handbook, as you can see, you can click on both of these resources and, and get more information. We, we highly recommend it. I know on, on uh, college campuses, you go through other safety measures and, and potentially have already um, gone through some training, but this is great, especially if you're bringing teaching pros um, from the outside that are not necessarily a part of the university. Participation waiver, I'd say liability is the biggest hurdle that we come in, into um, with, with this and, you know, putting together a participation waiver. This, this particular waiver is, is, the nat, is the national campus waiver. We just sort of did it as a template. We, we realize that every state is a little bit different and every university is a little bit different, but just wanted to give you an idea that um, you know, this is a really the, the easiest way to, to, to protect the university and yourself. And Tim, we can sort of share this one. I'm happy to click on one of the, the, the UNM if you want. But, you know, like I said earlier, we, we reached out to a number of universities. These are four or five different ones, hopes of D3. Uh, you know, there's indoor outdoor offerings here. So it's not all five of these are a little bit different. Um, but these are some great examples. And you can you could click on each link and go to their website and see what what they're up to. Tim, just in fact, UNM's resurfacing their courts and they're putting in new LED lighting. I just saw that on their on their website. Yeah, why don't you click on one just to show the the coaches uh, that the playbook is interactive again. It's meant to try to answer the questions that an AD might have, a uh, sports supervisor might have, uh, as kind of a one-stop shop. And so maybe you can go up to the top, Scott, of this one, because I think it, it, it lays out. Yeah, so at the Lobo Tennis Club, um, Tim mentioned uh, that I uh, coached. I coached for, I played at New Mexico, and I coached for eight years at New Mexico, and, and I had a dual role. I, I was the head coach and I ran uh, what was our tennis club. And so we, we had a membership, we had lessons and stringing and pros and um, they, they've since expanded it. The LPTA is a, a uh, after school program for elite uh, juniors. It has, I, I believe about 75 kids now, um, summer camps, but this would be typical of just uh, if you opened up your facility of a, of, of a website, it's also a tool to message uh, to your community. Um, this is how you message to those that you want to come to your matches. Uh, it's very easy and especially with serve tennis, there's some real good, uh, 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 what's the right word? Uh, I was gonna say text messaging services that can get a message out quickly as well. Um, so uh, just, just gives you an idea of a few of the uh, facilities that are doing it successfully. Sounds good. And we're getting some pressure to, to answer some of the questions, but we've got a couple more slides to go through it's the organizational structure. And Tim, I'll let you, you take this. Uh, we've got a couple different examples. Yeah, great. Uh, again, this still has the head coaches basically in charge and back to an open mind of being an entrepreneur. Um, you may expand your staff and have a, a director of tennis or a head professional underneath you. But this, uh, these models suggest that, yes, I'm the, the, the head coach, but I've also have some roles for my assistant, my volunteer assistant, managers, uh, I may hire a head pro, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Yeah, th that, perfect. So Tim, I'll, uh, I've got a couple questions here in the queue. Um, the first one, Buckley said, this is a great concept, but I'm not sure our administration would see bringing outsiders onto the campus as a positive during this pandemic. 
Yeah, I think that fair enough. Um, and that, that has been a common theme. And so we recognize the timing uh, of it is unique. Uh, certainly the pandemic has uh, sort of brought this opportunity to light. Uh, and I would tell you that our presentations of the ADs, 95% of them have been very open to it, but you're exactly right. We're working with them on the timing of it. And clearly the timing for the ones that are in the queue now is probably gonna be fourth quarter of 2021, maybe third quarter of 2021. Uh, but clearly this is something that uh, praying for a vaccine is something that once the pandemic is under control, hopefully has a long standing uh, benefit to college tennis. Another question is, Greg, in response to the comment made, when do you practice? What strategies do you have to suggest to promote a community program in the afternoon with limited court space and time between between classes? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. Certainly don't want to uh, uh, suggest that there's any right answer for this, but at least given my background a bit, uh, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, it, it, both my universities that I was associated with, their classes were hour and 15 minutes. And uh, sometimes we practice Tuesday, Thursday mornings, for example, and therefore Tuesday, Thursday afternoons, we, we, we made available court time. It could be a hybrid like that, uh, where you, you rotate Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes are, are in the afternoon or vice versa in the morning. And so I think it's, it's working with, most people would know that the after school program is gonna be most successful probably four to 6 p.m., maybe four to 7 p.m. Um, and that there are, there's, there are some flexibilities in class scheduling, uh, you know, where you could start practice even at one o'clock and be done by four o'clock. Yeah, and uh, we've asked Dwayne Holquist to sort of uh, speak, if he could come off of mute and maybe talk about how he runs his after school program. I do know that we had a meeting with Furman, for example, and, you know, we talked to them about working backwards. And that is, what do the adults, what do the adults in the evening want and the juniors want? Work those blocks out and then decide, can you move your practice back a half an hour based on class, morning practices we've talked about. But Dwayne, maybe shed some light. You've got uh, 15 years at least experience running an after school program, juggling. We do know you have quite a few courts, but you know, what would your suggestion be um, with this? Yeah, we've been running an uh, after-school program. We started it with just one day a week. And uh, after a year or two of that, then we went to uh, four days a week. And, and we've been doing that uh, for probably uh, 13, 14 years. Uh, we do it 4.30 to 6.30. Um, we make it, um, we actually have two locations. We have one location that's on the other side of town. And then um, we, we use the university uh, as well. We always have our indoor courts as backup uh, in case of rain. Um, you know, it's grown. We've, we've put about 30 or 40 kids into college tennis and including a couple of uh, twins that people may remember from a few years ago, the Whitehurst, who uh, ended up playing for us. But, um, you know, we, we run practice twice a week in the morning and then we do uh, individual practice kind of on Tuesday, Thursday. And so at by 4.30, we're always available uh, to run our after-school program. And how has your administration received you running these programs and bringing these, these individuals onto campus? Yeah, the one thing, and you guys touched on it earlier, I think one of the biggest things is that we've connected with people that we may would not have before. So a lot of our donors and a lot of our supporters uh, for our program, we've got 70 seats when we play matches. And those are uh, booster seats and uh, people are, you know, paying 500 or more uh, to sit in those seats. And so we've become a revenue producer in that area. And um, I think over time it's grown because now they see these people in the community who play tennis, uh, who are now supporting our program. And um, I know there's a question earlier about COVID and, you know, how can you do that during a COVID era? Well, we actually couldn't do it uh, at the university, but we did it. Um, at a country club in town um, this fall and raised um, over $15,000. And the thing is by those people in the community playing with our players, now they became natural fans. And th then they, hey, they usually come to us and say, hey, what are some things you're trying to get done? How can I help? 
<clears throat> Thanks, Dwayne. And just, I guess, one more quick question. I got to move through two more questions and stay on time here. But you're the t tennis on campus. Uh, you, you oversee that. It, how does that look and why are you involved as a, with, with everything you have going on? You know, we've used the tennis on campus people to be managers for us, um, to help us uh, for some events that we run. Um, and, and then also we provide uh, some clinics for them uh, to help their team. They have several teams here, you know, an A, B, C team. And, and so we'll sometimes coordinate some clinics for them. Um, they're an extension of our team and, and uh, our players have gotten to know them and, and they've been really good supporters of our program that way. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, all that you do for tennis and, and thanks for your input. Uh, Tim, we've got two more questions. I think we've got about four or five more minutes. Uh, have you had success helping coaches and ADs navigate the policies with tennis facilities that are run by campus not athletics. So I, I'm guessing this rec versus the, the actual athletic department. So success, I would say not necessarily, necessarily uh, yes or no on that. It is coming up. Um, and we recognize that there is a split. Oftentimes there's a varsity and a rec and, and how can those partner? Uh, one of the things that we quickly realize is every single university uh, views things or operates things a slightly different. Um, but we're happy to navigate through those waters and uh, look forward to trying to do that if you're interested in this concept. And the last question is Bruce from Bucknell, basically asking if, if we could provide data that could help present this to athletic administration who do not have familiarity with facilities and show that it can be community, re uh, sorry, a positive revenue stream to offset potential annual maintenance associated with the facility. I would say that we have data with our p &Ls and that type of thing, but I'll let you take a, take a shot at that as well. Yeah, and again, I think you mentioned it. Oftentimes the ADs, especially the CFOs, quickly go to the PL slides when we present this, and you could argue that you could start with those slides. So uh, we could uh, draft a PL specific to your particular facility. Um, but again, what this playbook is meant to do is to spark the interest uh, from the decision makers within your department and, and try to answer as many questions as possible. And then what we've been doing is trying to work on an individual basis with each university athletic department coach and administrator on crafting how this might model out for that particular facility. Great. And I think that takes us through all the questions uh, Dave, do you have anything else that uh, you, you need from us? Dwayne, you see the big fireworks. You remember those, right? <laughs> I sure do. I think uh, playing down at the national campus um, has been a highlight over the last few years. And, and Scott or Dave, if, if you would allow me 30 seconds, just uh, putting on my, my college administration hat and a coaching hat, just to couple things I wanted to leave the audience with just thinking in today's times, but I really, really encourage you to stay close to your sport administrator. If you don't have regular meetings with your sport administrator, please set them up. Uh, also, I know how difficult sometimes it is to get in to have face-to-face -face meetings with your athletic director, but if you can do that, please try to set up face-to-face -face meetings, whether it's once a month, whether it's every other month, and when you do do that, show up and, and know that you may only have 10 minutes, but really give them a report. Give them a report on how your kids are doing, your student athletes, what you're doing in the community, how the, the, the recruiting's going, what you're doing to save money if you're not already asked to save money and, and, and just being proactive with that. And then I, I really encourage you to, to, to either continue or develop relationships with your beat writers, whether it's a school newspaper or local newspaper and try to feed them stories. And then finally, stay very close to your alums. Uh, stay close to your key supporters, either through newsletters, phone calls, or handwritten notes. Again, giving them updates. It's really, really critical during these times. So those are just a few things I wanted to conclude with. 
Tim, I've just one more quick question for you. We've got about a minute left here, but just in terms of, you know, this might seem very overwhelming. There's, there's probably some very young coaches on the line. I look back to when I started as a coach at age 24 and just uh, this might seem very intimidating, but, but what are the, the very first steps? You talked about uh, speaking, setting up time with the athletic director or associate athletic director, but should they come prepared with all the documents, this presentation? Should they have a conversation first without you guys there? Should they wait till you guys uh, are there to back them up? Or, or how, how can a young coach take the first initial steps? Awesome question, Dave. And, and most of the way this has started is the coaches have contacted us directly and, and sort of laid out their, their particular situation on their, their campus and, and whatever their, their relationship would be with their administration, how they perceive this might be um, uh, digested. So I would recommend, if interested, that we would just set up a, you know, a short conference call and get a lay of the land and try to help navigate through this. I think the intimidation part is it really, it's, it's very warranted. Dwayne spoke to it. You can start with, this is all a card. This isn't, you have to do it all. Um, and you might start with just an after school program one day a week. You might start with taking on overseeing tennis on campus because you see the benefits of how it could help. You might start with, you know, a league or a tournament. So it's, it's meant to be an all a card, if, that, if you will. But we're happy to take the first phone call from the coaches and kind of help work them through the process specific to their individual campus. Right. Well, Tim, thanks so much, Scott. That was a, a fantastic presentation. I, I've seen parts of it before, but to, to see the whole thing come together is, is really great and, and well done on all your work so far, working with the coaches and for your help and assistance with college tennis. It's, it's <laughs> truly outstanding. And uh, we have more USTA speakers. We have from USPT, uh, USTA PD, we have Dave Ramos, coming on tomorrow and Thursday. And then Tim, you're back with us on, on Thursday for a, another discussion around uh, the future of college tennis. So we look forward to that. And Dwayne, thanks so much for coming on and giving a coach's perspective. So we're going to keep the convention rolling. I'm going to pass us back over to Corey Pegram. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Stay you. safe. Dave, Tim. All right. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Tim and Scott uh, and the whole USDA team for their continued support and leadership within college tennis. I know we all really appreciate it. Uh, so now we'd like to introduce Cy DeFetis and Kristen Eggleston from ITA partner Wilson Sporting Goods. Uh, Wilson is, is the longest standing partner of, the co of college tennis in the ITA. And as Tim mentioned earlier, we're really fortunate to have them as the day one sponsor of, of this year's convention. Um, as one of those benefits, uh, as part of their sponsorship, they're offering uh, a special discount to all coaches. So coaches, check your inbox this morning for, for some of those discounts. And Cy and Kristen also have some updates to share with you guys over the next few minutes, including a couple of fun giveaways. So stay tuned for that. Cy and Kristen, I'm passing it off to you. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was going to go ahead and uh, get started by sharing his screen. So uh, we only have 15 minutes, but we're going to try to share as much uh, information with you as possible. Um, but just want to say, say thank you for joining us here today. And big thank you to ITA for inviting us to be uh, a part of this convention. Um, let's see. Sai, did you share your screen? Um, can you confirm? Can you see it? Um, let me just try it, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, as you guys know, um, Cy uh, has been the main person for working with the ITA and college tennis for the past few, past few years. Um, but I'm gonna start working more closely with uh, all of you guys and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, as far as um, our person in customer service, that's gonna be Andy. Uh, he's amazing and he's gonna be the one placing all those orders for you guys. So that's our grassroots team uh, for the US. And I just wanna give you a quick uh, recap of our 2020 uh, for Wilson Racket Sports. Uh, we ended the year as a number one racket brand in 2019. Uh, we owned four of the top 10 rackets year to date with Clash being the number one racket uh, in the US in 2019, which is really exciting. We were also the number one string brand uh, at 37%, and that was combining Lexalon and Wilson. Um, and we were the number one brand on the ATP and WTA tour. All right, now to jump into our 2021 college programs. 
Uh, we will continue to have the college packages. So those three racket, four racket, and five racket packages. Uh, they'll come with a bag, overgrip, string, stencil, and ink. Uh, and we're super excited that this uh, coming year we'll be able to offer you the pro lab rackets in those packages. And so I will touch a little bit more on pro lab rackets uh, in a little bit. We also will have some uh, individual special offers. Uh, for tennis balls, they'll continue to be 76, 86 a case. We'll also have local balls available for you guys. They'll be buy two, get one free on Wilson Reels, Luxalon Reels, Pro Overgrips, Luxalon Elite Dry Grips. Uh, and then we also have custom rackets available. So if you guys are interested in purchasing custom rackets uh, for any of your players or boosters, um, you can get a code from Andy. And then for custom rackets, you'll place uh, that order on Wilson.com. And as Corey mentioned, we do have some college holiday specials running uh, at the moment. So it's gonna be uh, $85 on Blade, Clash, and Ultra Rackets, $150 Laxalon Reels, uh, $80 Trinity Cases, and we do have some other specials, so be sure to check out the emails. And if you do wanna place the orders, please email Andy at college-adstaff at wilson.com. All right, so now Sai is gonna go in and talk to you about some of our products we have. Sorry, you're on mute. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you would think that uh, we would all be versed in, in this new platform since we've probably been doing this since March. But um, I want to thank the ITA and all of you coaches for giving us a moment of your time to join you today at the ITA con virtual convention. Um, although as much as we wanted to see you, we hope that you guys are safe uh, during this crazy time. Um, as Kristen said, I'm just going to go over our kind of racket uh, performance assortment. Um, these are basically the four families that we have of tennis rackets uh, that's available to you and to your players. Just a quick highlight on the different uh, segments so that you get a little bit more familiarity on the key features of these rackets. So we can start with Clash. Um, the overall uh, performance uh, that you could take away from the Clash is it offers the best control. Um, Blade is more for feel. Um, Ultra is a new racket that we just launched in March, gives you a little bit more power. And then uh, the latest addition to the line, which was released about at the end of September, is the new Pro Staff uh, series. Um, just to go over uh, the assortment for the Clash, um, it's uh, since it's released, it's been the number one racket, as Kristen alluded to, in the market for the last couple of years. The uh, offerings are: we have a 98, a 100, a 100 Pro, which is uh, about 11.7 ounces, so it's a little heavier. Those three models are really popular and uh, has been um, visible in the college tennis. Um, the next assortment is the Blade. The Blade, by far is the number one racket in college tennis for Wilson. Um, there are two key models that are really popular with the players, the Blade 98 in the 1820 string pattern and um, the 1619. This is different than the, the previous version six. Where, well, uh, the, the, the overwhelming response to this particular product is it gives you a better feel uh, compared to the version six model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the new Ultra was launched, uh, unfortunately for us, during the height of the pandemic. Um, so it, it, it's lost a little kind of traction, but um, it is showing some popularity with players and juniors. The uh, Ultra 100 is uh, especially the uh, favorite of, of all the different models that we have. Um, the last assortment is the Pro Staff line. Um, we, we took the ever popular blacked out uh, uh, cosmetic and uh, threw in a nice flashback of the original classic look um, that many of you may have known from the late 90s um, to the early 2000. Um, there are three models. We have the RF 97, uh, the 97 and 97 light. We did not change uh, the cosmetic or up in the RF because why Tinker with the greatest ever. I thought we did make a change on 77. Um, we added a what we call a braid 45, uh, which is where you fuse the Pro Staff 
a graphite and a uh, Kevlar into the mix. Uh, the image on the top left is how a traditional racket um, layup on, when you build the racket with a graphite is, is how it's set up. The braid 45 is more of a 45 degree angle, hence the name. And uh, the overall feature that it produces, it gives you a little bit more optimal feel and a little bit more stability uh, when the racket is in final production. Um, another addition to the design is uh, we tightened up the string bed a little bit. It's still a 1619 pattern, but the spacing between the string bed is a little tighter. So it gives you a little bit more control, a little better feel. Um, and for those that are uh, string breakers, it, it minimizes that string breakage a little bit. Um, so here's the image uh, of the new Pro Staff line. The uh, 97 and 97 light will feature the black, or I'm sorry, the red and yellow piping uh, that would go around the, the frame, kind of just like the original 6-1 classic feel. And then the RF will have the gray and white striping all the way around. Um, as Kristen alluded to, this particular racket group is now available, um, but it's a limited distribution. So this pro stock frame, um, which you see most of our tour players are using, is now available to the college players, uh, some junior academies, and only on Wilson.com. You will not be able to purchase this directly from your local retail affiliate. It has to go through either Wilson.com or uh, through Andy directly. There are five models in the line. Uh, many of you have seen the Ultra Tour, which is now called the Ultra Pro. Uh, when it was first released, it was available in the 1820 string pattern. Uh, it is now also available in a 16 by 19 string pattern. Um, the other addition that you might be interested in is the Blade Pro. Um, again, this is a little bit more beefy compared to the in stock model. It's got a 22 millimeter beam versus the 21.5, and it is available in the 1619 an 1820 string pattern. It weighs 10.7 uh, uh, or 304 grams. The last racket in the line is the 6195. It's been a while since we had a 95 head racket uh, and an 1820 pattern. So many of you coaches may like this one. Uh, it, it weighs 11.7 ounces or 331 grams. The key to the pro stock frames is, as you could tell, the weight with the exception of the 6-1, most of it will be hovering around 306 or 304 grams. The rest will be up to you. You'll have to bring it to a customizer to cater around to your player. It's a little unique. The Ultra Pro is gonna be 19 millimeter beam and the Blade Pro is gonna be 24 millimeter beam. So that's the big difference between that and the in-stock model. Um, so moving away from uh, rackets into uh, strings, I know many of you have uh, are probably using this for your players and your teams. Um, Luxalon, as you know, is tour inspired by our players, uh, tested on the tour, and obviously some of our biggest names and biggest players uh, on the ATP and the WTA tour. Just to highlight three key uh, models that uh, many are using in college tennis, the 4G is popular and it's key feature there is tension maintenance. This series holds the best tension compared to any of the polys out there. And uh, including, with the exception of gut, it holds tension better than most any other string. Uh, the most popular of the series would be the Alu Power. You'll see a lot of our tour players using it. And many of you coaches have a lot of your players using this. The, the key feature in Alu Power, it gives you a good level of pop and performance at the same time. And then the last is kind of the new addition. It's been around for about two or three years now. Um, we consider this like a multi-filament version of the polyester group. Gives you a little bit more power, um, but the key feature for the element is it's nice and soft. So if you have players that have some elbow issues, this is the right string to kind of put them into. Um, the last technology piece that I want to talk about is um, Kristen and I showed this to you guys at the ITA convention in 2019. Um, we actually had this on court with all the presenters and even on the uh, mini tournament, uh, the two on two drills that we had, um, we had some great feedback from the coaches. It is our new um, Trinity tennis ball. It's not a pressured ball. What we did is 
We uh, doubled up or made a, a tennis ball with a thicker wall so that the pressure does not come out. The felt is a little bit more elastic, so it lasts a little longer. Um, if you compare it to the current uh, rack, uh, sorry, the tennis balls that are out there, it lasts twice as long. Um, one of the, the key tests that we had is- All right, I'm in. I can actually, I actually can see myself now. So. We had a couple of pros awesome. that tried this. Okay. And, no. um, and it, it lasts ITA four times longer. Well. Yeah. Uh, in your uh, compared to uh, uh, the other models that are there. Um, it comes in this nice sleek sleeve model. Instead of a can, it shows up in a sleeve. Um, it comes traditionally 24 sleeves to a box. But for all of those coaches that are um, running camps or academies, it actually comes in a just a box with 72 tennis balls. It, it alleviates the pain of opening up 24 cans and then figuring out what to do, how to dispose of the can plus the box and the lids. Um, again, this is a sustainable story for us uh, that uh, it's going to go a long way and help the environment as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kristen for some fun. Okay, sorry everyone, I couldn't unmute myself. So, <laughs> um, all right, so we are gonna give away some prizes now. So basically, I'm gonna ask a question and the first person to answer correctly uh, will win the prize. ITA will be filtering the answers. Um, so we'll go ahead and enter the first question. That is gonna be name a former college player currently on tour playing with a Wilson racket. Now, the first person to answer, answer correctly will win a case of Trinity tennis balls. Okay, and I'll just uh, head to the second question while the ITA uh, sends me over the winner for the first question. The second question is going to be, uh, we'll see who is reading the ITA feature stories on this one. Who is the all-time winningest coach in Division Three women's tennis? All right, so just waiting on Corey again to send you the answers um, for the two of these and we will go ahead and announce them. The winner of the second question uh, will get a reel of Alu Power 125. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Corey filter through the answers and let us know the winners of those in a little bit. Um, thank you again so much for everyone joining us today. We really appreciate it. If you have questions at all, please email me at kristen.eggleston at wilson.com. And to place any orders um, for any of the specials that we have, please email Andy Stetcher at college staff at wilson.com. Um, thank you again, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Bye. All right. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, Cy. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the whole Wilson team for, for all of y'all's support. I know College Tennis really appreciates it. Uh, to announce the winners, uh, the two, the, 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 the first winner was Al Wormer. Uh, and so far, we have actually, we actually just got a winner for the second one. It's uh, Jared uh, Camarota. Um, so Jared and Al, we will email you guys uh, uh, and copy Cy and Kristen and they'll be able to fulfill your prizes. Uh, we will have a few other giveaways later today from, uh, from Wilson through a couple of other trivia questions. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and I just posted in the chat box how you can order Wilson products uh, using the discounts that uh, we mentioned earlier. So 
Thank you, thank you, Wilson, again. And I think I am passing it off to Dave. Okay, Corey, thank you. And Wilson, thank you so much for your continued support of College Tennis. Um, next up, we are going to have a session named Lessons Learned, the worst case scenario. So uh, there's Ross Wilson, the Iowa men's tennis coach. We're still trying to track down Jerry Noyce. So if any of you are good friends with Jerry and you have him on speed <laughs> dial or text, uh, please track him down and tell him he's late for this, uh, this session, but hopefully he'll be able to join us at some point. And um, uh, if he does, then we'll, we'll uh, get to some of the questions, but you guys feel free to, to share uh, any questions at any time. I'll keep track of the chat box. This is really just a, a, an open conversation where we don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that to share with you or any videos. Um, this has been a very difficult time for college sports, college athletics in, in general uh, since March. Uh, it's not a presentation or a discussion we really ever want to have at our convention, um, you know, this year or any year. But uh, we can't ignore what's happening. Um, we've lost a, a number of programs since March uh, between 2016 and 2020. Uh, I think college tennis had gained about 23 programs. But um, since March, I think we've lost about 60. So a very, very scary time indeed. Um, I'm sure many of you have been touched by this in some way, whether it hasn't, maybe it's not affected your program uh, directly, uh, but you probably have a good friend who has been affected by it. Um, obviously working at the ITA, it's always uh, a, a gut punch every Friday when we see these, these news dumps that happen in the afternoon and, and we see programs being canceled. It, it really uh, stings hard. And uh, personally, I've seen my alma mater, Fresno State Men's Tennis, being canceled in recent weeks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult time. And obviously, uh, Ross has gone through that um, over the last few months, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, if, you know, we're trying to provide some different perspectives on this, we have, um, um, you know, uh, a few different coaches that, that have gone through this at various different divisions. Um, and we are trying to uh, provide as many different perspectives as possible. We've got uh, on the College Coaches podcast, we had Kendall Brooks, um, who's a Division II coach, uh, women's coach at St. Edwards. We discussed this uh, uh, season two, episode three with, with Kendall. Um, I wanted to provide two more unique perspectives. Ross Wilson as, as a coach who's in the prime of his career. And hopefully if Jerry can join us, um, Jerry, who's uh, coached at the University of Minnesota back in the 80s, uh, created uh, a phenomenal program there, laid the groundwork for, for many future coaches and future programs. Um, he's, you know, coming at it from a different perspective, somebody who's who stepped away from coaching is in the business world, but now um, was very involved in trying to get the men's program there at Minnesota reinstated. So just as a, as a quick introduction, um, uh, we've got Jerry, I hope, um, he coached at, at the University of Minnesota from 1974 to 1988. He led the team to Big Ten championships in 81, 84, and 86. He was named the D1 Men's Coach of the Year uh, in 86 as well after his team's run to the quarterfinals of the NCAAs. Um, he's also been inducted into the ITA Hall of Fame. From 2000 to 2006, he served as the CEO of Health Fitness, a provider of corporate health and wellness services. While at Health Fitness, Jerry also served on the President's Council for Physical Fitness and Sports. Uh, under George W. Bush, and from 2010 to 2015, he served as CEO of the nonprofit Hero. Um, Ross uh, Wilson competed for Ohio State from 2002 to 2006, and is a two-time All-American winning back-to-back -back ITA National Indoor Doubles titles. Ross began his college coaching career as the men's and women's assistant coach at Kenyon College, where he was named the 2012 ITA National Assistant Coach of the Year. He then spent one year as an assistant at the University of San Diego before moving into the same role at the University of Iowa and was eventually promoted to the head coaching position. In just six seasons as the head coach, Ross has guided his team to the highest ranking in program history. And in 2020, before the season was canceled, his team was on track for a breakout year with a 12 and two record, a national ranking of number 20, 
and qualified five players for the ITA Fall National Championships, which makes um, the cancellation of the men's program at Iowa even that much more surprising. So Ross, welcome to the, to the convention. Thanks so much. I know it's a difficult time for you, but really appreciate you making some time and sharing your story with the coaches today. Uh, thanks, Dave. It's good to be here with you guys. Yeah, we, we'll see if uh, Jerry uh, gets the memo and, and, and joins us, but you're, you're leading the charge for now. So we're uh, really going to get your perspective here for the next uh, 30 minutes or so and, and uh, look forward to getting some, some uh, questions from our coaches. So, um, yeah, just, just to get started, um, you know, Ross, in your brief time at Iowa, you, you endowed aspects of your program, uh, from what I've heard, to protect yourself against this worst case scenario. Can you take us through those steps and how you went about accomplishing them? Yeah, um, you know, when I first got the head coaching job here at Iowa, um, I knew that we had had a strong alumni um, network, and but we'd never really put together a, a working list of the current alumni's, you know, email addresses, phone numbers, addresses to be able to get in touch with them frequently. And so that was one of the first things that I did um, was make sure that my assistant and I called um, or emailed every single one of them to get their current information. And then after that, we, you know, created a newsletter, I think, like a lot of coaches would do just to keep people updated into the program. Um, you know, after, after that process was done, then, um, then we created kind of a, a menu of, of things that we needed to do to be able to compete for a Big Ten title um, where people could, could support the program. And those things were, you know, have a pro tournament. Um, we needed some facility upgrades like signage, scoreboards for the outdoor courts, um, play site, um, live streaming and the kiosk for indoor and outdoor. Um, and we we're able to get all those things done in, in a pretty short period of time in like four years. Um, and then we had one major donor, um, just kind of snowballed. And we had one major donor who, uh, really I'd been in touch with, uh, since I was an assistant coach at Iowa, he started off, um, endowing a scholarship. And when I became the head coach, we had a lot of talks about my vision and, and the program and where I wanted it to go. And, he was really on board with it. Um, he was an Iowa grad, didn't play tennis at Iowa, but just really, really loved tennis. And he and I kind of got to be really good friends. And so um, when we were looking at, you know, maybe building a new facility, maybe we're putting new courts in, he, he really wanted to endow the coaching position to make sure that I would be there for 20 years um, and that we could really kind of see this thing all the way through of, of possibly winning a Big Ten title and, and becoming a top 25 program. And so um, three years ago, he decided, Hey, I'm going to give 2.6 million to endow your position, you know, to sustain this program, to make sure that you're here. Um, and, you know, obviously things were going great on the fundraising part and, and the, obviously the results, of the program were getting better and better. And, um, and so that's kind of where we were. And, and then, uh, in August, uh, we get the call from, from our AD and he says, we're going to discontinue the program here at Iowa, unfortunately. Yeah, it's hard to believe. So, um, well, Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Sorry, I uh, didn't get the, the the memo there that you were on with us, but great to see you. And, and uh, hopefully you heard our introduction. But uh, a similar question to yourself, Jerry, Dur during your time at Minnesota, you took a number of steps to insulate the men's program from elimination. Can you tell us what some of those steps were and how you went about accomplishing them? Yeah, I want to make sure. Can you hear me okay, Dave? We can, Jerry. We can see you and hear you. Great. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, I was able to see you. And unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, I was on mute and I couldn't unmute it. It was under your control. But anyways, thanks for inviting me to join you guys. And uh, I had a chance to listen to John Vagosin, my old buddy from the USTA days, uh, open up with some of his comments. And um just say, um, my background, of course, along with the things that you mentioned, Dave, is I was a member of the board of directors of the ITA. And we were the beginner, we began the convention uh, during the time I was on the board. So I'm excited to see the convention again. It's been many years. Um, and I also chaired the USTA uh, Collegiate Committee, which John Bogosin was a member of. He was my vice chair and Tim Russell was on. And during that time, the reason I mention it is um, we were approached through the USTA to make a presentation in San Diego to the Title IX Commission about, um, and all the collegiate sports were asked to do the same. 
but the, the purpose of the meeting was to really uh, describe for the Title IX Commission uh, what we do in our sport and why our sport is important for uh, uh, gender equity. John did such a fantastic job in his presentation uh, to the Title IX Commission that we were contacted by all of the other collegiate sports and asked if they could partner with us in the things we were doing. So I think that gives us a little bit of idea of the importance from a Title IX perspective of tennis. Because tennis, when you think about it, really was the genesis for women's athletics, college athletics in America. When I started coaching back in the early 70s, women's athletics was really starting to, to uh, grow a little bit. But it was only when Billie Jean and Bobby Riggs had that match and Billie Jean won that match that women's athletics really boomed because it created this a belief of um, that there really was um, credibility within the women's athletic programs in college. And we could see it in Title IX followed and all the rest of these things. Today, we're faced with some very different issues. Um, today, we're faced with, with a, a budgetary shortfall for many of the colleges that depend so heavily on their football, basketball revenue. Um, we still have the Title IX compliance issues that are before us. But the central part of this, at least for Power Five conference schools like uh, Ross's uh, University of Iowa and the University of Minnesota, is really the shortfall in revenue. And what these athletic directors are being asked by their boards of regents, how to address that. And in our case, as you mentioned, and the folks on this call know, the men's tennis program, along with men's gymnastics and men's outdoor track, were eliminated uh, at, in the December meeting of our Board of Regents. I was very involved in that whole process. We can talk about that in a minute. But the reason that it, it was shocking to us, and I think shocking to Tim Cass, who was one of your earlier speakers from USTA, and, and to uh, Tim Russell, as they uh, shared with me, is Minnesota is a model program. When we started the program back in the early 70s, it was there, there used to be a, um, a poll, a weekly poll that came out in all the national uh, publications that uh, asked for each of the spring sports, what were the bottom 10 spring sports uh, universities? Not the top 10, but the bottom 10. Minnesota led it every time in tennis. The tennis poll always said that Minnesota was at the bottom. That's where we started. And so the first thing that we had to do, and I think it's true for all college coaches, and it certainly is true in business, is you have to create a value proposition for your program. And by that, what I mean is, what is it, what, what's the purpose of your program? And what does it add to the athletic department and to the university? What is the value of that program? And if you have a hard time really describing that, that value, then you have some opportunities to really address these areas. And the ones that we heard from our athletic director about programming that were so important to them, to our athletic director at Minnesota, was how competitive the program was. Then second of all, how its connection with the community, how it supported the community. Um, we heard about the GPA. We heard about the, the cost of the program to the department. We heard about Title IX. And in our case, in all of those instances, we brought value to the department and it didn't matter. So the fact that we had built a program that was basically based on the concept that we would be self-supporting, we paid for over half of our operating costs, we paid for our assistant coaches costs, we, uh, when I retired from coaching in the late 80s, we raised money for, for a scholarship endowment program. Later on, when we built an indoor facility at Minnesota for tennis, indoor-outdoor facility, um, we were asked if, um, by, in our uh, baseline club, which is our booster club, if we could make a donation, a sizable donation to the completion of that project. And we donated a million, $1.4 million for that. And then later another 250 for the outdoor. So the, the story at Minnesota is a story about how things have changed in athletics 
especially recently with COVID. And the fact that athletic directors in these universities are really being challenged with how to balance their budgets. In our case at Minnesota, just yesterday, we got some interesting news. Um, when I first heard about the fact that they were talking about, or they had announced that they were gonna um, eliminate the men's tennis program, I called the athletic director and asked for a meeting with him. Our athletic director, Mark Coyle, and I sat down along with the head of our booster club, Anne Marie Rogers. Um, and we had a great meeting and asked, and he said, you know, here's my problem, Jerry. He says, with COVID and its impact on our football revenue, and he says, our shortfall in our fundraising for Athletic Village, which was a hundred plus million dollar project, we're about $75 million in the hole. And I looked at him and I said, you know, in business, if you've got a big problem, you don't solve big problems with little fixes. And a little fix in terms of your budget shortfall is the elimination of the men's tennis program and the men's gymnastics program and track, which amounts to about a million six a year against a $125 million a year budget. Well, interesting, he was, he, he looked at me and he says, you know, I said, I said, what you need to do is go to your board of directors, your board of regents, and tell them you need a $75 million zero, zero interest loan. Loan rates are very low now. You need a loan. Um, so he said, very interesting uh, idea. Two days later, the Ohio State Athletic Director went to his board of regents for a $100 million zero interest loan because of COVID impact on his budget. In his request, he said, we are not going to cut any sports because we believe in the student athlete model. And when we go back to Minnesota, what, we've, uh, what we heard from both our athletic director and I met personally with the president of the university, I said to her, our new president, I said, the student athlete model as we know it and grew up in it is really under attack, is it not? And she says, you're absolutely right because it's no longer about the student athlete and what that represents to the university, but it's about maximizing revenue. Well, yesterday, our athletic director put on the docket for this week's, this Thursday and Friday's um, Board of Regent meeting, a request for $125 million zero interest loan. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, we're hopeful. We got a, a call from one of the members of the Board of Regents yesterday. I was just on call with our booster club today and that's, uh, who said that he was hopeful that as part of that loan that uh, in their discussions this week that they would reinstate the men's tennis and gymnastics programs. So this is brand new news and we'll see how it plays out. But it really tells you, at least in our specific case, that it's all about the money. And it's and it's and today it's it's all about the money and it's about athletic directors trying to find big answers. The hope is if that program can be reinstated, one of our athletic directors, best friends, is one of Ross is Ross's athletic director. And our athletic director told me, he says, you know, we're all about the same. He says, we're like lemmings going over the cliff. He says, if one AD does it, the next one will follow and we'll follow and we'll follow and we'll follow. Right, Ross? And now you've got the model of, you've got Iowa and you've got Minnesota with more Big Ten teams to follow if we can't get this thing turned around. So, I mean, it's a little bit off of the you know, this discussion that you were having, but we had such a robust discussion about how to really help build and protect your team with Tim uh, in his presentation that I thought I'd give you a little more background on what, what we are uh, facing at Minnesota. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. It's, it's uh, good to hear that potentially there's some good news in the, in the works there. And, and um, yeah, look forward to following that story and, and giving us all a little bit of hope. Uh, we are hearing recently as well, there's some hope for Winthrop tennis. There's some hope for East Carolina women's tennis. Um, so it appears that some individuals are, are potentially having a change of heart and, and uh, we'll see what happens these next few weeks and, and months. But Ross, I mean, um, for you, can you kind of take us through how, you know, the lead up to the news being broken to you, how you actually heard about um, 
uh, you know, the elimination of your, of your program? Uh, what were some of the reasoning that you were told? And um, any, any other kind of uh, guidance as to maybe what coaches might be looking for, or should be looking for, or was it a complete surprise to you kind of coming out of nowhere? Can you kind of bring us through that a bit? Um, looks Sorry, like I'm, yeah. I'm back here. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, once COVID started um, in March, we were having head coaches meetings probably, you know, sometimes every week, sometimes every other week, depending on, you know, the information that the senior staff had gotten and, and their main focus was obviously trying to keep, um, like Jared's talking about, trying to, to keep the athletic department afloat with all the revenue loss from football and the men's basketball tournament and, and ticket sales, especially here at Iowa. And so um, there was three plans and the first two didn't involve um, cutting any, any sports. Um, and then the third one, if we didn't play football was we were going to have to cut sports. Um, and he told us that in March or April, didn't tell us what sports were being considered being cut. Um, I'd asked my administrator, you know, are we a sport that is on the chopping block for whatever reason. And she, she said that they hadn't even discussed that. And so um, things were looking good throughout the summer. Obviously big 10 was moving forward with testing and being able to play football. And then, you know, was it late August? Oh, we, we got the bad news. And then a week later um, on a Friday, um, the very last Friday in August, I got a message from our AD that said we needed to meet at 10 a.m. And literally right after that, our men, our men's and women's swimming and diving coach called me and asked me if I got the same message. I said, yeah. And gymnastics coach texted me and asked me and I said, yeah. And so we all kind of knew pretty much what that was going to be. And so, you know, I had my meeting with the AD and he just said, because of COVID and financial reasons, we're going to have to discontinue the men's tennis program, you know, along with three other programs um, after this season. And um, just pretty much blamed it all on, on COVID. Um, and then after that, we had probably 100 student athletes, coaching staff, um, administrators, and all the other support staff in the basketball practice gym. And the AD, Gary Barta, gave, you know, a five-minute spiel about, you know, telling the athletes that the program was cut and it wasn't his fault. It was COVID's fault. And um, there's nothing that they could do and the programs weren't coming back. And he was, you know, basically we need to find new places to go to school and to work. Um, mm -hmm. after that, the, uh, the teams were all split up into different rooms and we had our, you know, senior women's administrator address the team for a few minutes. And after that, we had, um, our compliance direct, our compliance director and um, head of our student athlete support services uh, talking with the guys. Obviously, they didn't know what to say. And, you know, I, I kind of just butted in and just kind of talked about how I felt, talked about, um, you know, how you don't really know what to say. You know, I was talking about how I had started relationships with every guy on the team and, you know, that I was sorry. And, you know, we probably just, we just kind of had a, a team. I mean, kind of moment for about an hour. Um, guys are frustrated. Um, you, you know, like as, as you can imagine, it's just really emotional for them, especially coming off of everything that we had built um, over the past seven years. And, you know, on top of that, I mean, we have a lot of guys from England. I mean, these guys came back here at the beginning of August to quarantine for two weeks and were stuck in a hotel for four days. And then they couldn't go out of their houses for another, you know, eight days. And, and then finally three days when they get out of quarantine, we get our program cut. And it's, you know, for you're sitting back there and you're looking at it and you're like, wow, I mean, these guys, you know, risk potentially could have risked their lives flying over here to, to play college tennis for the university of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And this happens to them. And so they're frustrated. And um, anyways, you know, they gave them information on transferring and things like that. And then, uh, you know, we, we kind of just talked as a team and, and then things have kind of played out how they've, they've played out, but it was, uh, you know, I, could, I, I would say that the one thing is, is unfortunate. I feel like a lot of our guys didn't really get to be heard in the day and age of, you know, student athletes having a voice and, you know, having 16 numbers to call if they need anything or if anything's wrong, you know, 
the fact that an administrator can't sit down face to face with, you know, a group of guys who have made this commitment to the University of Iowa um, and answer their questions and just just be heard. You know, I think that was pretty hypocritical on their part. And it's definitely not the message that they send. Um, and that was that was really frustrating for our team. Yeah, thanks. you know, one of the things, Dave, uh, Dave, yep. you know, uh, and really good comments by Ross. One of the things I think um, that was a little different in Minnesota's case was we were in school. So the athletes, the so school was in session. It would just begin, it had, you know, it was about a month old. And similar to Ross's description, Jeff Young, our men's tennis coach, was called about an hour before the announcement was made publicly and told at the last minute. So there was no forewarning except for the contracts for all of the non-revs or Olympic sports as they became uh, up for renewal, including Jeff's. The AD, and this might be something for other coaches to watch for, the AD had added a clause into their contract renewal that said if their team was cut, they would not get any sort of um, severance pay. So that was something that all of a sudden that appeared in a number of those contracts as they came up. So if they had, and there was no other discussion other than an hour before getting the notice that the team had been cut and, and being told by the athletic director that as Ross had mentioned at Iowa, team camp, it won't come back. Don't even try to fundraise. Don't do anything. Well, we took the opposite approach. And I think one of the things that's really important, we talked about building these teams as Ross has done a great job at Iowa with Iowa program is that you have to have a booster club. You have to have that community connection. You need to build your program around your community, both um, as Tim talked about inside the university, but more, even more importantly, I think in the, in the case of tennis outside in the broader community, you know, with your section and uh, local USTA. Um, but also, we started a booster club way back in the late 70s because we needed to, we wanted to get people to come out to our matches to make it really important. And so we grew that, to, you know, we had 400 members at, two, at $20 a year a person. And we gave them a jacket that they could wear that they said, well, that grew and grew and became the source for our endowment. But also when we got cut, those people, along with the alums that had played, like me, had played at Minnesota, became very active, along with people in the community went out. If we had not had that baseline club, our, our particular club, we really would have been on our own. And I think it's so critical for uh, coaches to really look at how do we build some sort of a support group. In our case, our support group really was the ones that, that went out and raised all the money, has done all the work, and have been the people that have really fostered. We've got a tremendous media campaign going and so forth, all of which hasn't really phased them until 60 Minutes did that piece on Sunday night. That has had a huge impact because now our AD is on the defense big time. Mm. So, but I think if any coach is thinking about getting started or is, is looking at his or her program, look at that booster club. And one of the things that we did was when we started out men's tennis, we needed to build, we made the club for men's tennis. I think today that you all have to really, and again, I've been out of it for 30 years, so who am I to tell you what to do? But with the Title IX piece, you've got to take that off the table and, and one of the things to do is to combine your booster clubs into one booster club that supports both men and women. I think the more things that can be done that bring men and women together, like we did in the 80s, we used to play Iowa. And I don't know if you even knew about this, Ross, but we played Iowa in the pregame before the Iowa-Minnesota basketball game. We had a full house. They loved it. We played world team tennis format on the basketball court. We did the same with Wisconsin. And we just knew, we just saw what happened with that. So I think that any ways that you all can take Title IX off the table and make it about the budget and then 
you're really a very small part of the budget. And then to be able to talk about how these problems that they're having are not fixed by cutting men's or women's tennis or these non-revenue sports. They're typically a percent or so of their budget. So just some thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Jerry. I, I would. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead, Ross. I, I mean, I think Jerry's got a lot of good and it's really good input. Um, and I, I would also add to that. Um, I did a lot of fundraising on my own. You know, one of the things our AD would say is vision out vision without resources are relevant. That's one of the things he told me when I got hired. And so yeah. I took that is, Hey, I need to be the one going out there and, and, and fundraising and getting in touch with the alumni and kind of building this group um, that Jerry had done so well in Minnesota. But I also think a, a big piece of that is, is not only the boosters, but I think you got to be in your AD's office, you know, three to five times a year telling him, Hey, we need this for the tennis program. Like we need, we need athletic department dollars invested in our facility. And I'm not talking about, you know, a hundred thousand, I'm talking about like a million because when the hard decisions start to come, you know, he's got to answer to what he has spent money on as the AD. And for our case here at Iowa, our facility is a rec services facility that was open in 2011. And so, you know, Iowa was very, they didn't have much invested financially, you know, in our facility because it's not a, it's, it's not a, an athletics facility. We have to schedule time with rec services. And to them, it's almost more of like a headache um, to deal with all of that stuff. But if, I had been here, you know, obviously 2011, I was uh, only five years out of college, but uh, you know, I would have probably been battling for, for us to get a facility that they put money into, because I think that would have been a lot harder for them to cut men's tennis. Um, and the sports that were cut at Iowa, all of them use rec services facilities and, you know, with, with scheduling and things like that, I think maybe they, yeah, they save some money. Like Jerry said, it's not really, it's not going to help their bottom line to save maybe 5 million. I think that's some funny math that they've done here at Iowa personally, but um, it's more of just a headache. They don't have to worry about dealing with another, you know, entity on campus trying to schedule and with, um, with all the other things that go into it with liabilities and stuff like that. So I, for any head coach, you know, I, I would definitely be, you know, meeting with the AD trying to get them financially invested in your program and for any, you know, young, like assistant coach. I mean, I was pretty motivated. I mean, I rose up the ranks pretty quickly. I, you know, uh, go pick, pick wisely the programs that you go to. I mean, uh, Iowa was a great place. I took a visit here as a recruit, but there was a reason why they hadn't been very good for 40, 50 years is because they didn't put any money into it. I mean, again, 2011 was the first time that we had an indoor facility and an outdoor facility. As Jerry knows, like, we were playing on a rubber indoor court in, in the middle of a track for, for forever. I mean, I was, yep. And then we, and then we played uh, outdoor tennis um, on the tennis courts. They used to park cars for the football game on the weekend. So right. I mean, you definitely I played on them many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, shoot, I graduated 2006 and we played on them there. And um, oh, so, so, I mean, I, I think just making sure that you go to a program where, you know, being, they're financially invested in it um, and, and they really want to win and they want to do well. It's not just a, not just to have, say they offer, you know, tennis or, or something like that. I think that's a big thing. The other thing is I would say is what that really helped us and really got going is I had a, a developed a relationship with our AD right away. And uh, right from the moment we hired and talked to him about the things that needed to be done, as you've mentioned, Ross, um, and, and made that, and he said, what's the best thing that I can do for you? I said, come to the Big Ten Championship. You'll be the first AD that has done it. And he did. And he would come to AD. He would come to those. ADs today don't do that. It's changed. I mean, maybe some of yours do, but a lot of them don't do that. And uh, it's more about, you know, and they're making a million dollars a year now. They were making, you know, not much over, you know, for a long time. You go back even six years at Minnesota, they're making, which is a lot of money, 400000 a year. Now that AD in that job is making a million dollars a year. Do you think that that AD has the same passion for all of these athletic programs as the AD that preceded that person? Chances are not. 
And that's what's changed. This has become a big business. But I think if you can get close to your AD and what Tim said is try to have some meetings with them to really let them know what's going on. But even as important, make connections in that community as Ross has done, go out into that community and ask the people that you think have some connection with that AD to make a call and just say how great the program is and what a wonderful job they're doing. I mean, those things go a long way in making a decision on whether to cut men's tennis or women's tennis or some other program too. Yeah. I just want to take a few questions here from the coaches now. So um, Jerry and Ross, maybe Ross, you can start wondering if there are some red flags that you would recommend other coaches be on the lookout for when they are in the running for head coaching jobs in the future. I mean, I, I, again, I mean, I, I've, I've interviewed for one head coaching job and was lucky to get it here. So uh, I've limited experience in that, but just kind of what I think I just said was, you know, asking a lot of questions on how financially invested is the athletic department in the tennis program. I think that's a, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I've talked to a couple um, people who have left Iowa to take senior staff positions at other division one places like Clemson and Auburn. And, and I asked the same question and that is exactly what they said was make sure that the athletic ADs are financially invested in your program. Okay. Yeah. Jerry, you, anything to add? And sorry, yeah, and sorry you, Russ. You, I mean, you, just real quickly, you'll easily be able to see that um, when you walk into a facility. I mean, you're going to see how it looks like and you know how it's built. And if you're on campus for an interview, I think that's going to be a pretty much a no-brainer on how how invested they are into your program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know a good question to ask in your interview is um, where does this program fit? in what you're trying to do. What do you see the importance of this program being? And how does it fit in with the rest of the, the rest of the programs at the university? I mean, you, you really need to get a, uh, you really need to get a feel from the person. You think that, wow, geez, I'd like this job, but you're really interviewing that person. They need to sell you on taking this job because they could put you out in the street in a year if they decided that they wanted to do that. So you need to be feel comfortable that their vision for the program um, fits with what you want to get into because there's nothing worse, I think, than what Ross is going through. And I just feel for these guys. This is, uh, this is terrible. And especially when you've worked as hard as he has in trying to build his program. Yeah, for sure. And, and um, Ross, to you again, another question here. Do you think your endowments made it more enticing to cut the programs uh, the athletic department can take that money and use it elsewhere. Are there any safeguards for endowment donors to make sure their money cannot be used outside of tennis scholarship salaries, et cetera? I'm not sure what the, the language on the contract for the donation was on there. Um, I know that it's not being used for, uh, I know that they were asked to use it for something other than men's tennis, but the donor declined that they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you can go another way on this. I think you can just be a really go, a big go getter, a young coach that's ready to, to build a program. And all of a sudden you're starting to do all these things and you're building up steam. And I think maybe the athletic department can be like, Hey, we don't, we didn't want this. We don't want you to do this stuff, but people are so invested. And maybe that's a negative. That could be a negative. I just think, again, when you take a job, you've really got to, you got to ask those questions. Like, how important is this? Can I do these? This is, how, this is the program that I want to build at this school. Is that going to match up with what you want to, to build here as well? I think that's probably the most important thing that you could ask on an interview, look, um, looking back from the things I've learned over the past eight years. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you also, um, and that's a, that's a good point. I, I also would ask them, if I raise my own money, does that money go to my program or does that money go into the general fund? Very important question. When we raised our endowment and – when I uh, retired from coaching, um, the first thing that we did is we created a board of trustees of our baseline club, our booster club. And our goal was to endow the scholarships for men's tennis. We have a 501c3 nonprofit. And the 501c3 was a recipient of the funds, not the tennis program. That's really important. 
it so was outside the university. And then our booster club, the baseline club, then had a memorandum of understanding with the foundation, the University of Minnesota Foundation. And we were specific in that, in, in building and in putting that contract together with the foundation that should the men's program ever be cut, the money goes back to the baseline club. So now the first call I got from the university the night that the day that they cut the program was from their head of fundraising surprise. And he was talking about the endowment fund. And I said, you know, of course, that the endowment fund, you can't touch that. It goes back to the baseline club. He didn't know that. If you think about William and Mary and what they tried to do at William and Mary is to take their $13 million endowment fund away from non-revenue sports and use it for the other sports. But this piece that what Ross was talking about is really important. That's another reason you need an outside um, organization such as a booster club that's a registered nonprofit so that if you are going to raise money, you have a way for that money to go without it going directly to the university. And then that organization can negotiate the terms of the uh, of the contract with the university and you don't do it as the coach. Thank you, Jerry and, and Ross. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time here. I think we, we could go for, for an hour longer. You guys have uh, so much experience, so much knowledge, uh, so much wisdom in, the, in this area. Um, obviously, we're, we're pulling for both uh, University of Minnesota, University of Iowa, and all the other programs that have, have faced elimination here the last few months. We hope 2021 will be a much brighter picture and uh, hope to see some some programs return. So if there's anything the ITA can do to help either program, please let us know. But uh, thank you for giving your time today and, and to College Tennis. And, and, and again, uh, hope to see you in the new year. Thanks, Dave. Thanks Appreciate so much. It. Thanks, guys. Good luck, Russ. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jerry. All right, thanks, Dave, and thank you, uh, Ross, and thank you, Jerry. Obviously, that's a really important topic given the times. Um, we're going to move on to a slightly uh, lighter and and maybe happier topic. Uh, we've got Global Sports Connection here. Uh, Mark Ozer is is with them, as as is Mark Legree, and they're both here to join us to tell us a little bit about. Uh, what Global Sports Connection is doing to connect players to college opportunities as well as college teams to abroad experiences. Uh, right after that, we will roll into another quick trivia question and prize. So stay tuned for that. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Mark and Mark. Well, I like trivia uh, quite a bit. Thank you, Corey. So I might stick around for that. Uh, that's good. So I'm Mark Ozer. I'm the founder of Global Sports Connection way back in the day. And I guess it is a happier topic, except in COVID times, not a lot of travel going on to Europe. Uh, that's Mark Legree there. Uh, yes, hello. I'll introduce uh, shortly, but just to give you uh, a bit of context on a, exec on, on a Global Sports Connection, uh, I started this with a Princeton teammate about 30 years ago, I guess, and I've been to the uh, coaches convention and know a good many of you from my time there are probably been about 20 years though. So I'm going to walk you through some things. And again, I know you're on break in a long day, so feel free if you need to grab a glass of water, et cetera. I know there's a lot going on, uh, but we'll walk you through. I will give some time back in presentation. I do a lot of these myself and uh, hopefully take some questions uh, there at the end. So that is our structure for the next uh, eight minutes or so uh, here on uh, on this day, let's see. Okay, sharing. Okay, so that's uh, me. Uh, <clears throat> well, back in the day, just a little bit of background. Uh, long, long ago, played tennis at Princeton University with Dave Benjamin. So that was one of the reasons I was uh, there at the coaches convention. Uh, in later years, I got my MBA at Northwestern, met my wife there. Uh, long ago, played ATP doubles, spent a year of a, at Duke. I thought I saw Dave Hagemus on. I was the men's assistant. He was the women's way back in the day. And then I was a circuit rat. Uh, uh, you can read about me in Sports Illustrated, you know, just sort of on the edge of the circuit, but played a lot over in Europe and discovered great opportunities. Did a little writing from the cafes over there, and I'm mostly fluent in English. I can't punctuate, uh, but strong uh, French verbal skills. And then just uh, overall, um, this takes you through about 1990, 
uh, sorry, 2002, where kids started coming along. And actually, I spend my days now mostly working in the online space, uh, partner with top universities and business schools to take their executives online at Exec Online, which I founded in 2012. And then, Mark, I'll let you uh, intro yourself there a little bit. Uh, one of my very first clients, he answered a letter yeah. back uh, that I had translated into French back in the day. Yeah, hello, guys. Uh, yeah, that was at the time internet was the, just uh, at the yeah. beginning in France. So, yes, I received a letter from Mark. And, uh, you know, I was at the university in France playing some tennis and I didn't know what to expect. So it, it took me a year to decide to, to go to college in the U.S. And uh, I got lucky to, to uh, you know, I, I, to play for New Mexico State uh, University under Don Ball and, and Coach Vargas. So I, I spent three years to, uh, you know, to, to get my bachelor degree because I studied university in France. And, and then when I, <clears throat> along that, I played some college tennis. I was uh, happy enough to, to, you know, to combine both studies and tennis. And when I came back to France, uh, I guess, uh, you know, Mark at that time asked me to take over the, the process. And uh, so I'm basically doing that for 18 years now. You know. Mark? They got it. Me. And so I'm just going to run this at a high level. This is a website probably dates to about 2002, but it just took a church. So I'm going to talk about this at a high level just for a, a few minutes and have Mark talk to you about what really goes on day to day because he's running the business and uh, we'll figure out what's most relevant to this group, uh, both generally and here in 2020, 2021. So team connection is something we actually have launched more recently. College teams going over for a week to two weeks in the summer. Um, up to three weeks often combined with a trip to the French Open, but other countries as well. And Mark will talk in a bit more detail about it. But again, it's if you do doing well with the fundraising and the boosters, I uh, have probably worked with about 15 teams over time, taking them over uh, for summer competition. Tournament Connection uh, is the first business we ever launched back in 1990. And that was for college players competing uh, over in French tournaments. That's mostly, we've done uh, other countries, certainly Switzerland, Belgium, Holland, uh, and others, and uh, probably well, over a thousand players, I would say, over time. Very unique system, although less unique now with the UTR, but that's again, people feeding into tournaments based on their level, a three week tournament. People have a day or two, which is their level, play multiple tournaments each uh, week. I played 10 tournaments in a month at one point, went all over France and did that for a number of years before my father said, what are you doing with your life? Go to business school. And then College Connection, that is the major part of the business at this point. I would say many of you, I'm sure, have received Mark's communications uh, over recent years. That is finding the right opportunity uh, for the player, but also really working with the coaches, making sure they understand uh, on both sides, setting up college visits and other things that have not been done uh, uh, more generally. So those are the three major parts. Mark actually, for people who are out of school, professional level, does do club contracts in various countries. That was a small part of the business when I was writing this down an adjunct. So I'm going to have Mark talk about each of these sort of day-to-day -day parts uh, at, again, a relatively high level, plenty of information behind this if you're interested. But let me have Mark speak to both kind of what this looks like. And for many of you, you might have met him uh, two years ago or so at the conference. Other times it's just been emails and others coming over the years. So I thought it was a good opportunity for us to come together when Corey reached out to at least share what we're doing and uh, quite frankly, get your feedback on where we go from here to support you. So go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah. so b basically we, we are guiding between 30 and 40 players uh, every year. Um, most of them are from France, uh, but we also do other countries. Um, so the way we work is we always meet play, uh, players and family in person and uh, because we, we want to go over their, their needs and, and criteria and we want to make sure it, you know, it matches up with the, with the reality. So before we accept to work with them, we make sure everything is, on, is, a, is, a, is, is correctly understandable. And then we, we always, uh, I, you know, always play with the players most of the time. That's why you know, I, try, I try to, to stay up to a, a, you know, a, a certain level so I can, you know, uh, um, and uh, understand the level, the potential, and then I can talk better to you guys uh, about uh, you know how they can become potentially a good college players. And uh, but we only do tennis. That's our very uh, specificity. We only do tennis, and um, uh, you know we we want to make sure uh, you guys when you, when you guys call us, we want to make sure we 
we, we get the player that fits to your program. Because obviously, on one side, you know, everybody in France has different expectations, they have different background. And, and you guys, uh, you know, have, have so many different things to offer. So uh, different location, different school program, different uh, coaching approach. So that, that has to be very, very important for us to know you to know you well and then on the other side to know the players we got uh, as much as we can all right uh, so that's about college connection okay um, I'm going to probably speed up a little bit here just because I know Corey I know we're on a timer uh, but again the tournament connection is playing tournaments all over Europe uh, and France specifically uh, it was the first part of the business I guess the one thing to note and Mark Correct me, is it's very important not only to choose the right tournaments, get the right level, we're able to fix the levels over there, but also to be the voucher for those players that they're going to show up, that they're going to behave correctly, you know how to get there, et cetera. So anything else you want to add there, Mark? No, that it's it's a lot of fun for them for sure. They get to play a lot. They, they, it's, a, it's an adventure, it's an experience, it's a human experience for them. And it's a lot of fun for me to to make them, you know, living this experience. Yeah. And then Corey, um, now we're going to jump again, the team connection. We're happy to send plan information. Corey, let us know the best way for them to get information into people's hands. Obviously they can contact us directly, but again, we set up uh, dozens of these trips and it's a nice combination of tennis, but obviously culture. And again, hard to do in 2020, impossible 2021. Yeah, we're hoping yeah. and uh, certainly in the future. Get Corey, for that. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Mark. And, and thanks, Mark. The two, the two Marks. Um, I, I'll go ahead and post your email here in the chat just in case coaches do have any questions for you. Uh, so, and then we, we do have to move along. So I'll go ahead and do that just, just in a second here. But thank you guys so much for taking the time to to talk to our coaches and uh up next we have another giveaway item uh courtesy of wilson thanks again to wilson for their day-long sponsorship uh so once again coaches uh to answer this question uh go ahead and put your answer in the q a box uh, and the question is where will the ita coaches convention next year take place that was quick all right, we, that was that was a quick one. Good deal. We've got we've got a winner, and that is Carol Matsuzaki. So congratulations, Carol. Uh, you win a case of of the uh, new Wilson Trinity balls. Uh, there are still more chances to win throughout the day. For the rest of you, uh, we'll have a custom packet later on for that. Okay, thanks for that, Corey. We had a bit of French there at the end. Um, all right, just waiting for our next panel to come up here. Okay, we're missing one right now, but we'll get started like we did in the last one and uh, I'm sure Darnisha will show up. So um, this session is named a commitment to an inclusive coaching environment. So. Over the last several years, the ITA has worked to provide educational sessions at our annual coaches convention on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> this year, we've dedicated at least one session per day to these important matters. And we're thrilled to bring you uh, our great panel of coaches along with our uh, fantastic moderator, Troy Venichanos. So I'm gonna introduce Troy and then he's gonna get us started. But Troy has spent Many years in the tennis industry, working with both the USTA and the ITA, he is still involved with the USTA serving on their committees for diversity and inclusion and career pathways in tennis. He has spent the last five years working for NBC Sports Group as the director of Olympic Games Management and recently accepted a new role at the International Olympic Committee in Switzerland. Uh, Troy also facilitated, facilitated a panel on LGBTQ plus matters at our convention in 2018. So Troy, thanks so much for uh, coming back and helping us out again. And I know you're extremely busy with your uh, preparations to head to, uh, to Europe here in the next few weeks. So uh, especially busy time for you. So even more grateful. So I'll pass it over to you.
Okay, that should work. Are you good? Can you hear me? Um, thank you for that, Dave. Thanks for the introduction. But this is really an elaborate ruse to track down the ranking emails I was promised at the ITA in 2012. So <laughs> those coaches, uh, I remember who you are, and I will be expecting those votes. Uh, no, I mean, this has been great. Uh, like you mentioned, we, we did a panel on LGBTQ um, kind of issues facing coaches a couple of years ago, and I'm really happy um, and heartened that uh, the ITA leadership now is just kind of continuing that call for, for these kinds of talks. Um, I think we're waiting on one more panelist in J-Web, um, and I just spoke to him, and he's, he's popping in and out of here. <laughs> I think he has the link. Uh, hey, Jay. <laughs> um, there we are. Here we go. Um, no, I was just thanking the ITA. I mean, this kind of programming is great. Um, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jacob, for getting us all up and running. I know this is a huge task. Um, so, but I want to give our coaches the opportunity. As Carol said, coaches just want to hear what other coaches are doing. So I'm going to give you all the platform first. Um, but on the panel itself will be Carol Matsuzaki um, from MIT. We have Darnisha Moore from Alcorn State, Rodney Harmon at Georgia Tech, and J. Webb Horton and at FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast. Um, so this is a really strong group. Um, I'm going to give you each the opportunity to introduce yourselves, but really just to set some parameters on what this topic is today. It's a commitment to an inclusive coaching environment. And I think, especially now um, with acronyms constantly changing, what is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. We're focusing on the I today. So uh, there's, a, there's a famous quote from Verna Myers that helps people differentiate what, between what is diversity and what's inclusion, um, where diversity is making sure that everyone is invited to the dance and inclusion may, is making sure people feel comfortable dancing to the music they want to dance to. And you can bring this further to belonging and everything like that. But this is really about people feeling comfortable dancing, people um, being able to perform on a team, people um, being themselves and how we arrive at that kind of team environment. There's also a slate of programming later in the week um, about athlete activism. There's an LGBTQ happy hour on Thursday. So make sure to check out the schedule. Um, so again, inclusion, I'm gonna ask each of the coaches to kind of give a, a quick synopsis, synopsis of your career and how inclusion has become a part of your coaching philosophy. Um, so Carol, let's start with you. Um, how did you get into tennis, into coaching and how have you made inclusion kind of a centerpiece for your team? Hey, thanks, Troy. Um, I'm Carol. I coach at MIT, and I've been at MIT for about 21 years, I think, as the women's tennis coach, and I also teach uh, physical education classes. Um, I also played at MIT um, for my undergrad, so I, I just kind of stayed. Um, I really love the, the environment there. It's, uh, it's changed over time, of course, but um, I think uh, coaching at my alma mater has just been a gift. Um, I think as far as inclusion goes, it's always been important to me um, in how I coach the team that every person feels that they can bring their whole and authentic self to the team every day. Um, I think myself being a uh, a person of the queer community. I think that's always been important to me. Um, it's always in my mind. And then recently, you know, I think after the killing of George Floyd, it's something that we've talked about, um, you know, kind of on a weekly basis. It's, it's come up a lot. Uh, I have the team's attention. Um, we're not doing a whole lot otherwise. So it's a good time to kind of concentrate our attention on uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and it's a good time to kind of intentionally have those conversations right now. So I would say that's kind of the main area that we've focused on um, since I'd say March when uh, we left we left campus. Perfect. 
Thanks, Carol. And we'll talk a bit about that, how we make sure that 2020 is more of a movement and less of a moment. Um, we'll touch on that. Thank you. Um, Rodney, let's bring it down to Atlanta. Can you give us a bit about your background and kind of how inclusion factors into your day to day now? Well, for me, I started uh, working for the USTA in inclusion. And that was many years ago. So that kind of got me started. And oh, I first wanted to share my t shirt. One of the girls on my team designed this t-shirt and I thought I would wear it. And it says, together we change one voice, one fight. So we were able to get uh, this, this uh, emblem that she designed. Uh, we were able to get that to each of the teams here and they're wearing it as a part of their uniforms this year. And so Atlanta is obviously an interesting place because we had a police killing situation here in Atlanta. and then, Obviously, it's, it's the home of civil rights, and there's been so much going on. We have a very great mayor here, and so we have a lot of action um, and a lot of push from our administration to be inclusive of all people from all backgrounds here in Atlanta with all to make sure that they feel comfortable, that they realize that we're behind them and want the best for them. So I think part of, for me, is that I have a great administration that we deal with, um, and we're fortunate because Atlanta is the home of civil rights, so we have a lot of icons here in town. One of my players on our team just met with Stacey Abrams the other day, and which was pretty amazing because uh, Stacey Abrams had a lot to do with uh, Georgia's change over here with the voting rights. And she met with a number of students here at Georgia Tech. And we have a number of the players on our team that have decided to become more involved in inclusion and provide an opportunity for all. So it's something that we talk about a lot. We go out of our way. We're very intentional with making sure that from the beginning that we celebrate our, our differences and we also celebrate where we are dissimilar and we, we share those things. And I think for us, it's been really important to our, building our team culture so that everyone feels valued and everyone feels like uh, we all have a part of them. We all have a part of each other. And um, it's been important. I mean, if you wanna have a great team culture, it's important to make sure that you allow for everyone to share information about themselves and everyone to be in a space where they can do that. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Rodney. And I'm going to plug your appearance and then I'm going to segue over to Darnisha. You both appeared on Dave Mullins at the ITA podcast and you spoke with Dave Mullins. And yeah. um, well, you can hear a bit more about your background, Rodney, and yours, Darnisha. But um, let's hear it in your own words um, now. Uh, what brought you here today? So, okay. Hey, so yeah, I'm the head um, men's and women's tennis coach at Alcorn State. Um, I'm going into my second year here. Um, I started with college tennis, just volunteering at LSU and at Southern University, which is my alma mater. I graduated from Southern University, which is located in um, Baton Rouge, uh, as well as LSU. So just uh, as a coach, what I do to promote inclusiveness is just to piggyback off Rodney is uh, focusing on a team culture and creating a family environment for my players. And I think just promoting um, open-mindedness with each one of my players. Every My whole team is international. So everyone's from all over the world. I actually don't have any Americans. So when we talk about things like social justice and kind of things that happen in America, I just will have a team meeting and I'll bring it up and it's just kind of an open conversation. And I just get their input and their feedback and then we kind of figure out well, what can we do to support the movement? How can we fight for change? Different things like that. But we take pride in um, creating that family environment and just building a team culture and building relationships with each other to promote a healthy environment. Okay, thanks, Darnisha. Um, and let's bring it over to Fort Myers. Jay Webb, can you tell us a bit kind of about uh, your history and kind of what you've been doing, especially recently? Well, it you know, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the sort of the tethered veteran here uh, uh, it, from the standpoint of coaching. Um, but how I was raised by my mom and my father uh, came from a small town. Uh, but the whole idea, because I was in college during the height of the civil rights movement, I mean, I was a college freshman in 1964. So the stuff that we're seeing now is stuff that we lived and so we're somewhat recreating an era that was before and we're seeing it again. And one of the things we're seeing now about this whole question and the fact we're having a discussion, um, it really does me 
my heart just glows when you hear the kinds of things that Rodney and his women's team are doing or what they're doing at MIT to see a young person like Darnisha. Because when I started coaching years ago, I was like very one of the very few. So now we're having a discussion in this country about the hiring policies where you want to have sort of like a Rooney rule where men and women of color, LBGTQ, are having an opportunity to be a part of that pool that NCAA schools are going to hire. And I think that we see people, <clears throat> excuse me, people like Darnisha and, and other younger uh, minorities, that's going to help fuel the whole pipeline of getting more and more minority coaches. But, you know, we did the, I, we did the, the uh, conversations on race with about 15 teams. And we started, started, excuse me, started with the USTA and we're seeing a lot of really positive kinds of things uh, that college teams are doing around this country from Claremont, um, Scripps, Muds, all the way to uh, Binghamton College. So we'll talk a little more about that though. Perfect. Thanks, Jay Webb. Um, so let's talk about the how. I really, and we all want this to be as practical a session as possible for coaches. So um, in talking to all these panelists, there are, there are both small things and big things everyone can do. I think a lot of coaches that are new to kind of broaching these more difficult conversations or starting a culture over from scratch might be intimidated that you need to facilitate some big major talk uh, constantly, but there really are small things um, and practical steps going up to bigger, more scalable things. Um, and Carol, we'll, I'll start with you because you mentioned that it kind of starts in the recruitment process, even um, in an email that a recruit might get from you. Can you just uh, talk a bit on how you yourself have uh, created an inclusive environment and then I'll, I'll bring it around to the rest of the panelists. Sure. So, um, so the example that uh, Troy is talking about is um, when a recruit emails me and I reply at the, um, in my email signature, they can see my pronouns. Um, so that's a way of, of kind of a, a signal um, of inclusivity. And then below that, they'll see uh, kind of a, it's a rainbow flag um, icon for our MIT LGBTQ plus office. And it, it links to their website. So I think that's a way of, of showing recruits, um, you know, making them feel included. Uh, and I think that that's a small thing that I can do that kind of starts us off on the right foot. Um, would you like me to talk about some other things that I do or do you yeah, want sure. to kind of go? Let's... Yeah, sure. Yeah, All right. Cool. Um, so some, some other things that we've done is um, as a team, we've, we've had a lot of talks about uh, systemic racism over the summer. And then we, I kind of extended that to alumni and parents, um, donors, and uh, actually the whole MIT athletic department. So for our first um, gathering, uh, we called it the uh, MIT women's tennis anti-racism gathering. Uh, it was in August, I think we had about 40 people come. So it was a big crowd and um, we just had good conversation uh, and there people wanted more, you know, people wanted more and they wanted the structure. They liked the structure and the accountabil accountability that gets built into uh, something like that. So we did another one in October and we had about 60 people come to that one. So that was, that was really great to see, you know, all the people, the 40 people come back and then have even more, you know, 50% more people came. Um, so we're doing another one uh, in January or February um, about implicit bias. Um, so I'm kind of looking, I'm looking forward to that, um, but I'm glad that, you know, I think so many people have come on board and um, a thing that we've done that really has helped us uh, inspire each other and um, hold us all accountable is uh, on a Google sheet, I made a um, anti-racism anti -racism accountability form. And so people who attended these sessions, they can go on the sheet, they can put down, you know, if they read a book recently or read an article or attended a webinar, um, or if they plan to do something, if they plan to, um, you know, maybe like one person wrote, I plan to buy all my holiday uh, gifts 
from black owned businesses. So it's a, it kind of holds her accountable to doing that, you know? So she wrote that down um, and then gives any helpful links. And then people can kind of look at that sheet and get, get ideas too of what they can do um, in their own lives. And these are like everyday actions that you can do, not humongous actions that take a lot of steps. These are like little actions that people can do every day. So it's been really helpful. We have about almost a hundred items on that list already. Um, and, I, and, and it's been great to have so much um, involvement. Um, I think the other thing that helps and, and Rodney talked a little bit about this too is um, our department um, and MIT in general, but our department and our department head is really supportive of, of these types of actions. So it helps to kind of have that leadership from the top down. So I feel 100% um, supported when I take these initiatives, you know. So I think those are just some examples of uh, things that we've done um, in our everyday lives. That's great. That, that really runs the gamut size-wise and it gets buy-in kind of from the team and from the administrators, as you say. Um, going back to, to Rodney, um, you kind of set the tone from the beginning too. We were talking about kind of your first team meetings and how you make it a priority from the get-go. Can you talk a bit about kind of your process and how you make that um, from the start of each season? Sure, it's, it's uh, the first day when we come in. We bring everyone in the locker room. We have everyone sit down and we give each one, each person about three minutes. And your charge is to talk about where you're from, uh, three things that were really Im impactful to you growing up, um, and three things that you'd like to share with the group and that you'd want the group to know about you. And it's really interesting to hear about the person's life and how they grew up and their culture and what they like and what they dislike and then also things that are important to them. And it becomes very interesting as you go around the room because you start to see that the same things are interested to us all. We, we wanna be liked, we wanna be heard, we wanna be respected. And you can hear that as a common theme. So as you hear they're going around the room, that, that seems to set the tone. Then typically I'll talk a little bit to them about microaggressions, just so they understand you know, what that does and the impact that has on, on the people that you interact with so that you're not in a position where you are unintentionally hurting people's feelings. Well, you're like not, you're not trying to, but you're saying things in a way that, that cause an issue. Um, and then, you know, after we, we talk about it, we I have a board, we go up and we, and we write down our similarities and where we're different. Um, and then I think one of the most important things we do after the meeting is that we put off where everyone's from in a hat and we usually pick out one type of food and we'll, okay this time we're going to go get indian food or this time we're going to go get um thai food or this time we're going to get japanese whoever's on our team we'll find a type of food everyone likes but that everyone would individually like we'll put that in a hat we'll pick it and we'll go eat um we'll just try to do different things where we celebrate each other i think as a coach one of the most important things that's helped me as well is that i always do a lot of research on the countries and the current political status of the players on a team with the countries they're from so that I also can go to them one-on-one -on -one and say hey I heard this happening in your country is everything okay at home is because I just think it's important for them to get that feeling that you care and that you know and you're aware and you can also share with a team so that sometimes they feel so isolated that my country is so far away and no one knows what's going on so I think it's important that they feel the empathy from the people on your team but I think for team culture to build a strong, cohesive unit. It's, it's just important, the shared ideas and knowing that we're different, but the differences make us stronger, not weaker. I think is that, that's what we really try to uh, push forward with our group and it's been, it's been very successful. Yeah, it sounds like it. Darnisha, that reminds me of something that, that you do uh, on your team with, with the flags. Can you explain a bit that example and kind of how you broach that? And you're, you're touching both the men's and the women's side. So, how do you make it all gel? Yeah, first of all, um, Kel, and, Kel and Rodney, that was very powerful. I mean, just being a younger coach, I just learned so much from the um, the things that you all do. But one thing I think is a really cool thing that I do with my team, um, in the beginning of the season, I bought all of their flags. So like I said, my team is 100% international. So when I was giving them their gear, I folded up their flag and just kind of hid it under and they 
you know, revealed the flag and they were super thrilled wow. about it. They were, it was really good. I think that's a really good thing to do. But then after, you know, we took pictures, then we put it up on the fence. So, you know, we're practicing when we're playing matches, you know, we're on the court doing any type of activity, they can see their flag. And like you said, Rodney, they're so far away from home, like super far. We got Macedonia, our players from Brazil, Barbados. And I think it's just cool. Another reason why it's cool is because our, the courts are the first thing you see when you come onto our campus. So when you come onto the campus, you'll drive by and you'll see all these flags up and it's just so beautiful. And to add on to that this year, I'm going to add the, um, a Black Lives Matter flag and then the a LGBTQ flag to those flags. So um, I think that was a really cool thing that we did. And um, it showed a lot um, with my team and it showed them that I care too about, you know, where they come from and just that they're a person first. And then I just respect where they come from first. And just I know me personally, if I was in another country and I saw my flag, it would just give me a sense of pride and just a sense of, you know, work ethic to just you know, a reminder, this is why I'm here, you know, just work hard and, you know, go hard in the sport. So I thought it was a really cool thing to do. Yeah, that's all super powerful for, from each of you. And um, Jay Webb, I know you've been speaking kind of about all these issues, uh, especially this year, and we'll talk a bit about 2020, but what are the successes, the failures that, that you've had in talking to teams and coaches around the the country. For those of you that don't know, he touched on it briefly. Uh, Jay Webb has been spearheading talks um, with the help of the USTA and Brian Ormiston, um, just across divisions, across programs, um, centering on race and, and issues on, on diversity inclusion. So Jay Webb, what have you been hearing in those talks and in your own experience? Well, first of all, listening to the uh, three other people uh, has given me even more material for mm -hmm. the things as we go on. And one of the things we did touch on is, let me back up. What happened, uh, as Rodney had alluded to, was the, you know, what happened with Floyd and then the shooting in Atlanta. And, and being at my age, I mean, I've seen this and heard about it. And, and it, it was really depressing. It, it really was depressing because, you know, you, you know, the fight that we had and you thought that, you know, if one person gets killed like Floyd, that police would learn that that's not really a good thing to do, but it happened again. And then two of my good friends who are, are white basketball coaches were, had called me and were like, well, how do I talk to my players of color and, and how do we approach this? And we sort of had discussions and even our coach here at FGCU. But so it sort of lifted my spirits, but then it really clicked me back was Simon Armshaw from North Carolina State, who I've known for years, had called and he has two young girls of color on his team and had a young woman coming from Africa. And he had asked me if I would have a discussion with his team about race. And that's when we did the whole thing with working with Brian Wormiston and Bill Oaks and the Clues Varsity Committee. And the things I've seen are similar to what Carol and what Rodney are doing um, teams are actually having discussions. Uh, they're talking about Black Lives Matter. Uh, they are uh, being involved in their communities. Um, I know that uh, uh, Nick Sazula up at Binghamton had his whole team read my, you know, uh, you know, uh, Mercy about uh, the uh, gentleman who was working with uh, people on death row. And uh, so we looked at books to read that uh, teams could sort of read about other ethnicities, uh, whether it's Race Wars, his book about Latinos in America, uh, the whole thing of, of white privilege is critical, that players must understand uh, that there is a benefit. Sometimes you, you don't realize it, uh, how teammates interact. And I love what Rod was talking, because we, we ask each player, uh, each team to write a resume and read it and share it with their teammates. But coaches have to be totally aware, especially if you are not of a minority status, of what your biases are, and then look at your team and make sure that you are nullifying anything that's going to be outside of that kind of sense of civility. Because it's okay to have discussions. 
from that standpoint there. So um, listening to the, the three other coaches here and seeing what I've heard uh, from teams all over the country, from NAI to D2 to D1, uh, D3, it, it's really encouraging to see not only tennis teams, but football teams and basketball teams. Uh, some of you know, I broadcast for ESPN and Temple's team was here playing FTC women on Sunday and all the Temple team took a knee. Well, we're in Southwest Florida. I was really interested to see what the fans, what the reaction was gonna be of the fan base and uh, nothing was said. And, uh, but it was just great watching those young women uh, you know, expressing their opinions and showing something that I think is, is very much needed and to go from there. So the fact that we're having the discussions, we'll do some more in the, in 2021 and just continue the discussions, but you three just, boy, keep doing what you're doing. And I think the coaches who are on, on this uh, discussion, I think you can learn a lot from Rodney and Carol and from Darn. Yeah, no, it sounds like we're, we're all on the same page. Um, and I love that we've all arrived at it different ways, but it becoming okay with having these conversations and just getting the ball rolling somehow. I mean, it can be a small gesture of an email, a flag, whatever it is to send the message that this is a safe space and these conversations are okay. Um, I want to talk a bit, and Jay Webb, thanks for sharing your experience, kind of going all the way back to the civil rights movement, and obviously it's 2020 now. Um, I hate the word unprecedented, <laughs> amongst another uh, a bunch of other words in 2020 that I hope to never hear, but you know, I'll say it one last time, these are unprecedented times, but unfortunately, the issues that we're talking about are precedented, well, even before the civil rights movement, and unfortunately, they'll persist uh, for a bit longer, but how do we make sure that these talks aren't just a blip, that this is not just we have our administrator's attention, the school presidents, the uh, AD, and um, next year once there's a vaccine and once protests quiet, we'll just go back to business as usual. How do we, my question to you all um, is how has your approach changed since March, um, since all of our programs have changed and, and since the killing of George Floyd and all this kind of came to um, national prominence again. And how do you make sure um, this remains a priority for, for the team? Um, Carol, I'll start back with you again. Um, it's something that you had mentioned um, is a challenge just in keeping interest in attendance. Um, you said that your um, kind of attention, uh, attendance at these anti-racism gatherings had uh, increased by 50%, but how do we keep those numbers up? We talked about accountability. Um, how are you, what are you doing to make sure this stays on the radar well before 2020 and beyond? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and first of all, I, I just want to thank Rodney and J Webb and Dardisha. I, I'm taking notes. Like you're, you know, what, what you all are doing are, are amazing. And I think um, like the the flags, Darnisha, like that's that's awesome. I'm gonna steal that idea. Um, uh, I think, uh, and then getting back to your question, Troy, about um, sustainability. I think that's a really important thing to kind of think about right now because right now we are focused and right now we have the time and and I think right now is the is the time to kind of build that foundation and default way of living so that once we go back to operations as usual or something like that um, we can have those systems in you know so something like at the department level um, hiring and promotions, right? We need to look at that right now so that once we do get back to, to a regular cycle of hiring and promoting, we have those systems intact. We've already looked at those. We've already made sure that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion are part of those steps. Um, I think as far as, you know, our team, um, I think we have to keep having these conversations. Um, and I think right now I'm, I'm happy, I'm pretty happy with the attendance at these 
um, gatherings um, and, and people's kind of energy level and, and uh, engagement. Um, but I do have to keep kind of touching base with every single person, kind of like, hey, you coming to the next one, you know? And there's, you know, a lot of people I need to reach out to to kind of like keep keep that um, uh, energy high. And the more people come, the more people are gonna come, you know? So if I have, if I have, you know, maybe 80 at the next one, then maybe some more people will be like, oh man, I missed out. I wanna go to that, 80 people showed up, you know? So I think. I think it's a lot of relationship building. Um, as the other coaches have said, it's important to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, keep those going and kind of keep the conversation going. And, and it does take kind of an everyday effort, um, but it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, our, it's what we do, right? Is, is build relationships. So I think we have to be kind of really intentional in those relationship building um, part of this so that, uh, you know, again, as I said, once we get back to, you know, everyday practice kind of uh, thing, uh, those systems are in place. Yeah, that's right. Well, I I would say this. Go ahead, Jay Webb. What I would say to, to piggyback on what Carol's doing, because that's, that's amazing. But you wanted to build that support on campus because once the norm comes, all of you are coaching and that becomes your priority. So you build allies within the campus community. It could be the Black Faculty Staff Association, it could be the Black Student Union, the Latino Student Union, the LBGTQ communities. You work with them to help them have events and your players are supporting them. Or you're working with your student, the, the staff, of making sure you're going to Board of Trustees. Look at the Board of Trustees. In the state of Florida, if you look at the, the breakdown of the number of black members of the board of trustees, it, it's absolutely horrendous. So those are issues that students can raise. Um, I tell you, one of the things I was really impressed with is Colorado State had a serious issue there relative to sexual harassment. Uh, just so impressed with Emma Corrin, Tim and Corrin's daughter, who's really leading that attack. When she's met with the board of trustees and raised those issues of, uh, of something that's also horrific from that standpoint, so as long as you are building relationships with the president of the college, because one of the things tennis programs relative to this pandemic, we must show that we're relevant to the campus and the campus community, because who are they cutting? They are gonna cut football programs, right? But tennis programs become extremely vulnerable. And if you show that you are part of the campus community and the community around doing, going out reading, to schools or doing programs, tennis uh, clinics for, for inner city kids. Those are the things that we have to really look at because it comes down to survival. And this is a battle worth fighting. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. Thanks, Shay Webb. No, that's, that's very valid. It's, it starts on the top and you need buy-in from all angles. Um, Rodney, I'd like to talk a bit just because, I mean, in working with USTA's inclusion efforts, I mean, you're no stranger to this whole arena in a formalized way and just um, day to day. What have, how have you kept the focus um, on this kind of family inclusive environment for so long? And what are your advice to, what's your advice to coaches that aren't in Atlanta and have access to Sandy <laughs> Road or in Cambridge? Um, what would you say? To well, I, you know, I would say the first thing is make sure that you're aware of what resources you have around you, both on campus and in the city where you are, because I think that's really important. I think you have to set realistic goals for what you're trying to, to achieve. One of our biggest goals here with our, our, our group is we're trying to change one heart at a time. We're trying to open up your mind and change one heart at a time. And our question always is, well, how do you do that? And we did that as a group, well, how do you do that? Well, it's not the words you say, it's the actions that you do. You remember by your actions, not by your words. So that's why we've talked very much about being very intentional with how you treat people. Also being very supportive of, of others. Um, I think Jay Webb made a very key point, which is your administration. We're very lucky that we have a extremely supportive administration. Our AD was a former football player here at Tech. <laughs> and so as soon as the, the, the whole George Floyd situation occurred, 
he bought out a billboard right off of I-75 here and put Black Lives Matter. Um, we support our student athletes of all backgrounds. Together we swarm. And it's a huge, it's in black. You couldn't miss it if you're dropping up and down. So, and I just think, so once the fervor and once all of the attention is gone and like what's left and what needs to be left, hopefully is a more open mind and a, a more giving and, and caring heart. So that's what, what, what we promote. And that's what we talk about a lot, compassion, kindness. So everyone, people from all backgrounds and how do you do that and how do you show that? And because you have an opportunity to be a beacon to other people. One of the ways we're doing that now is uh, our team has gone through and they go out of their way to support all the other teams on campus. So whenever there's an event of any type, it doesn't matter if it's a volleyball game, a softball, we're there and we hold up signs and we're supporting the different girls, girls and guys. It doesn't matter, girls and guys. And it's kind of caught on because when we play our matches, won't be this year, but last in the last couple of years, we have a football team comes out and supports our, our girls. And they're clapping and so, the whole campus feels like they are, everyone's working in one direction. And I think it's a lot of it for us is through the administration. And all I'm just trying to do is make sure that, that my team is aware to be a part of it. And also as in, in our small group, just always focus on how can we change one heart and open one mind from everyone that, that, that we come in contact with. I love that. And Ronnie, that logo that you showed before that um, one of the student athletes is on. That goes across sports. Is everyone kind of flying that flag together? Yeah, we're all we're all we're all flying that flag, and it's it's great. I mean, um, I was just so impressed when when the young lady came up with it, and then for our football team, they they've worn it um, at their games, and our basketball team has worn it as well. And yeah, all the teams will be wearing this this year, which is uh, together we change, one voice, one fight. So it's uh, I think it's pretty pretty amazing. So I'm so happy to be a part of it. Fantastic. Um, Darnisha, I'm curious about kind of what you're seeing. I mean, at Alcorn State, I mean, it's a totally different, we have an HBCU environment, you have a completely international team. 2020 has been a huge year for social justice in this country. Obviously, the pandemic has reached everyone, but how does 2020 feel and look different on the ground? You've got a men's team, a women's team, um, and how are you kind of um, tackling that right now? Yeah, so it's definitely, definitely challenging. Um, like I said, with the team being international, they don't, some of my players don't go through some of the things that Americans go through. And like I said, I don't have any Americans. So initially, I thought that it was challenging addressing it with the team, because they may not have those problems in their countries, but it is a problem here. And they do need to be aware of that. So I think first step is always just giving out the knowledge and giving out the facts of this is what's going on. This is why this is a problem. And you're at an HBCU, so it's important for you to be aware of these things. And that just promotes the awareness, you know, within with the players and the, it promotes engagement um, with the team as well. So just, and again, I'm just learning so much from you guys. This is, this is great. But I think it starts in the recruiting process, just asking certain questions. And even in the beginning of um, the semester, when I'm meeting with my players, I ask, you know, what are you all looking to get out of the team? What type of environment do we want to create? And literally almost every player said a family environment. So now it's in my hands to create that environment for the players. So I think a good thing um, that I do, and this is what I learned from a couple of my mentors who kind of just put it all together. I have a buddy system. And basically I will pair a men's player with the women's player. And you all can, I mean, any coach can do this with the, I mean, just the women's team, just the men's team, but I'll pair a player, a, a men's player with a female player. And then basically it's like a challenge. So you make it a competition. So we'll have a board. And if, you know, one of the pairs goes to a football game or a basketball game, and they'll say they have on an awkward tennis shirt, you know, they'll send me a picture and then I'll post it and that's how they'll get points. And it helps because you can post it on your social media too. But another thing, if they go to community service, send me a picture. If they, you know, who has the highest GPA, different things like that, or we'll even make it fun and do um, on-court events like mixed doubles or something just to add some fun. But I saw that that really helped the team, um, again, with their awareness and their engagement with each other. And then it helped them to 
because they're international, maybe they're inside of a box and they're kind of scared to do certain things. I saw that maybe a little timid about going to different events. And I saw that it helped, you know, them uh, build that confidence to, you know, take a step outside your dorm, go out and, you know, experience the college life. So that was another benefit of it. And then with the fact that um, the players are from all over the world, I have a male player from, let's say, Brazil, and he's paired with a player from Barbados. And they know nothing about each other's background. So, you know, I noticed that when I implemented that program, I'll start seeing them together. And then I'll see more, like when I go to the cap, the players will be together. And then they'll just be learning about each other. And our um, team dinners are, they're just awesome. We <laughs> So many different perspectives, so many different um thoughts my players challenge each other it's really fun when we get to just sit down as a group and talk about everything and they're really open so I'm glad we have that just open and safe environment where they feel comfortable speaking their mind that's great I'm going to stay on you Darnisha because I know you often hear about how young a coach you are but I think the, the age belies all the experience um, that you have and I'm going to wrap around our, our last topic for the session is advice for young coaches that might, might be hesitant to kind of jump in and take action and action being everything from activism, which again, there's a panel on Thursday about, but also just taking a stand, standing up for their buddies, for their teammates, um, for other athletes and other sports, um, however that action looks. So what advice um, would you have for other young coaches that want to create this environment um, from the get-go? Um, for me personally, I felt that that was um, an area for improvement for myself because I'm a young coach. There's a lot of, of things going on in the world that I do not know about. So number one for me is always to get the knowledge, maybe reach out to someone. I'm fortunate to have so many great mentors, just awesome people in my life that pour into me and they give me so much knowledge. And that way I'm able to take more of an initiative. But first step for me is always to get the knowledge. And then as far as the team, just to keep in mind that, you know, they're people first, you know, everyone comes from a different background, but the cool thing is the one thing that connects all of us is tennis. So we can re all relate and we can come from wherever in the world, but one thing that we all relate to is tennis. So, and then just looking at the big picture, you know, like Rodney said, just kind of coming up with a team mission statement, different things like that, team culture activities and keeping in mind the big picture and maybe you know, putting a visual up to help your team always see like, this is what we're working towards. This is a big picture. This is what we're trying to do. So that would be the advice that I have. <laughs> That's great advice. It's motivating me to, to build a team somehow. Um, Ronnie, let's talk about uh, your advice as well. I mean, we talked about getting information, sharing information, highlighting differences and celebrating diversity. I mean, if you're a young coach starting out, in the industry or even a coach that wants to start being mindful kind of mid-career or later career, what advice would you have to, to create this environment? I think the first thing would be to find that that you're most comfortable doing because typically you'll gravitate that that you're most more comfortable doing. So find the things that you like. I mean, if you like food, for example, as most of us like, I mean, I love to eat. So one of the things that we did was we have an occasional meal with our team. And we have each person bring a food that they like or that's famous from where they live. And we have, and everyone can eat it. So just find something that you really like and you're comfortable with and start there. But just understand that under, what the long-term goal is. And the long-term goal is for everyone to become more, to learn more about each other and become more patient and more caring about the other. And so with that as a background, as long as you have that as a background, you can find the things that are most comfortable doing. We've done, um, we've taken our team out. Uh, we've helped out with Volleys Against Violence. It's a program we have here in town in, in, um, in downtown Atlanta where we help out at one of the parks. And the kids love going. They see other kids. They talk about tennis. Tennis is always a thing that we all will have in common. So that helps, helps out. We were also able to get involved with a program here at Georgia Tech in the city of Atlanta where we go and help out at a soup kitchen. And we get to serve food to people and help them out. And you get to see people and talk to them in an environment that the person's so, so thankful that you're there helping out. And one of the things that I always share with my team is 
you have to understand that many of these people that are here, that they're here not because of choice. They may have had one bad thing in their life that's happened. So understand that we're all one bad thing in our life from happening that could put you here. So just be thankful for where you are and also look to serve and be kind and helpful to others. So that's what I would say. Yeah, There's it's so many opportunities out there. No, there are, and you have to meet people halfway. Boy. Jay Webb, we have two more minutes. I was going to say, I'm going to give you a minute and Carol a minute to oh. talk about what you would, what advice you have. All right, I'll be quick. No, um, I was going to say that. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Carol, please. No, go ahead. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so just, uh, I think um, Darnisha hit on one of these is, you know, I think surrounding yourself with, with people who, you know, who are maybe mentors or who have done these things. Maybe if you're having a hard time starting conversations about race, ask people who have done it and, and you know, just seek advice, seek knowledge. Um, and I think another thing is, and I think all of the three other coaches have talked about this, is um, I think storytelling and building empathy for one another is super important and you know let your players tell their stories and it's amazing where you can go from there you know you can go so many places from there yeah it's getting okay with these conversations mm -hmm. uh jay webb let's uh let's end with you we'll give the mic to dave after that well, well listening to these three younger coaches uh, it really tells me that i think we're going in the right direction and I think that other coaches reach out to people like Darnisha or Carol or Rodney or pick up the phone and call. You know, I was blessed to spend time with Ed Kras during Ed Kras's collegiate exposure camps and work. And I was able to hang out with D1, D2, and D3 coaches and develop those friendships. And the men and women there in our coaching profession will help anyone if you pick up the phone and call. I remember calling Chuck Creasy, and, uh, who's been a good friend. So these men and these women are out there, uh, you know, use their uh, sense of knowledge and uh, especially on this topic, because I'm just, the way we're ending 2020 with this discussion, Dave, kudos to you and the ITA and the USTA for reaching out. And this is an important topic and we cannot let this go away. And I think that we must continue the discussions and, and uh, once again, kudos and Troy, Thank you so much for all you've done in the years I've worked with you. I know you're heading off to go over there in Switzerland and, and stuff, but uh, I, I have to acknowledge all you've done for the, this whole issue of race and discussion, LBGTQ. So uh, you're a great human being, and I really cherish our friendship. Thank you, Jay Webb. That's, that's very nice to say, but I really want to thank, thank everyone on this call and Dave and the ITA and the USTA. I mean, um, I'm going to steal one of your quotes, Darnisha. Uh, <laughs> you quoted it, Dave. Um, opportunity is usually disguised as, as hard work. Um, so it, you just have to put the, the work in. And I hope that the message people get from this is that um, any work, any step is a step forward. So for, thanks for, for letting me join you all on, the, on this. Um, and I hope this was, this was helpful to everyone. But I'm really just grateful to you all. Yeah, Dave, Troy, uh, thank you. I, I wish this was live because I think we'd have uh, 196 coaches giving you a standing ovation. That was outstanding. So many amazing takeaways. And, and yes, we're, we're, we're so excited to continue this conversation in the new year. Uh, Troy, I hope you'll visit us from time to time from, from uh, Switzerland and, and drop in and help where, where you can. I know you will. So coaches, uh, thank you. This, this, I, I knew this was going to be a, a good panel, but, but uh, you, you blew me away. So thanks for your service to College Tennis, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Over to you, Corey. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Darnisha, Carol, Troy, Rodney, and Jay Webb. That was awesome. Uh, and we are going to go ahead and move on to our next quick sponsor segment, uh, which will be Anthony Travel. Uh, Debbie Abdelgani is kind enough to join us today. And Anthony Travel serves as the ITA's official travel partner. And they work with a number of teams and departments nationally fulfilling their travel needs throughout the year. And I know 
uh, have been, despite the pandemic, finding ways to, to stay busy and, and help you guys. So we're fortunate to have Debbie here. And Debbie, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you, Corey. And uh, thank you to the IT and all the members for giving Anthony Travel this opportunity to uh, tell a little bit about us. But I am Debbie Abdelgani, and I'm Director of Collegiate Accounts with Anthony Travel. I've been handling college sports travel for the past 31 years. So I've worked with uh, many coaches uh, that you've mentioned, uh, past coaches that are um, key tennis coaches and, and I've loved every opportunity that I have. I'd like to uh, share my screen here and I've got a um, presentation that I'd like to uh, present to everyone that tells a little bit about Anthony Travel. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. But um, basically who we are, um, Anthony Travel is the largest provider of sports travel management services. We've been in the business uh, over 35 years, uh, over 30 years, and we partner with 85 of the uh, colleges across the country. Uh, many of the, your uh, schools may have one of the Anthony Travel onsite agents present. They're working with you. And what we provide is we're basically a one-stop shop for you. We provide everything for you. We do the, the air, we can do team uh, hotel, team buses when needed, uh, data conciliation. Um, we can do the uh, traveler you know, experiences if you run into problems, uh, travel policy compliances, receipts, anything you need and we're there as well to try to you know the most important thing save you money for your budget but there isn't anything we can't do from a to z for your team and, and your travel these are our daily collegiate partners that anthony travel works with across the country these are all our on-site universities we currently work with 59 different universities across the country and then we also have our offsite services. We've got 25 schools that we work with. I'm oversee our Ontario, California office. So we do work with a lot of uh, tennis uh, teams that just uh, call in and, and just need help you know, for their team, which they are more than welcome to do. And we're happy to help. These are some of our travel uh, sports partners that we do work with. And I personally have been working with the ITA for almost 30 years. So uh, I do value the partnership that we do have with the ITA and they always hold a special place uh, with me because of that. Uh, what we can do for you is we have the travel management. As I mentioned, we do the team travel. We can do ret recruiting travel, help you with hotels, bus and car rentals. I know tennis doesn't get into charters, but we also have uh, special sport events that we handle, international tours, fan travel, numerous things. We are, uh, because we're one of the top agencies, we have a lot of relationships with hotels and um, airlines and motor coaches. As you can see, we're a number one provider for both you know, the Hilton, Marriott, uh, uh, Hyatt Properties, uh, Group Air, number one with United American, Southwest and Delta, as far as group bookings go, and then uh, charters, and of course, motor coaches across the country. Uh, with COVID-19, um, it's so important to have good relationships with all your vendors. I can't tell you the millions of dollars with all the universities we work with of money that we save from refunding tickets uh, due to cancellations, due to COVID, canceling buses, hotels, air, millions and millions of dollars were saved um, because of our relationships with all the airlines and hotels and bus companies and charters. Uh, that was just invaluable to so many of our universities and I know they were very appreciative with that. One of the things that we can help the tennis with is uh, with the commercial air, our group travel benefits. Um, we do obtain you 
discounted group rates. And we do, which is very important for tennis, can handle groups under 10. We can do as few as six travelers that are traveling together on all the major carriers, whether it's American, Delta, United, Southwest, Alaska Airlines. We can book groups as few as, as six passengers with those carriers. We do get you the free name changes. Uh, we do not deposit with any of those carriers. So deposits are waived and we have preferred ticketing agreements uh, with these airlines where we sometimes we can get very uh, as few as three days prior to departure on certain carriers. And we also have um, early access to Southwest Airlines when they're opening up, they uh, alert us and uh, have an agent work special with us to get our um, groups booked. And one of the positive things that came out with COVID um, is the change fees. You know, many airlines have done away with their uh, airline change the fees. So that $200 that you'd have to pay on a lot of the other carriers really is, is non-existent right now. I know Southwest used to be a favorite for a lot because of the free bags and the, the name change or the change fee. But I know many of you don't have um, the luxury of being able to fly Southwest in your particular market. So uh, both American and Delta and United have uh, done it with their $200 change fees. And then we have our after hour service. Uh, you know, we're available 24 seven. I've helped numerous of teams nights and weekends. So we are available for you 24 seven. And thank you. Just wanted to say thank you for the time and, and to be able to tell you a little bit about Anthony Travel. And if you are interested at all to uh, please um, contact us and we'd be happy to assist you. Awesome, thank you so much, Debbie. And yeah, like you mentioned earlier, I think you said we've had a partnership for about 30 years. So we, we really, really appreciate y'all's support and, and everything you guys do for, uh, for not only college tennis, but also college athletics as a whole. Um, you guys have just been so entrenched in the industry for so long. So thank you. And I'll, I'll go ahead and paste, uh, copy and paste your email into the chat in case anyone does have questions. Perfect. Uh, so we can reach out to you about that. But thanks again. Excellent. And thank you and all the members for this time. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, before we get into our next speaker, we do have one another exciting uh, trivia uh, trivia giveaway from Wilson. And uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Carol too, who was who actually was multitasking uh, on the last on the last session, answering the question correctly while presenting. So that was very impressive. But uh, we have this item is a Wilson blade racket, and the question is, uh, you guys uh, need to be needed to have been paying attention earlier to know the answer. What is the name of the Wilson ball that has 100% recyclable packaging? And again, throw your answers into the Q&A box. And it looks like we have a winner, Blake Olmshed. Uh, the answer is a Trinity ball. And yeah, Blake, congrats on answering that correctly. So we'll, um, we'll connect you with Cy and Kristen at Wilson uh, to get you that free Wilson blade racket. And we'll do one more of those later today with the custom racket. Uh, before we close out the day. And I'm gonna go ahead and now pass it back to Dave to introduce our next speaker. Okay, thanks for that, Corey. Um, back, back to the tennis. So hi, Sue. Got uh, Suzanne Depka on the line and uh, Gerald, is Gerald joining us, Suzanne, as well? He is. Okay, okay. Um, I don't think we can both fit in. Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay, <laughs> okay you'll take turns. Um, well, this session's called Recruitment and Development at Mid-Majors. Obviously, it, it can apply to, to anybody, really. Um, you know, everybody at every level has different expectations from their administration, their alumni, different resources that they can use. Um, but ultimately, everybody has to have a philosophy. They need a coaching philosophy or recruiting philosophy, uh, development philosophy, maybe a fundraising philosophy, the, the list goes on. Um, but 
really what what I think Susan, Suzanne and, and Gerald are, are maybe two of the best kept secrets in college tennis. Um, they're extremely humble, very modest. Um, they're, they're, but their their knowledge around player development is, is off the charts. They think about these things deeply. I uh, can't imagine the conversations they're having every night uh, about um, different ways of, of making tennis players better. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. Uh, so I'm really uh, thrilled that they get a chance to, to share some of their thoughts on this topic with you all today. Um, what really stood out to me and made me think about this particular session was um, I, I coached for 12 years and uh, moved back, retired in 2016 and moved back to my home country of Ireland and was there for th three years managing a tennis club. But on, on the side, I used to just to keep my hand in college tennis, I would uh, try and help some Irish players with the, the college scholarship placement. And uh, I'd email coaches all the time. Sometimes I wouldn't hear back. Just as an aside, I would advise coaches to, if you get an email from somebody trying to um, uh, tell you about a player, definitely reply. That might not be the right player, but there might be a player in the future that uh, you're very interested in. So, so develop that relationship. But there was one player in particular I, I thought might be a good fit for Suzanne. And she came back with a very detailed e email, um, you know, uh, some, some thoughts around her philosophy, uh, very clear statements on, on the type of player that, that she was looking for. And, um, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe this player isn't, isn't the right fit. And, and I think a lot of coaches talk about, hey, I want, I want best character kid. I don't care about results. I don't care about UTR. I don't want to say they don't care, but, you know, we say that, um, but then we end up recruiting you know, the UTR ranking or, or the results rather than the character. I know I was guilty of that many times as a college coach. It's just the nature of, of our profession. But I feel like Suzanne and Gerald really stick to what their philosophies are. They're not going to deviate. They know what works and doesn't work. And um, I, I know you're going to come away from this session with, with a lot of takeaways. So just quick introduction of Suzanne and Gerald. Uh, Suzanne played her college tennis at the University of Illinois, went on to play professionally on the WTA tour. Um, she started her coaching career as an assistant at Northwestern, uh, stepped away from college coaching for seven years to work on developing high performance junior players before returning to the college game as an assistant at NC State and uh, then moved over to be the head women's coach at Davidson in 2014. Uh, Gerald, her husband, has been involved in the development side of tennis for many years and has served as director of operations at the University of Illinois in the Atkins Tennis Center, which I'm sure many of you have visited. Uh, he has directed the high performance junior programs at the Asheville Tennis Center and the John Chowboy Tennis Academy. He's currently running his own private consulting business and also volunteers at Davidson. Uh, for Suzanne. So uh, Suzanne, over to you. You're going to give us a, a presentation and then we'll open it up to some uh, Q&A with our coaches. So off you go. All right. Great. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the <laughs> kind words. Um, it's very nice of you. So thanks so much and, and great to see you today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We, we hope you're all doing well and you're staying safe and healthy as we continue to adapt to this virus. But we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, and we hope there are a few things that you are able to take away from this talk. We will be discussing recruiting and player development. In, in our culture, these concepts are closely tied together. For each, there are four main ideas that we believe fuel the development of our program. These have enabled us to better discover student athletes who will continue to grow and thrive at Davidson and to propel our culture forward. So I'll, I'll start with recruiting, the recruiting process and explain in more detail the concepts that I focus on when developing a, rela a relationship with recruits. Later with Gerald's help, we will discuss the four facets of player development that we concentrate on at Davidson to help our players improve. So like most coaches, we send an introductory email to a long list of players. These players are at a level that we feel would help improve our program. When they respond to this email, or I should really say if they actually take the time to respond to this email, then we set up an initial phone call. And in this conversation, I answer any questions they have, if they have any, and I'll explain to them in detail our program and our culture. Mm -hmm. 
So I first begin with my first concepts stating our philosophy. And our philosophy is that we are a process oriented program and our primary objective is continued character growth. This is achieved through individual character development and improvement of the player's tennis games. We believe that this will create the most growth for our culture and ultimately the most wins for our program. So the key takeaway here is that it's important to define your philosophy and then and the purpose of your culture so that you can successfully sell that to recruits. My next concept is to sell honestly. I, I tell recruits exactly what our program is about, what type of people we're interested in bringing into our culture. These are players that are open-minded to change, to making adjustments in their games and or their attitudes in order to improve. These are also people who wish to continue to grow beyond the tennis court. I also don't tell these recruits what I think they want to hear. I don't sugarcoat anything in our discussion and I'm, I'm not concerned with losing someone by being completely honest. I, I also ask them to tell me exactly what they want in their college experience and not just what they think that they need to say in order to have a chance or to impress me. By starting out this way in the process and asking them specific questions, then I can really get a better understanding of their character and how they would fit into our culture. Now, during this initial phone call, my goal is to obtain enough information to decide if I want to keep them on our list. Sometimes this is really difficult, especially if they give me one more answers to my questions, which is a lot of the time. But after this call, hopefully receiving enough information, I follow up and then I continue to remain in contact either by email, text, or additional phone conversations. Now the next step would be going to a tournament to watch them compete live. At the conclusion of their matches and the tournament, then I, I do provide them feedback in person regarding their game. I tell them what I believe they could do to improve and what we would do if they were to come to Davidson. So here's an example that I, here's an example of this with the current player that I have. In the recruiting process, I watched her play many matches over several tournaments. In order to give her a sense of what it's like at Davidson, we spoke after her matches and at the conclusion of the tournaments. I gave her specific suggestions about things that she could work on to improve her game. These included a technical change on her forehand to generate more racket head speed, as well as an earlier and more athletic split step. And both of these would help allow her to play closer to the baseline. Once she arrived home, she, she worked on what we talked about and she sent me video on her own. We had follow-up discussions and she integrated our, our information with her coach at home. And this was a perfect example of the type of player that we want to be a part of our culture. A great relationship developed with her and was strengthened as she continued to send me more information and video. This level of communication gives a clearer picture as to the type of person that they are and whether they would truly fit into our culture. This also gives me an opportunity to develop a relationship with them and their team at home. It allows them to better understand my coaching style and what it would be like if they were a part of our culture. And again, I'm providing complete and utter honesty so that there are no shocks or surprises once they commit and they arrive at Davidson. This process of learning more about the recruits 
their tennis games, as well as getting to know them as a person in their character. It does take a lot of time and effort, but at the end of it all, it gives me great confidence knowing that both parties have made the right decision. This piece is extremely important because once a player commits and arrives on campus, we sit down with them in a meeting and we'll go over their initial college plan for growth. And in this meeting, the last thing that I want them to say is, I didn't know we were going to discuss this. I didn't realize this was what was going to be asked of me, or I didn't think I would have to make these changes. And this would literally be my worst nightmare. So since we are talking about all this throughout the in entire recruiting process, they've already experienced what the program is like. They're familiar with our culture and they have heard multiple times our feedback regarding their development and their improvement. We find that this helps with recruits that are at the top of our list. Since we're often competing with multiple schools, for them, this can set us apart. This takeaway is once your philosophy is defined, you must sell honestly or risk compromising your culture. This will only create short-term gain, gain at the expense of long-term growth. Sell honestly by clearly explaining the culture and giving them the type of feedback that they would receive if they were already a part of your program. This can help set you apart from schools you are competing with for interest. My third idea is that I never compromise the culture. I take the risk of being brutally honest in the beginning stages of the recruiting process. A lesson I learned early on from Claire Pollard at Northwestern. So, thanks, Claire. This allows me to determine if I wanna continue with recruit or just let them know that we are not the right program for them. In, in the end, this actually saves both of us time. If they don't like what they hear, then they can move on and they can feel good about taking us off of their list right away. And if we feel that they won't thrive in our culture, then I can let them know very early on that Davidson won't be a good fit for them. I give every player the same information regardless of their level. If a player is highly ranked but will not fit the culture, then I don't continue on with them. I watched a What Drives Winning talk a while back given by Jack Clark, who's the rugby coach at Cal Berkeley. And he gave a quote by Bo Schembechler, who was a football coach at Michigan. And Bo was talking about his culture and how he recruits. And he said, if you want a player really bad and you don't get them, they will only beat you once a year. On the other hand, if you get the wrong player on your team, they will beat you every day. I really took this to heart because it's why I believe not making any compromises for the culture is of paramount importance for long-term success. We are very lucky at Davidson as we have an athletic director and athletic department that are very vested in long-term growth and student athlete development. So the takeaway here is to just make sure that you have the right people coming into your program. You know, in the end, you want players that you would truly do anything for, players who are willing to do everything they can for themselves, for their team, and for the culture. Lastly, I involve the team. I communicate with our team throughout the entire process. The team will be spending the most amount of time with recruits when they come on campus. They will eventually be the recruits teammates and our team is very familiar with our culture. Because we protect, protect the culture, our players are honest. And if you allow them, then they will tell you exactly what they think about the recruit and whether they feel this person will be a good fit for our team. Their opinions and honesty can be really helpful when having to make decisions and sometimes especially very difficult ones. In the end, obviously the coaches make the decision on a recruit, 
but by including the team, they take the job of recruiting seriously and they truly want what's best for the program, even if they may no longer be a part of it the next year. Our team is extremely appreciative that we value their involvement. They feel part of the process and become more invested in the culture. This leads them to work harder and make better decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, if you value your team's involvement, their buy-in will increase and they will make better choices on a day-to-day -day basis. I just heard this quote from Brett Ledbetter on Sunday night. People don't sink the boat they're in. Once someone is invested, they will be intrinsically motivated to do the right things. So this key takeaway is to involve the team. In the end, this leads to them investing heavily in the culture. And this makes my job really enjoyable. Having respectful players who you know are happy and comfortable with your program and players who will keep working hard and will continue to grow. I mentioned selling honestly earlier, and this is important when also talking about player development. I don't leave anything out when letting them know what we are looking for. I also describe with a fair amount of detail and give examples of how we will develop their tennis games. This is how we feel player development and recruiting go hand in hand. I'll now mention a little bit regarding player development. We have broken it into four distinct skill sets. When speaking with, with recruits, we use these to provide a framework for our feedback. I'll introduce these areas and then I'll let Gerald describe them in more detail. The first one I discuss is mental emotional. We talk a lot with our players about mindset and believe it's of utmost importance. We've developed a system to help our players become more resilient, confident, relaxed, and more present. The second is physical. We've developed a system of movement and postures that help our players move more efficiently and explosively. The third is strategy tactical. We have developed systems for most tactical decisions and we meet with our players consistently to determine the best way for each of them to utilize their current strengths to facilitate the systems. The last area is technical. I talk with recruits about this particular area quite a bit because we do make adjustments in many of our player swings. In some cases, players may not be able to reach their true potential tactically due to a technical flaw that's holding them back. I, I want recruits to know that we may put in a lot of hours early in their career in this area, and I don't want them to be shocked when they begin training, but I also wanna know if they are willing to do this and make these adjustments. So now I'm gonna let Gerald take the lead. Stepping in, all right. I'm gonna go over here. So, sorry, I'm gonna just try to get my technical difficulties worked out, everyone. Okay. So, um, uh, nope, that's sorry. the top of my head. Yes, sorry, everybody. Okay, uh, first I'd like to thank Suzanne uh, for allowing me to be a part of the program. I'd like to thank Dave for the amazing introduction and for all of you for um, hanging out and listening. I'll talk more about some of the concepts that are fundamental to the systems that Suzanne was talking about and the systems that we use for each of these skill sets. Um, I realized early on when I was writing this speech that if I um, went into great detail on any one of the systems, I might need an entire seminar just for myself. So I'm gonna give you some of the key concepts from them. Uh, but if anybody has more questions or would like to continue the dialogue, we are um, happy to do that and share any of this information with anyone who wants it. Um, so though the goal of our culture is really to compete at the highest levels, right now we have to accept our current circumstance and make our players better to continue to move in that direction. At our current level, our recruits generally need help in at least one of these skill sets that Suzanne mentioned. Sometimes they have issues in all of them um, or more than one. We, we know this is a fact because if they didn't, they wouldn't be going to our program. They'd probably be going to a larger program uh, and getting a full scholarship. Um, as Suzanne said, we have systems that govern much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Systems allow for a framework for evaluation and purposeful practice. In addition, they create an environment for peer coaching. When your players also become teachers, it can increase buy-in tremendously. And as Suzanne stated earlier, buy-in is a uh, really powerful force for propelling your culture forward. So anyway, I will start with mental emotional um, and I'm gonna try to start a little slideshow here. So bear with me because I am not really good at Zoom, but there is mental emotional. Let's hope that's it. Let me do, we need a, well, we need to play it. Is that gonna work? Yes. Ha. All right, I hope everybody can see that. All right, so um, what we have um, for mental emotional, basically, we believe that controlling attention is the key to success. Um, if attention can be focused on what we're feeling, performance flows. If our attention is focused on thoughts, if we are thinking rather than feeling in the present moment, uh, then that will hinder performance and tension will be part of what you're doing. Um, so we um, know, we all know that overthinking is bad basically. So the opposite of thinking is feeling. One of the concepts we use in our systems is the idea of a present moment focus or PMF. Sometimes a player can focus their attention on feeling in the present while playing. Depending on the player, sound can also be used effectively. So concentrating on something you're feeling or something you're hearing in the present moment as, a pa as opposed to getting involved with your thought. Oh, I disappeared. I see what's happening, that's bad, okay. Uh, so anyway, getting involved with your thoughts obviously is bad. We know that overthinking is a bad thing. Um, uh, sorry guys, lost my train of thought. Um, most anything you can feel repeatedly, sorry, most anything you can feel repeatedly while playing can be used as a PMF. We find that one of the best is the breath. So I'm going to actually stop the share for a second, everyone, if I can figure out how to do that now. Where's the cursor? Let me just escape and see if that works. Yeah. Okay. So am I back? Yeah. Okay. So if, if you're game, I would like everybody to join me in a quick experiment on breath. So you can sit up straight or stand up. It should only take about a minute or so. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by paying attention to your breath. Just pay attention to your inhales and your exhales. What I'd like you to do is notice if your chest, your upper body, I might back this up so you guys can see, if your chest is moving out or up and down when you're taking your inhale. And also then notice if your belly is moving in and out when you take your exhale. I'd like you to notice the natural pauses between your inhales and exhales. And we're just gonna do that for a couple of breaths. At the end of an exhale, I would like you to make an audible ah sound, like the letters A-H together. So here's an example. Ah. Uh, no voice crack, I nailed it. So as you make the sound, you should feel your stomach and belly moving inwards and upwards towards your spine as you extend the exhale. What I want you to do is keep pushing this sound until absolutely no air can come out any longer. You'll feel your abs tightening. And at the very end, you may feel your pelvic floor, like you're maybe stopping going to the bathroom. Okay, once you're empty, we want to allow the next inhale to drop down reflexively and fill your belly. Imagine a balloon inflating outwards. Sense the air rising and stop your inhale as it gets to the bottom of your sternum or lower chest. If you feel your chest move up or your shoulders rise, you've inhaled too much and you've done it wrong. So here's an example, everybody, if I back up a sec, I hope you can still see me. Sort of, yes, okay. So we're gonna breathe in and out naturally, paying attention to the inhale and exhale and the pause between. We will then exhale out of breath and at the end, make the ah sound until you are empty. And then when you can't push any more air out, try to let the air fall down into your belly 
or lower abdomen. So diaphragmatic breathing. When you bring your next inhale in, be very careful to stop the inhale before it rises too high. Feel the natural pause and let your exhale naturally fall back out at the end of it. You'll use the ah sound again to empty your lungs. So I want everybody to just try that a couple of times. Link in a few, a few breaths in this way. Trying to keep the breath low, never rising above your sternum. Continue to notice the natural pauses, but don't force them. Just keep linking your inhales and exhales. And now we're gonna make a subtle adjustment. So after your next inhale, you're gonna start the ah sound immediately and use it to exhale out the entire breath. So you're gonna use the ah sound for the entire exhale. If you've breathed a little too high, this can be very challenging, but this should lengthen your exhale considerably. It is crucial that you do not let your inhale rise too high for you able to be this. So last few breaths, let's try to link a few of these long exhales together. Slowing your breath, feeling the pauses between, exhaling using the ah sound until your lungs are empty. You should feel your abdomen, diaphragm and pelvic floor tightening up, your abdominal muscles. And feel any tension now in your body and try to let it go. We're gonna link our final couple of breaths. Continuing to slow it. Feel your pause and then start again. Okay, so we find that if our athletes work on these types of breath work, uh, and this one in particular, if you do it for roughly four minutes, you should enter a state of uh, very relaxed state. And uh, I would highly recommend you guys trying this one out if you have trouble sleeping or if you have um, any anxiety, um, it's a very, very good one. Okay, so um, I think I'm still sharing this, am I? I am, it's red. Oh, wait, now I finally did it. Sorry, you guys, I'm so bad at tech and I shouldn't be. So let me pull you guys back up. I wanted to share that again because it was still working. Okay, so now <laughs> by the end of the presentation, you guys are gonna have this loaded. Okay, so um, that is still sharing, is it not? Okay, great. Okay, so congratulations. If you're able to follow along with that, you just felt what it was like to keep your location of breath or lob, if you will, low. When we breathe this way, our primary breathing muscles, our diaphragm, our intercostals, pelvic floor and abdominals are being used. This is useful for tennis players as it allows the muscles of the upper body to remain relaxed. When we breathe high, we use the secondary or ancillary breathing muscles of the neck, shoulders and upper back. When these are constantly tight through breath, it, seriously, it can seriously impede performance. How many of us have players who are great on the practice court but tighten up on match day? Their stressed out rapid high breaths are one of the primary causes. A very useful process in between points then becomes slowing and lowering the breath to relax the body. The breath is also a great PMF during play. Coordinating a forceful yet a rela relaxing exhale with your shot and keeping your inhale as low as possible through your nose. This allows for maximum relaxation and looseness while playing. When players focus on these feelings instead of the thoughts, judgments and worries and expectations they have, then play can become instinctual. Is this, no, it's still not, so that's my problem. Guys, I'm sorry. There you go, it is not playing. Okay, so lob low is the key to relaxation.
Uh, all right. So anyway, so I lost it again, you guys. Here we go. So final thoughts on not thinking. Um, you see where I want that final thoughts on not thinking? That was supposed to be a joke. Feel free to give me a courtesy laugh there. Uh, awareness versus trying too hard. So often players will begin trying too hard with their PMF. Thinking about it, not feeling it, judging during points, trying to consciously controlling, telling themselves what to do. This is very different than feeling it in the moment without judgment. Th that is called awareness. It is important for players and coaches to recognize when this is happening. It usually is an indication that players' inner dialogue has run amok. Gosh, did it again, guys. What's happening? All right, there we go. It is vitally important for players to pay attention to their inner dialogues between points and control their responses. As far more time is spent between points than during play, this, this time can become nonstop judgment, negativity, and rumination. It is counterproductive to try and keep bad thoughts out as this can lead to more judgment and more thinking. Instead, we teach our players to accept the thoughts, normalize them, and then commit to a useful action or process in the moment. Remember your PMF, and more importantly, remember how it feels. Commit to feeling it on every ball in the next point. This then becomes the controllable. Commit to a useful action in the present moment. Okay, now I get to actually try to stop this on purpose. I'm number one. All right, cool. So here I'd like to do, if I can, and we'll hope this works out as well, is share a really quick clip of an interview with Matteo Berrettini. This was after, right after he had won a quarterfinal match at the US Open. Um, and in that match, he actually double faulted on his first match point. So if I can make this happen very quickly for you guys. Yes. All right. There we go. And push play. Um, you know, after the match they in, at Eurosport uh, on live, they asked me, do you think you can practice the kind, this kind of feelings, you know? In, in, and I said, no. I mean, you. I was saying to myself during the match, uh, what what you expect for... I mean, you're 23, you just playing your first quarterfinals and you expect that you're not get tight. So I was saying to myself, okay, that's normal. Keep going, you know, you're going to have more chances like I had. But in that moment, if you start to think about... Uh, I don't know, other stuff that are not important. You start to complaining, you start to, I don't know, like thinking negative, then for sure you're gonna lose that match. And uh, that's, that's the thing that I'm most proud of, you know? I mean, this stadium is unbelievable. Uh, the feelings that I had, I mean, <laughs> I was checking my heart beating, you know, during the match. I, <laughs> I, mean, I was like, oh, what's happening? And then I said, okay, no, it's normal. I mean, this this is a football stadium. It's not a, like a tennis stadium. So you kind of smiled after the double fault on match morning. Uh, yeah, I laughed because um, <laughs> I was serving the seventh serve, and my grip changed a little bit. I don't know what happened. For sure, the tension. I know, but for sure, I was tired. So I laughed because I was saying, "Okay, that's normal." <laughs> Uh, for sure, I was dying inside, <laughs> but I also missed an uh, easy volley. Of 15. Uh, so, but then I said again, no. Um... So um, I think that's a really cool video clip personally, because um, he refers to it as a soccer stadium because uh, the, the US Open stadium is so large. It's, it's like the soccer arena he used to be in as a child. So, um, but I really think that uh, is a much more healthy and useful way to uh, deal with those emotions, emotions in that moment. I mean, of course, he was going to be tight and nervous, and to think otherwise would be detrimental to his performance. So that's one of the keys that we, we talk to our girls about a lot is making sure that they can be aware of the moment, the emotions, and normalize them, and then commit to a useful action or a process to, to keep them moving forward. So... Uh, all right, so moving on, sorry. Our physical skill set defines how a player moves on the court. One of our primary concerns is our player's posture and balance on the court. We focus on two simple concepts to define this. We call them stack and tuck. So let's see if we can find that and make it play. Okay. Oh, I'm not on chair. Great. <laughs> 
Got this, you guys. I got this. Physical. Oops. No, nope, I'm not good. I am not good with. There it is. Na, na, na. Yeah, and push play, got it. Okay. Oh man, I think that was bad. Okay, I think we're gonna just go with that. If you guys can see that green thing in the middle of the screen, I'm so sorry, but I cannot make it go away at this point. Okay. The stack is just keeping the upper body upright or vertical, not bending at the waist. Keeping the spine stacked, basically. This will force a player to bend their knees, uh, which is obviously something that we all want. The tuck is simply the idea of keeping the hips tucked underneath the stack. This for, allows for storage of potential energy in the large muscles of the rear and legs. Oh man, see, I can't make this happen, right? Oh man, now we're stuck. I can't go stuck, sure. Let's get the okay. I'm gonna keep talking while Suzanne tries to worry out, work out our technical difficulties, you guys. I'm so sorry for this. Um, the opposite of tuck is a large anterior pelvic tilt, sticking your butt out, basically. This allows storage of potential energy. Uh, sorry, this, the posture basically, uh, with anterior pelvic tilt looks like you are uh, maybe setting up to do a squat. So your butt is pushed out, there's a uh, angle in your lower back and you are stabilizing those muscles to do the exercise. So we find that this is very different than the postures that most of the best tennis players are assuming when they land their split step, for example, and when they're moving throughout their movement uh, cycle and uh, hitting their shots. So um, I think uh, we can all picture uh, Djokovic, uh, maybe getting ready to hit a return of serve. Uh, he's very upright. Oh, I see a composite share. That's very cool. All right, I'm gonna really try and get this to work one more time, you guys. And I am so sorry. Dave is never gonna invite me back for another one of these. However, if I were uh, uh, not doing this via Zoom, I think it would be going a little better. Okay. So, I got some pictures that I was trying to get loaded up for you all. But that's not working. So Susanna is going to try to fix that for us again, demonstrating the stack and tuck. Let's just do this, you guys. Hold on. I got it, Susanna. Boom. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to hit play anymore. All right. So hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, and we're just going to go like that. Okay. Boom. Stack and tuck. All right, here we go. So we can see in these pictures, uh, we have Sakari on there, uh, Andreescu, Serena, uh, a couple of my junior players, a couple of Davidson players that were basically looking the upright posture in the spine. We're trying to keep the hips underneath it and not round out the lower back, sticking the rear end out. So um, that is critical for one of the things that we're talking about. Um, another huge factor for us in our athletes in movement is the split step. And more specifically, it's timing. I think most coaches would agree in the importance of a split step. However, we have found many athletes split step too late to be effective. And in fact, it could be de delaying their reaction time. There has been debate raging for as long as I can remember about how and when to make the perfect split step. And if you dare to Google it, the rabbit hole is pretty deep. We find that having the player's feet just landing or about to touch back down when their opponent makes contact is the best starting place. This allows for an athletic absorption of the landing to store potential energy. In addition, this timing allows the player to begin reacting as soon as they are able to read their opponent's shot. This is typically anywhere from three to uh, six feet off of the player's racket. Uh, this timing can be easily checked by filming from behind with the opponent in the background. Stop the video when the opponent makes contact and check your player's position. Many times, players will not land until their opponent's ball is crossing the net or later. This is obviously bad, but can be extremely disruptive on the return of serve when reaction times are super low already, or um, small already. A great process for helping this is to use the old standby bounce hit, uh, popularized by Timothy Galloway in his book, uh, The Inner Game of Tennis. If a player uh, pays close attention to watching for the bat, the exact bounce and contact on their opponent's side or by listening for those sounds, the player's split steps will automatically time better, we find. 
This can also serve as a PMF or present moment focus if the athlete is thinking too much. Use video to check this often as it will negatively affect every aspect of the player's performance after the serve. And there we go. All right, lastly, I'd like to circle back to respiration and breath with regards to the physical skill set and endurance. Inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. This is very common advice for exercise and has been recommended as long as I can remember. With the new old science on breathwork becoming more popular, it is taking on a whole new importance for our players. I will not get too sciency, but simply inhaling through the nose allows the athletes to balance carbon dioxide and oxygen in their systems. This is important because the body needs CO2 to deliver the oxygen to the muscles and the brain, which is a big muscle. This is a commonly misunderstood part of respiration. And when an athlete is struggling to catch their breath, it is in fact due to a lack of CO2, not O2. If we lose too much carbon dioxide due to mouth breathing, the oxygen we are bringing in with each inhale is just passed back out. This is not doing any good, but the respiration is costing energy. This means that the player is using up additional energy, breathing, but gaining no cardiovascular or recovery benefit. Not good. When players force themselves to inhale only through the nose, they lose their wind more quickly, but their legs will not lose energy. Once trained, the athlete will be able to push through longer and harder efforts without losing their wind or legs. So here's a little experiment. I'm gonna to try to stop the share and see what happens again. Yeah, okay. Here's a little experiment you can run for yourself. And there's pun intended there. And here's my disclaimer. Please check with your physician before starting any exercise program. Next time you're on court, run a suicide, breathing in and out through the mouth. Once you're done, notice how your legs feel. Rest for only three to five seconds and then begin a second suicide, breathing only through your nose and exhaling out your mouth. The first line will be really hard to breathe, but I know you can do it. Notice how your legs feel as you finish your last line though. We find that our athletes actually feel fresher than when they started it. If a player can maintain their inhales through the nose, they will begin to play tennis aerobically. That is using oxygen for energy, not anaerobically. When a player starts to breathe poorly, they shift to anaerobic energy produced through the use of muscle glycogen. This, this eventually, uh, will lead the athlete to be spent and um, not really have energy to continue playing. This is vitally important when athletes have to play several matches in a short period of time, uh, like a junior tennis player playing in a weekend. Um, our tactical systems, moving on, ha lean heavily on the concept of investing. Uh, this concept was introduced to us by Xander Centenari at Dar Dartmouth. Uh, here's a question for you guys. Is there such a thing as a good unforced error? We believe the answer is yes. And uh, it is in fact a cornerstone of our tactical system for singles. By way of explanation, let me, uh, let's take a look at risk, reward, time, and geometry. And I'm gonna see if I can pull up another share. So that does not seem like it's working. And I'm gonna get it in a second because I gotta get one of these to work. Share it. And I hope that's working. Okay, so <clears throat> whether we think about it or not, most decisions we make while we're playing tennis or in life are based on a relative comparison of the risk and reward of the choices. In tennis, this is fairly straightforward, but became uh, difficult to do when there's emotion involved. So here are some simple definitions uh, that we use for risk and reward applicable to a tennis shot. A risk is the percentage of time a player is able to execute their intended shot under pressure. The reward is the percentage of time a player's intended shot will affect their opponent and create an opportunity. Or simply stated, how often will my shot go in and how often will it hurt my opponent? So here's a nice little graphic I drew up in the garage for you to see. We have the boring player and the exciting player, the winner and the loser. But if you can play low risk, high reward shots, that is obviously gonna be favorable for uh, your outcomes. So uh, the best case, obviously, are those low risk, uh, high reward shots. 
Unfortunately, though, many players attempt high risk, high reward shots and against quality opponents, this is not sustainable, though it can be exciting sometimes. Uh, players must understand the importance of taking time from their opponent and giving themselves time when necessary to be successful. Time is controlled with a combination of core position and shot shape. When trying to neutralize, a player should play higher or slower shot shapes to allow time for proper recovery. To hurt an opponent, a player should take ground or move up in the court and play flatter trajectories with higher velocities, all of which reduce their opponent's reaction time. Geometry is called by targets, controlled by targets and recovery points. Every target creates a point in the court where you recover for your next shot. This point should bisect the angle of your opponent's two best shots. When playing from neutral and defensive parts of the court, the opponent has more time to defend. In this case, targets are chosen to minimize risk and to keep your opponent from getting an opportunity. From the offensive parts of the court with control of time, our chance of reward increases greatly. This is the smartest time for a player to take risks and try and hurt their opponent. We believe that if our players go for it and miss from the offensive zone, they really accelerate and commit to it, that's a good unforced error. If players are rewarded for taking these risks regardless of outcome, they are free to keep investing in their improvement and investing in that shot. However, players must not make unforced errors in their neutral and defensive zones to be able to afford to make these adjustments in their offensive zone. This is a critical piece to our system and we do uh, not want uh, poor decisions in the neutral zone. We in fact call it our discipline zone. Um, so again, stated simply, we should only accept risk when the chance of reward is high. And in fact, if you think about it, that is the uh, definition of high performance tennis. All right, Dave, you're about to kick me off, aren't you, buddy? Yeah, I know we didn't get to, to technical. Do you want to give one minute on your, your technical philosophy? Yes, if I can just... No, right. no more sharing your screen. I know, I know, Dave. Yeah, yeah. So, um, stop share screen. There, there it is. So basically, um, we, um, from a technical standpoint, I mean, I'm not going to uh, profess that we know more than anyone else out there. We basically um, continue to work uh, in the uh, normal sort of um, standards that um, people have, ranges of acceptability for technique, if you will. Um, but we do use progressions, uh, simple progressions to try to change that. So um, I am going to just do this really quick and show you guys a quick video. So this is one of us, our current athletes. I hope this works. And this is a side-by-side -side video of before and after. This is one of the, the things that Suzanne was discussing earlier, the backswing technique, which is breaking down. So I'll just run it and you guys can see, I hope, that on the left side. I don't think we can see it, Gerald. You can't? No, maybe minimize that box and see if the, the uh, play box had come up. Okay. No. Can I try one more time, Dave? This is I'm so bad. Stop share. Oh, yeah. Okay, I think I can do it. I can do it. Dave, give me a sec, buddy. Okay, one minute. There we Are go. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? Yep, yep, we Yay. see it. Yay. God, sorry, you guys. It's so bad. So anyway, we see this out. We see the athlete uh, on the left is the new swing. On the right is the old swing. And this is what we call vertical drop. She's making a much more compact backswing. Uh, and the one on the left, the racket face actually rotates and faces the sky. So clearly this is going to be... Um, a problem long term. So uh, anyway, I'm sorry, Dave, I'll take it uh, and end it right there. And, no, uh, thank you, Gerald. And thanks yeah, we, we didn't get time to questions. Unfortunately, maybe Elizabeth, you could follow up with with Suzanne and, and Gerald, you've got some, some interesting questions there. And, and I think uh, also the, the coach would like to know if these um, slides would be shared out. So so maybe if the coaches emailed you, Oh my God! Um, sorry. Yeah. You'd be able yeah. to share and, and share some more. And I know it's a, a difficult presentation, um, you know, to do this via Zoom, obviously on the court, much easier to demonstrate these things and, and uh, have have that discussion. But thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we're gonna keep keep moving on. Corey's kicking us off. So Suzanne <laughs> and Gerald, great to see you guys, and and uh, see you in the new year. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Bye. All right.
All right, thanks, Dave. So up next, we are excited to introduce a uh, former Kentucky All-American that some of you may know. Uh, Brad Cox is working with new tech startup TopCourt, uh, which is an incredibly engaging new video learning platform that can help both players and coaches. Uh, so TopCourt is actually a, a day three sponsor of convention. So thank you guys so much for that. Um, Brad is here to talk, uh, talk to you guys about their new platform. Right after that, we will uh, roll into the final giveaway of the day, which is a Wilson custom racket. So stay tuned uh, for that. And uh, Brad, I'm going to kick it over to you. Cool. Thanks, Corey. Um, obviously, very happy to be here. Appreciate you guys having us part of the coaches convention. Obviously, give me a Give me a knock if um, if I'm creeping up on the time that's allotted. Um, but first and foremost, uh, I'd like to pass on my best to each and every program that has been affected by the unfortunate circumstances that we face this year. Uh, obviously, the trickle down effect has been pretty ruthless. And coming from someone who has played collegiate tennis, um, it's obviously unimaginable to think what it would have been like to have our season canceled or our program nixed uh, due to an event that was out of our control. Um, so I have to commend the ITA um, and, and you, the, the coaches, for doing everything you can to keep your team safe, uh, healthy, and engaged throughout the year. Uh, obviously, playing collegiate tennis, it, I know it, um, it takes a lot of determination, responsibility, and hard work to be a student athlete. But one thing you don't quite realize is you need that, plus a lot of resilience and uh, <laughs> And certainly a lot of patience to to be the coach and 2020 has um has made that apparent more than ever um now on a lighter side of things um it is my pleasure to introduce you to top court um, as many of you know tennis has historically been behind the ball when it comes to technology um, but we're seeing a major shift in innovation and if we couple that with this global and accelerated transformation to online uh, and massive consumer shift to streaming, Top Court is born. Uh, at Top Court, we're changing the game when it comes to modernizing the way we consume and learn in our sport. Over the next few minutes, I'm gonna share what are the latest trends that we're seeing in history, um, what is Top Court and what sets us apart, uh, how we envision Top Court being a valuable partner to college tennis, also partner feedback and success, and lastly, how easy it is to get Top Court implemented into your program. Today's sports education landscape is going through a revolution unlike any we've ever seen before. Uh, just to give you a quick glimpse of where this industry has been and where it is going, uh, not too long ago in 2015, the global e-learning market was worth an impressive 107 billion, and that figure is projected to hit near 400 billion by 2026. 90% um, of organizations now use some form of e-learning compared to just 4% in 1995. And I'm sure many of you are sitting there thinking that I even have dial-up in 1995. Um, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but obviously the point here is more and more organizations are seeing the value and adopting or implementing these methods. Um, of those organizations leading the charge is going to be the sports industry. Sports organizations will be sorry, are and will continue to be one of the biggest drivers of the e-learning industry during this decade. Uh, also, recent data is showing that 45% of athletes said that their favorite learning methods are digital learning games and watching online videos. And obviously that percentage is only growing amongst millennials and Gen Zers. Furthermore, 94% said that they'd be more willing to stay at organizations that prioritize and invest in the digital development. So I think the major takeaway here is those who are willing to get innovative and creative with digital learning will ultimately have the best chance for future success. So the million dollar question is what is Top Court? Uh, Top Court is an e-learning platform that offers tennis enthusiasts like ourselves endless inspiration and instruction from sports most iconic players. Essentially, these top pros and coaches are giving fans and players of all levels an authentic look into their life, their mind, and what makes them the game's best. And this content is provided and backed by world number ones, Grand Slam champions, and Olympic gold medalists. We now have over 40 top men's and women's players and coaches on the top court platform, and this is being added to monthly. 
Um, another piece I want to really stress, uh, stress to you guys is, and it's super pivotal to what Top Court is doing, and really what sets us apart is how we deliver this Hollywood quality content. Um, it is done so in, what, in these bite-sized segments, which is also called micro learning. And this is a version of learning that is backed by the latest in cognitive science research. And it's really perfect for the new generation of learners, many of whom you're currently coaching or recruiting. Our top court team has also created an algorithm that provides our users with more personalized training and content, which will only help drive more efficiency and efficacy for the user. Essentially, this means that when you enter the top court platform, you'll be directed to content that is relevant and tailored to you. So for example, whether it be Verdasco's forehand, double strategy from the Brian brothers, stories and drills from Chrissy Evert, or if you wanna get super crazy with it, um, you know, between the leg shots from Nick Kyrgios. Uh, the point being is this content is diverse, it is dynamic, and it is welcoming, whether it's for your collegiate players, the aspiring junior, or the old hack who thinks that he still has it, i.e. myself. And whether it be on those lengthy road trips, which we all are very accustomed to in the tennis world, in particular in collegiate tennis, or during the many joyous rain delays we've been a part of, or if it's on court at one of your summer camp programs, top court can be consumed anywhere, anytime, and on any device. And why is this relevant to you? I guess I would ask the question, why wouldn't you wanna keep your players, your coaches, or your juniors inspired and engaged? Look, you wouldn't be here if you weren't competitive and neither would we. We see Top Court as being a valuable partner and resource to your program. And by incorporating Top Court into your respective programs, summer camps, and tennis communities, you will also have the indirect benefits of driving more revenue. And this can be seen through an increase in camp attendance, lessons books, and support and engagement from your fans. Furthermore, we want to share in the success of Top Court. Therefore, we've created a partnership opportunity that allows for you and the program to earn revenue as the platform grows. So let us help you leverage your channels, whether it is, again, summer camps, tennis tournaments, your alumni, and the influence that you have on your tennis communities let Top Court bring revenue back to your program. And ultimately, these will lead to deeper, more loyal connections between your college tennis program and the respective tennis communities that you serve. Lastly, as we all know, collegiate tennis has become a global sport and we feel our global reach can be an asset to your program. We envision being a resource to you and your team, whether it is on the recruiting side, uh, team exposure, or obviously a valuable tool that you can provide to your players when they arrive on campus. Now, can we prove it? So far, I'd say yes. Um, since our launch this year, still relatively new, 42% of our partners have already seen an increase in revenue after implementing Top Court, which I'm positive this number will continue to grow. Also, a few of your peers have already seen the benefits of Top, top Court. As Tracy from Harvard summed it up, as athletes and coaches, we are constantly looking to improve and find an edge. Top Court is truly a unique and innovative way to learn from the best, end quote. And if you're wondering how to join the Top Court movement, getting started is super easy. Our customer success team can have accounts created for you and your teams in less than 30 minutes. And this will allow each one of you access to the exclusive Top Court content on your own time. Furthermore, our customer success team will provide you with the personal attention and white glove support that is expected. So allow our team to onboard and optimize your program and they will help scale up and personalize this new digital resource so you can track the growth that matters. I'm pretty sure we're coming to the end of the time here, but just to wrap things up, Top Court is already proving itself to be the digital tennis platform. It's used by thousands and viewed by millions across the globe. And we're thankful to have the support and backing from the world's best players and coaches. And some other cool news to share, due to the success that we're seeing, Top Court is growing. Uh, so I, I welcome you and I, and, I, and I hope you do share this with your current and future alumni that there are opportunities to come on board with Top Court. Um, just to wrap up, we feel Top Court is positioned to help carry the torch forward in our sport. 
And with our strong connections to collegiate tennis, we'd like to be a partner and resource to you and your programs so you can focus on what is most important, developing your players, being leaders in the community, and obviously winning national championships. I'll leave it there by saying welcome to Top Court. Thank you for your time and please feel free to reach out to me uh, by email or phone if you'd like to discuss further. Awesome, thanks Brad and, and thank you guys again for your day three sponsorship uh, coaches. You guys will be able to learn a little bit more about Top Court on Thursday and you also should have gotten an email with Brad's contact info. So take a look at that and and yeah, Brad, thanks again. We're excited to, to have Appreciate you on College it, Tennis. Absolutely. All right, thanks so before we get to our last, uh, but definitely not least speaker of the day, we do have one more prize giveaway, uh, courtesy of Wilson. And uh, before we do that, uh, one quick reminder that Wilson, as part of their sponsorship today, uh, they are offering coaches some special discounts that are available to you uh, as coaches. Uh, check your inboxes this morning for those. And please, please, please do remember that these are exclusive to ITA coaches only and they cannot be shared externally or used by anyone other than ITA coaches. Uh, so thanks again for Wilson uh, to Wilson for that. Uh, so our last giveaway of the day is a Wilson custom racket, uh, personalized in your school colors. Uh, so like the ones before, the first person to answer correctly in the Q&A box will win. And the question is, what is the name of the new ITA program that matches tennis graduates with nonprofit tennis centers around the country for a year of service. And the answer, we have a winner. So the answer is Tennis for America. Uh, and you can contact Dave Mullins to learn more how that can help uh, your student athletes. Uh, and the winner is Jerry Thor. So Jerry, we will connect you with Wilson for your custom racket, congratulations. All right, um, so with our, like I, like I mentioned, our last but definitely not least speaker of the day is uh, PlaySight. So Yuval Bar Yosef from PlaySight is here to talk to you guys. Uh, Yuval has been with PlaySight now for over eight years uh, at a number of different roles leading the company. Uh, today, PlaySight is a multi-sport global platform, uh, but tennis does still remain its flagship solution and we're very, uh, we're very grateful for that. Uh, since the first system was installed at University of Georgia in 2014, PlaySite has grown to over a hundred clients nationally, uh, providing live streaming, line calling, and analytic solutions to college tennis coaches. Uh, obviously given the pandemic, live streaming has become even more relevant. And Yuval is gonna talk to you guys about recent trends in the live streaming space. And he's also gonna be joined uh, by Jay Adya from UTR as the two will, will talk about their collaboration in the tech space uh, together. So Yuval and Jay, uh, thank you guys so much for your support of College Tennis and thanks for being here and we'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Corey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope it wasn't, that day wasn't too, uh, too long. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, Jay, maybe you wanna say a few things about yourself as introduction before we start? Yeah, for sure. And thanks everybody for having us. We're super excited to be, um, you know, part with ITA and with PlaySite, uh, not just this year, but over the, over the long term. Um, I head up a lot of our business development activities at UTR and excited to talk to you about kind of how the uh, technology and, and streaming landscape has evolved and just our position within it as well. Okay, great. So let's just dive in um, and let's start this presentation. Okay, um, so we're gonna take the next few min 30 minutes to take you, walk you a little bit through something that's, I guess, not really inside within your schools, more um, across seas and with other, uh, you know, tennis market trends that's going on. Uh, we're gonna start with a cool story about bringing tennis back after the pandemic uh, from Germany. Talk a little bit about tennis market facts, trends and challenges that both place that in UTR are seeing in the market today and since COVID and, and through. Uh, and some of the tech solutions out there that we're providing to the market that uh, deals with the pandemic, but not only, also with other uh, tennis market trends. Uh, Jay's gonna tell us uh, some uh, stories from Australia, far away, but very, uh, very, very cool activities going on in Australia. 
and I hope we'll have some time for Q and A um, when we're done. Um, so this this story about bringing tennis back really starts um, with our uh, Playset Germany team that are based uh, next to Frankfurt in Germany, and they take care of uh, Europe and and the UK. Uh, the pandemic hit, hit uh, Europe at the end of February uh, this year. And as you probably all recall, it was quite a confusing time. Everything, uh, our whole market just stopped uh, within one day. Um, our team in Germany through March and April were very frustrated. And the idea was starting to, uh, to set in of uh, how we can potentially start some kind of a tennis event and let players play and you know create some, some action. Everybody was really eager to get back on court. So um, they went to work and on May 1st, they launched uh, the first uh, global sports event after COVID hit, which was really, really big story, um, which I'll talk with a little bit and then show you a little video about what happened actually. So the event was an exhibition tournament uh, that involved uh, local players. Uh, it was really difficult to travel back then. So they found local players around Germany that managed to get on site. Uh, everything was of course uh, under COVID-19 uh, social distancing restrictions. Uh, which were pretty strict back in the day. Um, and some of the rules and, and uh, regulations that they put in this uh, tournament actually went on to influence other activities, even through the US Open. Um, Sport Radar stepped in as the data embedding rights uh, partner. They took care of live scoring, the integrity issue, and also provided prize and production fees uh, to cover the event fees. Tennis Channel came in as the video rights. So even though this was a pretty small event in, in, in a small town in Frankfurt. Um, we managed to create a lot of uh, buzz around and get these, these big partners involved. Um, everything was using Place at Go uh, technology, which I'll go through later on with automated and remote production. Um, UTR came in as the tournament management system and they provided player ranking points and some marketing throughout the event with um, ranking updates, et cetera. And everything was posted, all the matches were posted afterwards on a place at Sport Network, allowing the coaches and the players to tap into their activities. So with everything that went on through April and this event that started in May, it created such a huge buzz that nobody really anticipated. And let's watch the next clip uh, to show you what happened. So it's a two minute clip, bear with me. Hey, hey, Yaval, could you unplug your headphones? I think that may be causing us not to hear audio. So, Corey, you haven't heard anything in the audio? We, we just started hearing about 10 seconds ago when you okay, unplugged so your headphones. Let me go back. Here. Um, 
coaches in attendance. Players aren't allowed to shake hands or even shower at the facility after their matches and sets have been reduced to the first two four games. If fans needed hope that sport will be back in Germany this afternoon, an exhibition tennis match took place. With face masks, no contact, and robotic cameras. A glimpse, perhaps, into sport's unfamiliar future. Dan Rowan, BBC News. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, it created quite a buzz at the time. Um, what's interesting to see now is that we all got, got used to, you know, all these restrictions, but back then everything was really, uh, you know, premature and, and, and beginning. I mean, it was really hard to believe. Um, okay, let's move on. So um, some of the tennis and market facts, trends and challenges, and I, I promise that, you know, further on down the slide, the next text, so uh, more pictures. But these are some of the things that uh, both PlayStation and UTR see in the market today. Some of these facts might be known to you guys. Um, tennis is the number two sport in betting volume after soccer. Actually, in the U.S., it's third after, uh, after football. Uh, the reasons that's the fact, and which might be surprising to some people outside of our uh, community, is that tennis is a sport that's easy to bet on. Uh, it happens year round. It's a global sport. Uh, the stats are pretty straightforward if you know, if you understand the sport and the rules. Um, and there's only two to four players, which make it quite easier. You don't have to, you know, calculate the ads if the running back is injured that day or something like that. So that's, those are the kind of reasons that why tennis is so popular in betting. Uh, there's thousands of tennis tournaments per year globally, and they're all across different organizations, ranking, and only a fraction of those is actually live stream recorded and analyzed. Um, and I'm talking about both junior and, uh, and all events um, in the market. Betting has is, is grown past a decade to become a very strong influence and revenue engine behind the tennis market, which I guess is, you can look at it from both, uh, both sides as a positive and a negative. But the fact is that today, uh, the betting market is, is a very strong revenue stream behind the sport and pushing it in many ways forward, which I think is a good thing for the sport. Uh, it also has a very large appetite because the, the betting volume is so large that we've recognized both UTR and PlayStation in the last six months that the appetite is there, not only for the top level events, but also for grassroots and even sometimes um, almost on a recreational level, still there's still an appetite for the, that kind of, um, of tennis match uh, matches to be you know, under the betting market. Uh, there's four very large and influential betting uh, companies uh, that you guys probably heard. Uh, they kind of split the market and the video and betting rights between them, Sport Radar, RMG, Stats, and Genius. And you can see in parentheses who's the, what, what kind of rights they own. Uh, there's quite a big integrity problem within tennis. Um, one of the, the sports that has the biggest integrity problem. And again, it's because there's only two players and because some of the reasons that I'll go through um, down the slides. Um, and uh, TIU is one of the ways to kind of deal with that problem. Um, video and score is very strict and latency has to be under four seconds in this market, which means that the video production has to be professional and very reliable in order for um, the betting, uh, the video and, and score to be uh, legal for the betting uh, match. Um, with all these reasons, it's quite expensive and difficult to produce tennis events. Um, and there, were, there are a lot of OTT platforms rising around the world to kind of deal with this problem and, and actually promote tennis and, and other platforms like ESPN3 or you know, other platforms around the world. Um, it's quite difficult to manage, aggregate and compile. There's so hundreds of thousands of matches per year happening around the world. And like, again, like I said before, only a fraction of them are really recorded and analyzed in any way. And COVID definitely changed the game in, in many ways around the world in the tennis market. And I think some of the changes definitely uh, accelerated some of the technology and other things that we see in the market today. 
uh, things that might have only matured in two or three or four years from now actually mature today and place a new TR are kind of riding that, uh, that wave. So let's dive deeper and see a little bit about what technology and solutions we've come up with to actually deal with some of the challenges that I mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, Jay, before I move uh, forward, anything else you want to add here on this line? Well, just that, you know, one of the, we all are uniquely and uniformly aligned around kind of maintaining and ensuring integrity across everything we do from a, uh, a mat matches and tours and series standpoint. And certainly I think, you know, having access to video um, for each of the matches themselves is, uh, is, is and will become increasingly important as we all kind of have the same goals in mind. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so let's start um, briefly going through some of the technologies out there to deal with the, the challenges that we mentioned before. So integrity, as Jay just mentioned, is a, is a big deal and a lot of companies and technologies are trying to find different solutions. The abuse that players are getting around the tour has become, with the development of social media, has become a huge problem. Players report this amazing, outrageous type of, uh, of bullying and, and online abuse that they get. Uh, CNN Sports did a piece in August, which is uh, uh, on this slide. I won't play the video now, but it's a, it's a really important uh, video. The player here on the right was actually participating in that event in Germany and the, the amount of abuse that he received, because that was the only sports event that happened, there was so much betting on it that these players just got an enormous amount of abuse, which was uh, really outrageous. Sport Radar are kind of leading the way in terms of fighting uh, integrity solutions. The main thing that they're trying to find is actually ways to find the people behind that abuse. Uh, the idea is that if there is a way to find these people, recognize who they are behind their you know, social media name, find them and bring them to justice is something that's going to definitely reduce the amount of abuse on the net. And like Jay, Jay mentioned before, it's very important to be able to go back and see match video because that's uh, the best way to recognize any kind of integrity situations that usually uh, come because of the abuse and sometimes death threats the players are getting in order to influence their game. So match video is something that's critical for the integrity battle that's happening around the world. So we're gonna, definitely gonna see more of this and hopefully it's going to mitigate this problem uh, in the future. Um, place I came up with a portable product after a lot of demand from the market, um, and it's definitely making an impact on some of the challenges that we saw before. The main one being that this product, because it's portable and affordable, actually has an ability to create uh, uh, a live stream that's easy uh, to deploy anywhere, anytime, but at the same time, keep the quality and reliability and latency that's required for the betting market. Um, it's very simple. It's built out of a GoPro mounted on the fence, just like you see in this picture here. Uh, waterproof bag, the in the bag, the main item in here is this connectivity device that works on 4G as well as Wi-Fi. It lies inside the bag and it actually pushes the video directly through a cable to the playset platform where we do a lot of different things that I'll go through. And that allows us to actually live stream events from all over the world um, very simply. This can be done by any club, any college, any facility, you don't necessarily need, you know, professional people from PlaySite or UTR to be able to run this kind of uh, product. So this is definitely a game changer for us to mitigate some of the challenges that we saw before um, and, you know, create more events like, uh, like we saw earlier. Uh, automated production actually allows us to be able to do these events on a high level, but also keep it with low labor and allow uh, the events to run almost automatically and seamlessly with one click and let the event run live stream and create all these different things um, on top of the feed. And again, keeping the cost down, but the quality high. So a few of the examples that you can see down here, we've integrated with UTR. Uh, UTR created an API on their database to allow companies like PlaySite or other partners to be able to come in and, uh, and collect information from UTR, ranking being one of them. So what happens today when you start a playside session, you can actually select uh, the UTR players within our uh, broadcast center. Once you select those players, that information would automatically appear as part of the live feed and different situations uh, during the match. So definitely an important part of the integration. By the way, this is gonna be available for colleges as well that have uh, our system uh, next season. 
Um, remote production, we're doing an event now in Germany uh, with different uh, multiple Go systems. You can see the pictures here, very simple and clean. We're pushing those feeds to a partner that does remote production, looks just like this. They're switching cameras, uh, doing replays, coming in with swipes and graphics, and they're actually pushing from this event, we're pushing this content to Tennis Channel, which is the video rights holder for this event. This is happening in Germany this week. So an example of being able to use multiple units as a remote production, very high level uh, quality event. Uh, remote commentary, these example of two companies that rose uh, in the last few years to allow anybody on the planet to basically be able to commentate any match that's happening anywhere. So you could have uh, a tennis match happen in one of your schools with somebody in Germany or Brazil uh, commentating remotely and seamlessly, something that works with PlaySight and definitely an interesting technology that's going to influence um, how we, we consume the production. Um, broadcast center, very easy to push out feed, multiple OTT. A lot of schools have been asking for the ability to push out feed, not only to a single point, but actually to multiple platforms like YouTube, ESPN, uh, ESPN3, et cetera, at the same time. So this is becoming more and more available with the place that platform today. And smart scoreboard integration, which is uh, something, again, quite cool and part of our automated production we're able to tap into the score that's coming from the referee and use that score to, first of all, create a digital scoreboard, but also come in with some stats in the middle of the, of the match, like a match summary or a set summary. We're creating automatic highlight clips at the end of every match. You can see examples here of set, game points, pressure points, um, and also break down every single rally that after you look at the match is over, you actually get a breakdown, you can filter, you can create your own clips almost seamlessly. Again, this kind of product that you see on this page is available for every one of our schools uh, that has PlaySight uh, scoring uh, solution. Multi-camera production, I think this is quite exciting for some of the schools because it's always been a little bit of a challenge to consume a duel with six matches going on at the same time in different courts. So our uh, platform today can actually have a split screen or a single screen with all the courts at the bottom. So finally, you'll be able to look at all six matches at the same time on a split screen and be able to switch in between or just watch all six if you're really a uh, fanatic fan and you, know, you don't wanna miss a point. So this is also available on our platform today already um, and kind of uh, you know, changing the game and multiple camera production is becoming a part of what we do every day. Uh, single camera AI, I listened in to, uh, to Warren and Craig this morning with their amazing presentation, uh, looking at thousands of matches. Playset is developing a way to feed in to our solution, a single camera feed, and by using AI actually break down that information and create stats. You see an example here at the bottom. Um, you can use this in real time during matches to create some data, but also after, and you can even feed in old matches that you have and you want to look at the stats. Um, this will definitely allow us to look at a massive amount of data and matches and have information that was previously just um, impossible to obtain, definitely not in, in this time frame. So this kind of information can be used for uh, fitness. You can see some skeleton, uh, some skeletons here recognize the game. And actually it also enhances the production because we will be able to produce these kind of graphics automatically within the mask because we're recognizing everything that's happening in real time. So we can tell uh, shot placements, uh, return uh, placements, serve placements and other information that will only become part of the graphics and automated production that's all coming from that single camera and the Go unit that I showed you before. Um, so definitely something to wait for. This is coming and launching in 2021. Um, definitely uh, an exciting uh, product. Um, last thing to see, uh, this solution is also influencing remote coaching, which is becoming somewhat of a problem in COVID. Example here is Simona Halep from Romania. Uh, she's practicing with the Go unit every day uh, and actually live streaming and using uh, and communicating with Darren Cahill, which is in Australia, her coach actually look in their live streaming, uh, can use our application for instant replay of what she's doing in real time, creating clips and sending her feedback on the fly. She's also using it for a lot of social media that she has on her Facebook. So quite a lot of things going on with this product that can be used. And of course with COVID, I think remote coaching is definitely something that's 
that's going to grow with time. Um, I'll put a point here and, and hand it over to Jay to tell us uh, more about what you two are doing. Go ahead, Jay. Great, thanks everybody. Um, let me actually share my screen and to give you kind of a live or almost live look at uh, kind of what you've always talking about. These are matches that are we're, we're running UTR is running a pro tennis series event in Australia as we speak. And these are sort of near live videos. It's just matches that just ended in the last day or so. And you can see the use of both the things we're doing from UTR perspective, and then obviously use all, all using uh, placement cameras. I just wanted to share, sort of share an almost live uh, view of that. And then I'm certainly happy to talk about our, our, uh, our uh, just quick opportunity here as well. Listen, just to, to come on to one, we thought one, one example that might be interesting, just how, how UTR is being used pretty expansively and extensively across a, a, a nation in Australia. We have a long-term partnership with Tennis Australia um, that I wanted to just sort of talk about as well. Um, just as a, as a programming note, um, Mark Lashley, our CEO, is going to be talking to the overall ITA community uh, tomorrow morning, um, just sort of sharing an update on all, the, all of the things that we've been working on from a UTR perspective. So don't don't want to uh, certainly don't want to steal his thunder, but certainly um, uh, encourage you to attend that. And then also, uh, Justin uh, Stocksmith, who heads up our data science efforts here at UTR, uh, will do sort of more, a little more of a deep dive uh, tomorrow afternoon on just the UTR rating and, and, and analytics and data around how our rating has uh, has evolved and, and grown and, and is is integrated into the fabric of not just college tennis but um, broader tennis pathways as well. So just, I'll I'll just tick through this pretty quickly, just by way of example. Listen, you, uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Tennis Australia, that, where they're long-term partners of ours. They're now introducing UTR into kind of all aspects of of Australian tennis, um, starting with, frankly, the Australian Open itself. There's a tournament that starts uh, in about two weeks' time, even amidst all the the craziness of COVID, which is a walk-out playoff system, playoff a walk-out playoff powered by UTR uh, ratings and draws and seedings and selections are all done on the basis of players UTR. Um, and the winners of that uh, event get a card into actually the AO itself. So pretty exciting kind of top of the le top level, top tier opportunities, but then bridging into, you know, a tournament that just started last week. Uh, all Australian juniors, uh, major junior tournaments are using UTR as the, the main seeding selection and tools methodology for all of their national championships. And with some real results, we've kind of dr dramatically driven just how many people are using UTR in and across all levels of, of, uh, of Australian tennis. So. One of the things we aspire to do is just not just on a country by country level, but just globally is just sort of making it as easy as possible for folks that are interested in playing tennis and interested in getting, having their matches count towards a rating to be able to do so. And the case of TA is pretty, it's pretty interesting and exciting. And just to pick up on visual form, kind of some of the things that you've always sharing, you know, we've, we've run our, our own pro tennis series and I'll, I'll show you a few slides of just some of the ways that we brought tennis back as well. Um, one of the primary countries in which we were able to do so was, was in, Australia, we launched kind of the pro tennis series um, in 20, for 2020 in, uh, in five different markets across Australia in the summertime to really bring play opportunities to, to uh, emerging pro players whose, quite frankly, whose careers, whose livelihoods were, were just cut, cut short, cut, cut, brought almost to a standstill. And this was our opportunity, our ability to sort of uh, make it as easy as possible to have competitive live matches, have them count towards something, have, the rate, have all those matches count towards a rating and build a pathway for players to actually continue their what they what they love to do at all levels and statures. Many of these were many of these Australian players were frankly U.S. college players who had to had to go home when COVID hit and had to stay at home uh, just given the presence of the pand pandemic. Um, and we were excited to see how not just how these these uh, pro pro tennis series events sort of occurred in the course of uh, 2020, but also how it how uh, uh, builds a bridge to 2021. Um, just taking a step back for a minute, and listen. You've all had wonderful graphics around how UCR has been integrated across, integrated from an API perspective with all play sites feeds. We're fortunate enough as well to have um, the rating kind of integrated into the global broadcast feed or the host broadcast feed at the Australian Open last year and going and going forward. So what does that actually mean from a practical, practical perspective? Anytime anybody saw a match um, anywhere in the world, um, any the, in the the pre-match graphics that took place that would show the players ATP and the WTA ranking and the corresponding UTR rating as well. So fully integrated in across the board and a, a little bit of self-promotion. Some nice folks, including Darren, K someone Alps coach, uh, Darren had some nice things to say about how, how we're, how, just how we're able to use you, how they're able to use UTR to rate themselves against any other player in the world, which of course has been the fabric of a lot of things that are happening from a coaching perspective within, within college tennis and, and, and beyond. Just quickly, I'll, I'll 
keep this brief and happy to have any ha answer any questions. If listen, just as um, we were pretty uh, worked pretty well in sync with with PlaySight, um, just to bring tennis back, and and it was no more. Um, there's no other, no, no bigger, uh, broader, uh, initiative or goal than that, just to bring it back as safely as we could, just given when, given when we shift all the way back to March, how, how dire or bleak the circumstances look, we brought back the first pro sporting event of any kind in, in the U S or North America, um, which we had called the pro tennis series in Florida with two events, uh, featuring pro tennis players, uh, playing, um, in a round robin format, um, that sort of organically led to the pretty um, dramatic expansion of the pro tennis series across continents and countries and, and just media platforms and the like. And, you know, um, some, and I won't play the video just given time, but a bunch of really interesting players of all shapes and sizes and at all cal player calibers had some really wonderful things to say about us. Bianca, obviously a, a, a big advocate for the the sport and for bringing the sport back was, was foremost amongst us. And we, had some integrated graphics across all of the things that we're, we've done and all the work, all the, uh, the countries with whom we worked, Rafet and the, the Spanish Tennis Federation uh, in Germany and, and across uh, world team tennis and, and the like, all, all were able to integrate, not just the, the, the rating and how we, how they use the rating, but really start to integrate it in, in, in many of the ways, same ways that, uh, that we are so integrated within college tennis as well. Um, I'll uh, I'll pause there and, and encourage you again to to really uh, to, to attend to tomorrow's kind of keynote with Mark uh, Leslie, who's our CEO, um, and speaking with uh, with Tim as well, and then also the the data and analytics session in the afternoon. Hey Corey, we we have time for a couple of questions that we have on our Q and A. I'll just. Uh... Go ahead, then. Yeah, we, we yeah, absolutely. So it looks like you guys, there's a couple questions uh, that were in the chat box there. So one of them first came from Jonathan Betts asking, how do betting companies police toxic users who harass and threaten players via social media? Uh, it's a very good question. And I think a lot of the communities is asking that question, especially with international laws. And I, I don't think the, there's a distinct answer here. Um, I think what the, the, the companies like Sport Radar and the others are trying to do is, first of all, find a way to actually recognize and find these players. I think once these abusers understand that they can get caught, I think that will be a deterring factor by itself. Um, but it's a good question, and I'm not a total expert, but it's definitely worth uh, investigating. It's, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Jonathan. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very important for, for our sport to, to take this reduced down to zero. Um, and actually see the second question, Corey, so it's fine. Um, the question is about cost of smart code playset go. So I won't go into some pricing and, and turn this, this more of an educational presentation to a sales presentation, but I will say that um, we believe that playset go is a, is a great solution for colleges, especially the ones that can afford uh, really strong infrastructure installation that costs a lot of money sometimes, sometimes it's not possible because of the you know, old facilities or, you know, or costs that are involved. Uh, this product doesn't require any type of cabling or anything like that. The only thing you need to have is, is a decent Wi-Fi. And even if you don't, you can use 4G or LTE uh, to, pr to produce your, uh, your matches. And I can assure it's very affordable. Um, and if there's anyone specifically wants to get more pricing information, you're welcome to email sales at playset.com and we'll definitely reach out and give you uh, each an offer. Um, there is a question that comes up a lot from colleges. What do I do about six cores? Because do I need six different units or can I have less? So we actually have a good answer for that because um, another uh, solution that we have that's very similar is actually using a camera with a strong zoom that's situated on a tripod, which actually allows you to have one of those on, let's say a crow's nest or anything on the bleachers and just kind of move in between the courts and give a full production of what's going on in the duel and uh, maybe focus on the most interesting uh, match that's going on. And by doing that, even with one uh, single system, be able to at least produce and live stream your duel to your fans. Otherwise it's zero. Another option is to choose one, two, three systems and, uh, and stream you know, the interesting courts, or of course use six. So again, any information you guys require, please free to email us to salesatplace.com and get some answers. And one other thing I just mentioned is, you know, we, Corey, as you know, we, and we launched um, 
the ITA tour, the fall circuit, and then now the winter circuit powered power by UTR this, this past, uh, this past fall and winter. And, you know, it just brings interesting, just given this conversation, it brings an interesting opportunity to sort of leverage, not just our partnership from a tournament management system and event management perspective, but also kind of leveraging um, potential playset, playset integrations where, and in at the venues where there may be um, our current playset integrations or, or forthcoming ones. And so we're excited to have that conversation down the road as well. Awesome. Are right, any other questions real quick, Yaval? I just did add um, just on the chat box that email that you mentioned that sales at playsite.com. So coaches mm -hmm. with any questions, uh, you can just refer to that chat box and copy and paste that email. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much, uh, Yaval. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, we're excited for UTR sessions tomorrow and uh, really, really thankful for PlaySite support and everything you guys are doing on the live streaming side as well. Obviously, that's becoming more and more important. So thank you guys for walking us through all that. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. it. Uh, thank you. Hey, yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, coaches, the, the 90 of you that have stuck with us throughout the day. Congratulations. We'll do some stuff around uh, player development. And um, also tomorrow we're gonna have um, Chad and Kathy from um, Ventura Partners, their executive firm uh, the search agency that hire athletic directors, hire uh, conference commissioners, head coaches, football, basketball, and uh, also in tennis, obviously. So uh, any of you young coaches looking to move up the chain, I definitely encourage you to Come check that out. Uh, we'll start the day with UTR and um, also in the middle of the day have a, a fascinating presentation by Dr. Nicole Lavoy. So hope to see you all at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 uh, p.m. Eastern and uh, same again on Thursday. So we'll see you then. Thanks, guys. Bye.